ಗೋಪಾಲಕೃಷ್ಣ ಸರ್ ಗುಡ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ವೆರಿ ಗುಡ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ಥರ್ಡ್ ಡೇ ಸೆಷನ್ ಟುಡೇ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಎ ಡಿಫರೆಂಟ್ ಸೆಷನ್ ಫೋಕಸಿಂಗ್ ಆನ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ಲಿ ಆನ್ ಇಮೇಜಿಂಗ್ ದಿ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಒನ್ ಈಸ್ imaging in challenging scenarios calls for elisions and uh, i would like to request expert panel members to join a symposium that is a dr pk sahu dr deepak davidson dr arun kalyan sundaram uh, dr bb purohit is going to moderate this session and we have a uh, many presentations each presentation lasts for 10 minutes uh, i would my request is only please try to stick to the time because otherwise many topics are there otherwise program gets delayed we have a program until 2 o'clock so at the end we are going to have a uh, live you know, sessions also uh, at the end dr akasaka is also joining with us and he is uh, going to give a keynote lecture so with this brief introduction so without further ado let us proceed to the uh, today symposium uh, over to you uh, purohit you can take the proceedings uh, thanks dr sridhar sir and uh, all the course director for having this wonderful meeting since last 3 days we started with uh, imaging in uh, usual cases to complex scenario and today we have uh, the agenda is on precision pci and our first uh, session will be on uh, use of imaging in calcified lesion we have a wonderful panel of people who will be presenting their cases and expert panelists also so i'll just give a brief introduction about the people who are going to be a part of this and we have uh, uh, currently we have dr david who is joining with me as a expert panelist uh, he is a very renowned uh, intervention cardiologist uh, from uh, kotayam caritas heart institute and he has performed more than 10000 angioplasties then we have uh, one of the pioneers of uh, uh, complex uh, pcis and cto especially antiplatelet and retrograde dr arun kalyan sindram he knows no introduction he is the uh, head of uh, chief division of cardiology in pomet hospital in chennai and is also honorary director cto program in uh, kotes heart institute and uh, he has been proctor to many for uh, antiplatelet and retrograde pcis and uh, we also have dr uh, davinder singh chadda ds chadda sir who had a vast experience of intervention cardiologist especially in afmc and now i think he has moved to bangalore in uh, uh, in uh, vikram hospital then we have dr ajit menan uh, who will be joining from leelavathi hospital and is a very senior cardiologist and uh, uh, and a very experienced operator in special in complex uh, pci and uh, from vijayawada we have uh, uh, dr k gopal krishna who again uh, is a very renowned name in uh, hyderabad and rock cross india he is uh, currently the senior cardiologist at ayush hospital and uh, he had a vast experience uh, of conducting angioplasties and he got his training from uh, fellowship from st vincent's hospital fijira melbourne and we also have uh, dr narsaraju is the director cath lab and senior cardiologist from uh, apollo hospital in hyderabad so with this brief introduction i will ask uh, there is a slight change because of uh, some urgent work with uh, dr ajit menon so i'll request dr ajit to present his case first and uh, uh, dr ajit over to you uh, good morning and uh, <clears throat> thank a big thank you to the organizers and dr sridhar kasturi for giving me this chance and i'm sorry i'm intruding upon the uh, this thing i have a couple of emergencies which have come up so uh, i have to uh, uh, leave early um i cannot i cannot i am unable to screen, share my screen it says that host is disabled the screen sharing so now you can share sir my apologies to everyone uh, dr kalyan sundaram i'm sorry i'm taking up your space uh, Uh, if i may uh, my Absolutely. my topic is on this yeah thank you thank you very much um new atherosclerosis with calcification uh, 
It's uh, when when we look at uh, restenosis of uh, coronaries, we have various uh, uh, pathophysiologies in the uh, in indication to come up with, uh, with with recurrences. So, uh, despite the reduction in late thrombotic events with the newer generation facultative stents, late stent failure remains a concern. And uh, we know that instant atherosclerosis, uh, which is uh, which is something as, uh, which we never knew till I mean we never had much of a knowledge about till the uh, uh, newer uh, imaging technologies came in, has emerged as an important contributing factor. Histologically, it is characterized by accumulation of lipid-laden foamy macrophages within the new intima with or without necrotic formation and or calcification. And occur, I mean, this, this normally occurs over a period of months uh, or even a couple of years, but in natives, it occurs over decades and more frequently with, uh, with, with the use of drug eluting stents. But of course, the mechanisms which underlie the rapid development of new atherosclerosis remain uh, relatively unknown, and the absence or abnormal endothelial uh, uh, functional integrity following stent implantation may contribute to this progress. And that is usually we, or that's why we also recognize that uh, peristent or uh, stent edge restenosis is something which we are all uh, aware about, and especially if you land a stent in a, in a, in a uh, non-normal zone uh, or an abnormal uh, abnormal area or a lipid rich lipid rich, uh, rich plaque, we do send and see these patients coming back with abnormally high rates of restenosis. And instant plaque rupture usually accounts for most of these thrombotic events. And uh, the calcified neuros and new atherosclerotic lesions have more of a gradual instant restenosis. So uh, new atherosclerosis accounts for a fair amount of patients who land up with um, with with uh, the restenotic lesions. And uh, they have, uh, and, and, and they usually end up with, um, uh, in, in, you see these patients when they come in with either plaque ruptures or with, uh, with, with gradually worsening uh, coronary disease and restenotic lesions. The prevalence and characteristics of new atherosclerotic lesions uh, in, uh, was studied in, in, a, in a human autopsy analysis. And they were, they, they, they were in terms of the, uh, the uh, uh, of, of the comparison of BMS versus the, the first and the second generation drug eluting stents, and also in terms of uh, the, the serolimus eluting stents, paclitex, paclitex eluting stents, and the eurolimus eluting stents, uh, we, we see that the, uh, the, the, the new, uh, the new, new atherosclerosis probably occurs much earlier. In the, uh, in, in, in the in the drug eluting uh, stents, and it was much more prevalent in the first first generation drug eluting stents as compared to the, um, the the BMS, which occurred much later. And of course, the serolimus eluting stents had a much higher rate of overall new new atherosclerosis. In terms of um, uh, the, the, the rates of stent thrombosis, also and patients presenting with late stent thrombosis and very late stent thrombosis, the incidence was much was 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 pre prevalent even through a period of three years. In patients, in, in, in these patients who had uh, drug, drug, the first and second generation, uh, the first generation drug eluting stents, the second generation drug eluting stents did reduce the rate of restenosis overall and also reduces the rate, reduce the rate of stent thrombosis as time passed. And so the, we, this, this basically said that the uh, new atherosclerotic phenomena was much high, much higher, much more seen in the first gener generation drug eluting stents as compared to the later ones. Uh, these are certain uh, OCT images of uh, various types of um, uh, new atherosclerosis, which is seen. Uh, you can you can see foamy macrophages in, in in some images over here. You can see calcification in these in, in, in these images, and of course the plaque ruptures and stent thrombosis, which uh, and, and and thrombus formation, which occurs in uh, certain uh, uh, new atherosclerotic lesions. Uh, a contemporary review in of restenosis and drug eluting stents, uh, different types of restenosis. Uh, one is a homogeneous bright uniform level which is seen on, uh, on, on OCT, which is new intimal hyperplasia. Then you have heterogeneous composition with uh, instant. You can you may have may or may not have a necrotic core. You may or may not have lipid, uh, uh, sorry, calcification. Of course, in some cases, you can see foamy max, uh, uh, mac macrophage accumulation. And you have uh, the other reason being a stent under expansion, where the stent area is significantly smaller than the vessel area, which is imaged on the, on the histopathology specimen. Um, depending upon the type of instant restenosis, whether it's mechanical, biologic, mixed, uh, a, a CTO, or a, 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 a more than two layers of drug eluting stents in ISR, uh, you have various treatment options available. And of course, in the biologic, you have new atherosclerosis without calcification and new atherosclerosis with calcification. And when you have these with calcification, you usually end up using one of the modification, or the, uh, the uh, sub balloons, the uh, scoring balloons, or the cutting balloons, or the use of uh, laser 
uh, intravascular leukotripsy, rotational atherectomy, and of course, uh, the, the use of drug eluting balloons in, and, and uh, uh, vascular bracket therapy. Um, one of this, there's another paper presented of calcific uh, new, new atherosclerosis causing instant restenosis, the uh, study of the prevalence predictors and, uh, and, and, and implications, which basically showed that those patients with uh, calcified new atherosclerotic lesions, uh, the, the, the significant factors that came to picture were age, uh, un, I mean, un, untreated LDL cholesterol values, lesser use of statins, and of course, um, the, the chances that uh, this happened in uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, late later part of the uh, of the uh, treatment uh, treatment schedule was much higher in those with calcified neurothelioma lesions. Um, in terms of the treatment characteristics and the implications of treatment, uh, patients with calcified um, new, uh, lesions, neurothelioma lesions, did have a significantly lesser minimal uh, luminal diameter, and of course, a lumen area on OCT much, 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 much lower in those patients treated with uh, with, uh, with calcified new and new atherosclerosis. <laughs> the treatment options for for, for these, uh, this is another paper presented of undilatable ISR presenting 11 years after uh, stent implantation. Um, well, you see that uh, you need a, you may you may end up using a rotational atherectomy to ablate the intrastent calcium. And the, um, uh, uh, the, the, unless you do a proper preparation of the uh, neotherosclerotic bed, the, the results are usually under uh, challenge. And uh, the learning is that uh, you, need, you need to make the lesion to, to determine the nature of the ISR. Otherwise, you may end up treating it the wrong way, or you may end up with a lower minimal uh, luminal, uh, diameter, uh, luminal area post-procedure. And the use of ather rotational atherectomy to ablate the metallic strands of severely underexpanded strands uh, has been reported, and we have done this, but it does remain uh, a little unpredictable and usually a risky proposition. But the use of rotational therapy blade, the calcified interest and neotherosclerosis is, is something which uh, all of us need to uh, image, uh, decide, I mean, and see the calcium before we decide what are the treatment modalities that we are going to offer a patient who comes in with a raised genotic lesion. Um, this is, um, I'm going to, this is another uh, which I picked up from the uh, from, from the uh, thing that uh, complementary use of both rota and IVL, which I which I can. Um, this is a case which we did about a month uh, about a year ago. We had done a rotational atherectomy uh, to the LAD and circumflex uh, in this lady uh, who had come in with unstable angina and was admitted uh, with uh, seeing the in the previous angiogram showed diffusely diseased mid LAD uh, and a diffusely diseased proximal circumflex, significant calcific disease, and we had done a rotational atherectomy from of, of the proximal LAD. Uh, from the ostium to the uh, mid LAD and the circumflex at that point of time, she came back within a year of uh, the uh, of, of the uh, uh, index procedure with uh, classical anginal symptoms. And uh, this is the angiogram at that point of time. We have a stent from the proximal segment of the LAD extending into the I mean, uh, the so it's not in the ostium, and you have a stent in the proximal circumflex uh, to to deal with. And this was the uh, OCT image of the uh, circumflex, uh, which we did at that point of time. The stent seems to be well expanded. There's some new intimal hyperplasia in the distal part of the stent. But as it comes to the proximal edge of the stent, there's a significant number of calcium within the, uh, within the uh, stented segment and a significant amount of new atherosclerotic lesions there. Now, these are the images at, at, at different levels. <laughs> and uh, this, is, this is basically the, uh, basically the circumflex. We did a, um, um, uh, an OCT into the LED also, which showed that the lumen diameter distally was about uh, 2.09 with the MLA was, uh, MLA was reduced in the mid part of the stent. Um, there was significant calcium at the edge of the stent uh, and within the uh, proximal stented segment, there was, there was, there was significant, significant amount of calcium load still there. And we had an edge restenosis of the, uh, of, of the, uh, of, of, of the lesion. So this is a, a situation where we decided that since we thought that the calcium was reasonably deep seated, uh, and we had already done, already done a rotational atherectomy for this lesion about a uh, about, about less than a year ago, uh, we decided that the treatment option here would be a uh, intravascular lithotripsy. Uh, we used a three to twelve mm shockwave balloon uh, uh, at four, four, four atmospheres and and uh, delivered four cycles of shocks uh, for the proximal LED to open up and. Um, uh, subsequently, went and uh, did a, um, a treatment of the pro of the osteal proximal circumflex also because we had decided that we'll treat both the lesions together. Now, this is something which we have. Uh, I want. I mean, I want to show you that this is something which we have seen in some patients who for have a intravascular lithotripsy, 
Um, sometimes because of the over aggressive uh, cuts that the lithotripsy does, you have a outpouching which is seen and it almost looks on, on an OCT, uh, it almost looks like um, the uh, cut has gone beyond into the adventitia. If you look at, if you look at the, uh, if you look at this area as it comes over here, and there's a significant number of crack which is developed uh, in the, in the uh, osteoproximal. You can see the uh, entire segment here uh, looks scary to say the least uh, when we, uh, when, 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 you, when you do an OCT. Um, so, but that, that it also means that the, the calcium has been cracked well and uh, the stent deployment becomes uh, probably much more easier, but it's something which we are still studying to find out what, what are the implications of such a cut on an, on, on an IVL. Um, this was the, uh, this is the, um, the images taken at different levels. And you can see how, how, uh, how big the cut looks uh, on, on, the, on, on the image. Uh, subsequently ended up uh, with a, uh, um, this is OCT of the uh, circumflex post IVL, which again showed a, a reasonable amount of uh, cracks in the, uh, in the osteoproximal circumflex. And uh, we ended up with a, uh, a 3 into 2, a 3.523 Zions expedition stand post dilated using a uh, uh, three, the 3.5 balloon in the uh, in, in, in the ostium and uh, and, uh, and a four point uh, for four point five in the uh, left and in the ostial left main because we we did an imaging after the OCT and we realized that there was a significant amount of stent which is living lying, lying and malaposed in the voluminous segment of the ostial uh, LED. Um, we did a two and uh, this this was the um, uh, this this was the end result. Um, basically. The OCT post post PSA of the OCT now then shows a well expanded stent, uh, well opposed stent. But you you'll see that there will be some ele some element of malaposition in the uh, in, in, there in the uh, expanded segment, which I don't think we can do anything much about. But since it's a short segment, probably we can leave it a bit, we can we can leave it alone. So went with again in the four point five there, but I'm sure that area would still leave a certain amount of stents which are malaposed, and that was the end result. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope I've stuck to time on this. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. I think it was an excellent presentation, Dr. Ajit. And uh, it clearly shows that uh, earlier when we used to deal with instant retinosis, we always used to think that it is just an uh, intimal hyperplasia. And over a period, we have now realized that it's just not intimal hyperplasia. And the cause of stent thrombosis was always we thought it's a malaposition. But now with this development of uh, newer imaging modalities, we know that many a times with the black rupture and, uh, and that may be the reason. And it clearly tells us how we change our treatment modality based on uh, what the imaging is showing. If it is a calcium, we have to go with the ablation. If it is a, just a intimal hyperplasia, we go with a high pressure balloon or things like that. So anything from my co-panelist, Dr. Arun Kalyan, uh, you have anything to I don't do this. Sorry, uh, I, I think it was, it, was, it was a great illustration. And I think you're absolutely right, spot on. I mean, I think imaging has really a kind of changed our understanding of how not only like the pathophysiology, but also how you deal with I think, the different uh, etiologies obviously require different therapeutic approaches. And I think uh, this was a beautiful illustration of that. Thank, thank you, Dr. Ajit. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, I have just a small question. See, when we see that kind of a fracture in the mid part of the uh, the lesion, which has gone inside, and you, when you try to put a stent, it will be difficult to oppose it to the walls. Uh, what is the risk of stent thrombosis in those kind of scenarios? Or should we I, add some anticoagulant to them? Or we just no, we don't. We don't. We don't give. I think uh, 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 since it's a very short segment, it's a very short length of uh, malaposition. I don't think we should have a problem. And the and the area, area the luminal area is quite large, so the chances of stent thrombosis there are, prob are probably lower. I I I would. I mean, I'm I'm open to correction here because I, I, my my basic concept is that the larger the the, the stent, the luminal area. Uh, even if you have a few stents, stent struts which are malaposed in that in that segment, the chances of uh, a voluminous thrombus forming over there causing a stent thrombosis is probably unlikely. These uh, are we a smaller diameter and a lot of uh, stent, and a longer length of stent of stent malaposition. So we we, I, we have had this in three four of our patients after an, after IVL, and we have not been able to oppose the stent completely onto the wall. It's practically impossible because the uh, diameter there goes up significantly higher. And um, uh, I, I don't know, David. Uh, did, uh, yes, sir. Did, yes, sir. 
um, yes yes i would definitely agree with you i would definitely agree with you uh, as you mentioned it's the expansion that's more important rather than the acquisition you had an excellent ex- expansion you used a 4.5 mm balloon for expanding it really well and we saw that it was more like a type 1 perforation following the ideal it was almost like a type 1 perforation and i was bit, bit worried about the diagnosis of neoarthrogenesis in your case because we learned from the literature that when you have a diameter stent uh, implanted you tend to see the neoarthrogenesis almost 5 years down the line and in a drug eluting stent you can see it as early as 2 years but then in your situation it was just one year one year down the line she came with a restenosis and we felt that there was no much of uh, body calcification or no much of lipids inside that or no new small micro vessels were not seen inside that so probably it was a new malignant new intimal growth that ultimately led to restenosis and definitely you were justified in putting in an ideal because beyond the stent you saw a lot of calcium not inside the stent beyond the stent you yeah, saw a yeah. lot of calcification so probably that would have led to bit of under expansion during the initial procedure that ultimately helped you in a big way in the second procedure yeah because uh, you you're right i think uh, it was there was a lot of strain beyond i mean even even proximally there was a significant amount of calcium which is left behind and probably yes, uh, we undertreated the lesion the first time and that's probably the reason why she came in with a uh, such a malignant course of disease uh, so i think uh, we stand corrected that we should have treated the entire segment uh, back in the like mean at that at, at the first the first opportunity itself um, well uh, we we, have, we we learned our lessons on this I have a question to Arun. Arun, you you do a lot of chronic total occlusions, and you see you, you obviously must be seeing some restenotic lesions uh, coming up with uh, long diffuse total total occlusions. Uh, you, do, you, do you see a lot of neoarthrogenic uh, 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 lesions in these CTOs which come back with the restenosis? So, I mean, one of the problems with uh, with the whole CTO subset is, I mean, many times it's just it's just a mess once you go in there. Um, typically, my the usual part is that there are some. as you kind of said i mean either it's a stent under deployed thing etc but once you do have the vessel open it's it's kind of a conglomerate of calcium uh it's just really fibrotic i mean it's usually just a nightmare to get through it and sometimes we end up going through the subintimal part and then reentering so i can't i mean if it's if inside the stent i try and not crush the stent from outside i mean i've done that rarely but for the most part it's very hard to tell because this is just or you know whatever has happened has happened over a long time the I, if i had to kind of just anecdotally tell you i don't have the numbers to back this up but it's probably because the stent was undersized or you know it was never fully deployed in the first place uh, aggressive isr followed by probably near cross crosses uh i think uh, we move on to the uh, next talk i think dr arun you you will be uh, speaking uh, regarding use of imaging in cto so uh, purohit i'll take your leave you, hey uh great seeing you all uh, uh dr ajit stay yep. safe yeah talk to you soon yeah bye bye thank you thank you everyone thanks uh before you proceed i'll just uh, welcome dr pk sau who has joined us from bhuneshwar he has joined us as an expert panelist he is a director in hod cardiology in bhuneshwar and he has Hi, been won so many awards so with this brief introduction i'll go back to dr arun to present this case once again Okay, let me just get to my slide. Are you seeing my slide? Sahu sir, you are on mute. Yes, oh, we are I seeing. Am. Okay. Hold on, I just got to get to that. There we go. All right. So that's that. Can you? Uh, I can start, right? Yeah. Are we good? Okay. So I'm going to try and uh, I thought this was supposed to be a ten minute talk. So I'm just going to tell you, yeah, imaging is critical and obviously. I think in PCI in general, especially in CTO PCI, um, it's it is important for several reasons. I think it enhances the safety of our CTO PCI. I mean, and I'll kind of try and show a couple of cases just to illustrate these points. Um, when you do have an ambiguous proximal cap, uh, I think imaging is critical to try and identify it so that you're trying you're penetrating at the right spot. um it's important in identifying subintimal space and also once you're back uh, when you think you're back in the true lumen and there's any ambiguity um it's important to confirm that you're back in the true lumen using imaging now obviously when you are having trouble with reverse card it really helps enhance the efficacy of the procedure and uh, and and the other thing that i think we kind of have not really paid attention to a lot and that uh, was beautifully illustrated by dr jit before was not only is it important to open up the chronic total occlusion or you know it's also important to 
deploy your stems well so that these are as durable as they ought to be. So uh, in terms of resolving proximal cap, I mean, you know, this is an ambiguous proximal cap really is, I mean, to me, it's like if the operator there has no idea about where he can confidently stick a microcatheter and a penetrative wire, that's ambiguous. So if you have the ability to uh, deliver an, uh, an IVAS catheter there and, 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 and try and study where it is, I think it's critical and we really should because not knowing where it is can be, um, can, can lead to disastrous results if you just go with the penetrative wire and keep going. So you can just put in an IVAS and take a look. So obviously that's the wrong spot. So, and, 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 and typically it is ambiguous usually because there is a branch there. Otherwise it's, you know, it's just a blunt cap. So if you can put in a IVAS catheter there and take a look that that's, that's, that's much, much, much better. Um, and, uh, you know, many times you can resolve exactly where the uh, proximal cap is using this. So again, IVAS is kind of like, uh, you know, the mainstay of resolving proximal cap ambiguity. Uh, there are, uh, I mean, in India, we have Boston and um, uh, Phillips right now, the Volcano IVAS. Um, the Volcano IVAS with a short tip, I tend to prefer, although the resolution isn't as good as Boston. Um, it's, just, it's just that it's, it's easier to, to land stuff there. Um, and uh, this is actually from Jonathan Hill. Um, and uh, there is some emerging application of potentially using OCT to, to study where the proximal cap is. Um, kind of experimental, I wouldn't bet the farm on it right now, but it's promising. Um, the next application is really to understand the subintimal space of its branches. We used to think, and I think it's still one of these urban myths that people say, oh, well, I, I did anti-grade wire escalation. So it is true to true, it's all intra-plaque tracking. Uh, but what was shown in that in almost a third of the cases where you thought you just did wires, you did access the subintimal space. Uh, this is uh, this is an important thing for us to understand. And again, I'm in the interest of time, I don't have to necessarily show this to you. But what I want you to take away is that even with wire escalation, about a third of the cases is a chance that you might go subintimal and back into the true lumen. So, and and there's always a possibility that you might lose a branch just as was illustrated in this particular case. Again, this is not my own, but uh, this is from uh, Dr. Song that was actually published. And uh, while uh, Simon Walsh from, uh, you know, who kind of ran the uh, consistent um, trial in, in the UK um, also showed that interestingly, there are times where you think you've gone subintimal because you did ADR or uh, RDR or reverse card as it's termed, and anywhere from about 10 to 20 percent of the cases, you actually end up saying true, 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 which is kind of in interesting. Now, just to illustrate a few points, I'm just going to show uh, show one of these cases. This is a case from uh, last year that I did with with another um, uh, expert from Japan. Uh, it's a CERC CTO and um, with an ambiguous proximal cap. So, so the first thing, I mean, you know, you always have a plan when you're approaching a CTO, just like for any complex PCI. So long leash and distal vessels are kind of okay. Uh, not great landing zone. Uh, collaterals, not, we, we couldn't really see anything from the right at all. And we didn't even, we couldn't even delineate where these, where these were filling, how the distal circ was actually filling. Um, proximal cap was pretty ambiguous. So the plan was to do a wire escalation after IVAS entry. If that didn't work, you know, explore retrograde options. If that didn't work, was to possibly do ADR. So uh, there was a high OM branch into which, um, you know, which was wired and IVAS was used. So here around uh, 10, 10 o'clock, and, and I'm sorry, like, I mean, I know you've been seeing a couple of cool OCD images, but now you're back to the gray and black and white. Um, but you can kind of see it around 11, 12. You can kind of see that we did penetrate right smack where we wanted to at the proximal cap. Um, and uh, But after this came trouble, um, and this was seven French um, and, and and had to kind of take this. So it was really hard to do a live. I was getting dual lumen puncture and, and pretty much impossible, I would say. Um, so had to kind of take that out. Once we marked this, we penetrated the right spot. But unfortunately, wire escalation didn't work. There was no retrograde option. This was tried briefly, and after some uh, cajoling, uh, the uh, you know I, I could get the other operator to kind of say, "All right, let's go ahead and knuckle." So we ended up knuckling this particular, um, um, you know, an XD uh, along with the same carol that was utilized, and you can see that we are in the architecture of the vessel. And uh, once this was done, uh, exchanged this for, a, um, you know, for a stingray uh, balloon catheter, which you see kind of coming down here over a Miracle 12. 
I'm just gonna cut to the chase. There it is, you see the two dots. So once this is done, um, and again, typically you do not inject anti-grade, but this was because people, I mean, this was kind of like we were at the tail end of a live case and people wanted to, um, I think like even the operators there wanted to kind of just con be convinced that this was in the vessel, which we pretty much knew, but anyways. Um, so had ended up doing a stick and drive with the Concourse Pro 12. Uh, so the 30 minutes from any start nothing we were in. Um, uh, and, 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 and I think the, this, this case really illustrated the key point that you don't get dogmatic. And then this was exchanged for a workhorse wire and uh, secured the other branch of the OM with a dual lumen catheter and then performed imaging again. This is again, another critical part of why imaging is important. Around 12, one o'clock, you saw that we were in the true lumen. We are in the true lumen. So at the crux where the, uh, you know, we were at the true lumen and then subsequently you will see that you're subintimal here. You're on, you see around three to six o'clock, you, you, you have the true lumen compressed. This is where we went subintimal and then more proximally, Again, you are in the true lumen. So this is kind of the final result post tenting. But the key point is what you didn't want to do is you've done all this stuff and you don't want to lose one branch. So 50% of the work that you did would have been gone if you'd kind of just tented uh, into the sub space across the other branch. So it can be used for confirming proximal cap puncture to make sure you're doing it at the right spot and also to confirm that you are true lumen. Like I said, there are other times where you, you do ADR. This is an ADR case. You're not really sure if you're in the true lumen or not because of how the wire is handling. So then again, perform IVIS before you stent it. Uh, so um, you know, as you can see, you are true lumen here, more proximally or subintimal at the crux, your true lumen. So you know that if you're going to stent, you're not going to lose either branch. And this is kind of how it really looks like, you know, the collapsed true lumen is out there, intimal plaque, and then here you see the media. And uh, so once this was stented, I mean, we kind of, we had the confidence that we were not going to lose branch once you're there. So another important thing, and I'm just going to show one slide to illustrate this. When you do go retrograde, uh, especially when you're close to the left main, um, uh, you know, we tend not to do um, many, I've noticed that many CT operators are, well, like I'm almost there. I'm going to get, just get into the left main and into the guide. Um, and and uh, the one catastrophic thing that you can do is if you have gone subintimal and entered the left main, you are going to jail the circ and shut it down. So if you want to do this, I mean, I would recommend not doing it. It's much safer to do reverse cart um, or guide extension reverse cart in the prox LED. Um, but if you're going to do this, please have a very low threshold for putting in an imaging catheter and confirming the wire position that it's in the lumen before you deploy balloons and stents. Um, I mean, this is a, a famous slide by, uh, you know, from um, from the Japanese. And I think Dr. Sumitsuji actually published this in Jack a couple of years ago, just about the four possibilities of where your anti-grade and your retrograde wires are, how far are they from each other? So when you're having trouble with reverse card, I would highly encourage um, throwing in an IVIS catheter to understand what you are doing and how you're doing it. Um, so here is, I, I want to spend like uh, two or three minutes talking about this because, you know, frankly, five or six years ago, um, I think most of the CT operators, including myself, are not really thinking about this. The general rule was once you're across, let's get done. Uh, these are long procedures. So let's be super efficient and stent and get out in 15 minutes. Um, but now we've realized that, you know, this can have consequences. So you don't want, you know, late malposition, whatever not. Uh, it is important that you use imaging so that you get good long term results. That's why we do what we do. Um, so just to illustrate that, here's another case that I did recently, um, which was a, kind of a longish RCA, um, and uh, I'm, I'll kind of show you the angiogram, which really wasn't much, um, with the distal vessel that was okay, collaterals were available, but not great, and, uh, and approximal cap was unambiguous, so plan was to do wire escalation if that didn't work, retrograde, or ADR, and uh, this literally was, there wasn't much. There was no contrast essentially going here. And I'm gonna show you the before and after pictures. Um, uh, you know, the, the CTO part itself wasn't too challenging. I just, I managed to actually wire it because I had a stent to get in. And if you notice in the previous one, there is a horribly underexpanded stent um, where there's this entire rind of calcium circumferentially around, around the underdeployed stent. And uh, so the key was to prep it and make sure you understand why did this happen? How can we prevent this from happening again? So a uh, lot of, uh, you know, aggressive um, dilation. And let me kind of see if I can show you this OCT run here. Um, 
so this is post balloon. And um, in the interest of time, I don't want the whole run to go. But you can see, let's come back here. I have a lot of really smart people when it comes to imaging on the panel now. So I will, yeah, there you go. See some cuts, everything. So frankly, uh, one of the challenges, and again, this was one of these welcome to India kind of cases where not only are these cases hard, but someone had promised them that, oh yeah, they can do it for this much. And uh, so um, the, the patient also came into the mindset of like, okay, that's, uh, you know, really, this is going to be our budget and we want you to do it at this. So, I mean, the key that I want to show you here is that with, with aggressive, uh, I mean, in fact, I went up pretty high with an opium balloon. I think it was 50 or 55, whatever it is. I don't exactly remember the number, but but we were able to uh, really crack the calcium here and uh, then ended up, I mean, once you prep the vessel pretty well, then we ended up uh, uh, stenting pretty much. So again, this is just a kind of a post stent result. So I'll, I'll cut to the chase. That's the guide. Um, so here you can see the, the uh, minimal um, luminal area in, in, in the various parts, post stent. And this is uh, just a flight through, just, just to kind of show you that overall was pretty good. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the key is like, you know, uh, traditionally, I mean, five, six years ago, honestly, I would have probably said, all right, great, got it done. Let's, let's go ahead and, and size it and just go one size up, post dial it really aggressively and get out. But now I think this also emphasizes how imaging really helps change, um, or, you know, understand what's going on, how bad is the calcium. And in fact, there was some debate about whether I needed to use IVL or not. Um, but I got away without it, thankfully. And, um, the key is those good expansion. I think that's kind of the thing. And I have a question actually for for uh, uh, for the panel after this. So that's the final result. And uh, so pre, here's the underexpanded stent, calcium crack post OPN, post stent result. And pretty much, uh, again, I'm sorry, this was actually a, a, a picture that I had sent the referring uh, doctor. So there was literally no RCA at the start and that's how it looked um, at the end. Um, so again, the key is like, you know, you have two imaging modalities out there right now, right? You have OCT and IBIS. Uh, they both have certain strengths and, you know, weaknesses, I guess I would say. In general, IBIS is probably more utilitarian than OCT for CT or PCI for resolving proximal cap, you know, for ensuring the guide wiring where it is. Uh, for facilitating reverse card. Um, I mean, primarily because you don't have to inject anything. And many times in CTO, you can't inject anything because you're going to make a subinterval space or you're going to extend dissections. For stent optimization, you know, perhaps he, um, OCD trumps IBIS. Um, you know, for the rest of the stuff, it's kind of a tie. So the key point is, I mean, I, this is not a IBIS versus OCD talk, but really, you know, intravascular imaging is critical for all stages of CTO procedure, not only for making it safer, making it more efficacious and for long-term durability. IBIS is certainly, uh, you know, more utilitarian. And now with HD IBIS, um, you, you, you even have better definition. And, and, and finally, I think, you know, the key point is like, you know, OCD might have a role in, um, you know, the immediate and late optimization of, of PCI in CTOs. Thank you very much. So I have a question for the esteemed panel. Hey, Dr. Shada. Uh, and uh, so, so, so when, I mean, I know that now we, there's an attempt to have algorithms for managing calcium um, in, you know, how to use OCT to, um, to, to manage calcium and when you're dealing with all this stuff. Now, one of the questions is, can you use imaging here? Like, I mean, we kind of say, well, if it's circumferential, if it's this much, we're gonna, we are gonna do, um, you know, OPN, if it's this much, I'm gonna do IVL. For a nodule, I'm gonna do this. For this, I'm gonna do rota or, you know, orbital when it comes out. Now, one of the things is like, given uh, our country, et cetera, and given that we do have really sophisticated imaging modalities, is it conceivable that you kind of use imaging to tailor it? Like, let us say I do see, you know, calcium, which quote unquote meets the criteria for IVL, but I get away with an, with an OPN balloon and then I've actually cracked it. Uh, now, it's it, to me, I'm, I'm thinking about two and a half lakhs plus tax versus whatever, 40,000 plus tax. I have, the, I have good 
uh, I've broken it. So why not go ahead and stent it? I mean, it's just just something that I've, I've been trying to wrap my head around and I would love to hear your comments about the same. Yeah, I think uh, that was an excellent talk, Dr. Arun, and uh, a very tricky question to all the panelists. Uh, and uh, I'll ask uh, Dr. P.K. Sao, who has uh, joined recently to uh, come with a good comment on uh, this question. Dr. Prashant Sao. Uh, thank you, Purohit. Uh, in fact, uh, what Arun was asking is uh, indefinitely a very tricky question. Because you see, if you have to tackle calcium, there's a specific algorithm that you have to follow. You do the scoring system and you do. But uh, in our country, that really doesn't work always. You cannot think that, oh, it is one to two uh, points that you're giving. You can just go with a uh, NC balloon and get out. Or if it is more than uh, four, you go with uh, this thing. Uh, it is your lithotripsy balloon and you go out. See, if you cracked your calcium, I personally feel you've done your job, whatever way you do it. And if I truly speak, when our teachers uh, used to do... They didn't have all this access to all these new gadgets, but somehow they used to manage calcium. Uh, Professor Kane is also there in the panel. Sir will also agree. He's my teacher. He'll agree that it was just rotablation for all cases, literally, wherever you used to see calcium. We never used to think much about this, uh, this thing that is uh, uh, calcium nodule, which is really a problematic case. But personally, I feel so long you've cracked the calcium, you've done your job, you can go ahead and do your stent. But in the IVERS or imaging, or uh, OC will definitely help you in optimization of your stent over here. Yeah, I, I think that Kalyan syndrome makes a point uh, that uh, when you see that uh, the data from the IVL, they say the IVL delivers a 50 atmosphere pressure. So if you can go up to 50 with your OP and balloon, probably both mean the same. But uh, in which specific category you have to use, which one? One is when the balloon is uncrossable, then we have to do an orbital hysterectomy or rotational hysterectomy. Once it's a balloon crossable lesion, what to do? Probably if the diameter of the lesion is more than 1.75, probably rota will not do much. So you have to use OPN or uh, the, if it is a balloon crossable lesion, probably using a OPN, if you can deliver a pressure up to 50 atmospheres, probably it works equally with IVL because IVL the sound. It, uh, they say it goes up to 50 atmosphere pressure. So that, that's uh, one of the points. Thank you. Dr. Deepak. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, Arun, it was a very informative talk. Uh, based on this particular case, the one instant reason is that's what you were, uh, you were speaking about, I hope. Uh, the one that, that was under-expanded. What I felt was, uh, let's say you have so much of calcium beyond the stented segment, beyond the stent. We have easy two options, either the ideal balloon or the uh, super high yes, pressure sir. balloons. Uh, those situations, I would uh, primarily, we, we cannot go based on algorithms based on Dr. Sah Sahu, what Dr. Sahu has um, explained. In India, probably we have to primarily look at the financial status of the patient and if they are affordable, think of an uh, ideal balloon or otherwise, I would definitely agree with you, like what, what you have done, go with a uh, super high pressure balloon. Those would be my two options. And in case these two things, wouldn't work then think about a stent ablation or thinking about uh, lacing that particular lesion. That would be the options. Right? No, ab absolutely, Dr. Deepak. I mean, I guess really my, my question was more directed. I, I think, you know, completely agree. I mean, if you can't get anything across, then, I mean, you really are, you got to rota it. Um, now, the, the, the question really in my mind was, you know, because just looking at it and if money were no object, I would have put in an IVL balloon. Uh, that would have, I mean, I would not even have hesitated for a second. Now, you know, when I got, when I did this, I was just thinking, well, you know, the, the reason I did go ahead and stent it after that subsequently was because I had the comfort of imaging to tell me that I, okay, I have actually, you know, broken the calcium. So we should get good, ex good stent expansion because obviously we don't want to do the same thing that was done initially uh, by whichever operator. So, uh, my, you know, I, I was just kind of curious to know, because I mean, most of the algorithms, I mean, they are not based on randomized trials. It's just a couple of quote unquote as experts sitting around and saying, all right, we think that this is going to be the best thing to do for this in this particular situation. So while these are good, they're not set in stone. And so to me, it was almost just like, maybe we should use imaging even, you know, to, to tailor it. I mean, and it really matters because one, one is like five times the cost of another. And I was just trying to 
Um, and, and, you know, it just gave me a lot of appreciation for how people we have to practice here, right? I mean, you can't, not everyone comes and says, all right, take whatever you want. Um, and so this is the budget, try and get it done. I mean, you got to do it still safely, but I think imaging will help us maybe be more efficient yet safe. I mean, we still do the right thing for people, but uh, it's a more cost-effective way of uh, managing um, calcium, perhaps. I don't know. I just wanted to see, and, and uh, yeah. Is there it's, well, if opium works and you have good good cracks, etc., you guys are not set in stone. So if I'm reading the panel right, so even if you have you know a lot of calcium and if somehow you're you've broken it, let's say, and imaging has given us a conference that you have, then I think most on the panel would agree that you don't have to necessarily do IVL, although technically it is an indication for IVL. Is that correct? Uh, is there any quantitative uh, assessment of the calcium breaks? I mean, how much, how much you need to break with IVL or OPN? Is there any quantification for breaking the calcium? Sir, sir, sir no, sir. It's not really needed. Uh, when you look at the Bitstrap 3 trial, only in two, two thirds of patients, they really need out factors in the practice based on OCT. And then other, other one third, probably basic, you tend to have micro factors. So, primarily use the technology, try to try to get a better lumen. That's what they say. You do not have to really quantify for how much how much breaks you have really made out before you put in a, before you go ahead with a balloon dilatation or a stent implant. Uh, I think Dr. Sridhar wants to make a quick comment, yeah. Dr. Sridhar. Actually, I will also the micro bubbles that uh, creates the 50 to 60 atmosphere. The OPN also, we can go up to 45, sometimes 50 atmosphere. So we are seeing, actually, we have been doing rota regularly for all severely calcified you know, vessels, all these vessels. But uh, frankly, in my experience, recently we have been using OPN and C even in very severely calcified vessels. It is providing wonderful results. Even the calcium concentric more than one mm, and the depth the length more than five mm. Very suppose if you are able to cross with guideline support, even in severe calcium lesions, it works very well. So after open and see, still it's not working. Like fractures are not there. Then worth doing. You can take the IVLR rota. Uh, many times the open and see opens even severely calcified vessels. As Arun said, this is a cost effective modality. Okay, patient is uh, uh, he can afford one lakh extra. That means uh, then you try to go ahead with the rota or IVL, three lakhs. So based upon that, but open ends also because it's so uh, atmosphere, almost same type of pressure it's generating. Their micro bubbles here, the uniform pressure of the balloon, 45 to 50 atmosphere. I think uh, initially you can try with the open NC. Otherwise, if mentally prepared, go with the rota. Otherwise, you can, uh, particularly in periphery, simple to use. And many people are not exposed to rota and uh, IVL or this one. But IVL is more expensive compared to this one. I think that is also a very good modality. I have one uh, quick uh, uh, observation on the case. Uh, uh, Dr. Arun, you showed that first case where you had a, almost a total occlusion of the circumflex and you were not able to go into the, uh, to the two lumen and finally you took the help. Uh, is there any specific, have, what is your experience regarding that? Because nowadays we are coming up with forward-looking IVAS. You think that is going to be a really useful modality which will help us in cross these CTOs where the proximal cap is ambiguous and you are not able to place your IVAS catheter in the side branch or it is not much there? I mean, the, haven't used it. So, I mean, potentially, yes, theoretically, it. Uh, I mean, obviously, it confers the advantage that it's it's going to make it more efficient. I mean, again, hopefully, yes. I don't know. I'm hopeful. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, but 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 right now, I mean, I I do think we we tend not to do it as much as we do, even with the existing techniques. Um, uh, what I'm told is that I mean, again, I've not used the Navi Focus, but I heard that from the Japanese guys that it's really good. For, um, you know, in fact, one of the talks, there was like, yeah, I don't use anything else other than Navi Focus. Um, I, uh, you know, again, Boston, if I had to use it, I'd, I'd sometimes have to shorten the tip. But I, Philips, although it's only 20 megahertz, like, I mean, at least the, the you know, the mechanical transducer, it's 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 super short tip. So many times I, 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 you know, and it's a little bit more robust. 
So if it's not through stents where, again, it's metal against metal, many other times it's easier for me to do it. And I don't have a huge nose to deal with if it's a tiny thing. I just need to see enough. So I think it's still underutilized, um, but it can be done. So, but yeah, the, I don't know. Your forward, I was, if it, I mean, if it works, it should be better, theoretically. Yeah. Right, we can go to the next session. Yeah. Thanks, I guys. Think, uh, we can, uh, I think it was a very... Uh, excellent discussion which happened in this uh, session. So we'll be moving on to the next. Uh, there is Dr. Narsaraj is going to speak uh, next. Dr. Narsaraj, you are ready with your presentation? What about Chadda, sir? Yes, to unmute, I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I'm ready with my presentation. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, is my presentation uh, visible? Yeah. So, uh, I, my topic uh, today, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, the esteemed uh, faculty here. Uh, my topic today is uh, OCT in ACS. How does it help? Uh, the, if you ask me, the imaging modality of uh, choice for ACS uh, would be uh, OCT. OCT helps us uh, identify the vulnerable plaque, of uh, course, this uh, helps us, in fact, to intervene on a plaque. If we see a vulnerable plaque down the line, if it is going to rupture, we, we see the vulnerable plaque now, it's a thin cap fibroachroma. We can intervene now and prevent an ACS. That's how it helps. And in this situation of ACS, it defines the pathophysiology of ACS, and it can uh, uh, help us uh, guide and uh, you know, optimize the therapy. So we all know the pathophysiology of ACS is the culprit lesion. Majority of the times is a plaque rupture, and it can uh, be a plaque erosion, which is uh, the better term is uh, a disrupted uh, plaque with uh, uh, intact uh, uh, fibrous cap. And calcific nodule is uh, seen in uh, a certain uh, subset of patients, especially those with sudden cardiac death. Uh, more often seen in the mid RCA according to literature, but uh, the there are some doubts about the uh, the implication of uh, calcific nodule, calcified nodule, and producing ACS uh, after the prospect, which showed that you know the three-year follow-up, it uh, calcified nodules are more of uh, innocent bystanders rather than uh, the culprits for OCD. But whatever it is, this is uh, also believed to be one uh, pathophysiology for ACS, and uh, the. Features we can uh, clearly see if this is a plaque rupture, we can see a disrupted plaque. I'll show you the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, pictures. Unfortunately, I don't have any prospective uh, you know, case studies which have shown that the thin cap uh, fibroethroma has eroded and uh, uh, ruptured and produced an ACS. Histologically, this is how uh, 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 a vulnerable plaque looks like. This has got a huge um, lipid necrotic core uh, with a thin fibrous cap defined as the cap less than 65 microns. A lot of macrophages, it's an eccentric plaque. And uh, in the treatment algorithm of ACS, suppose uh, we have a patient of ACS presenting with uh, a, a, an occluded or an obstructive CAD. And then there is a clear cut uh, culprit. We go ahead and do the PCA of the culprit lesion, but in the setting of an ambiguous angio where there is multivessel disease, where we uh, need to identify the culprit, uh, the imaging helps us. And also when we have an imaging, uh, the, the uh, angiography is showing uh, hazy lesion or a calcified uh, hazy lesion, whether it's a calcification or a rupture or the, the plaque rupture with a dissection. In that situation also, we uh, can take the help of intravascular imaging and the plaque event and the culprit can be easily identified by the intravascular imaging. The uh, usefulness of intravascular imaging is in uh, cases where we have, uh, you know, we can, uh, the, when the flow is well restored with a non-obstructive uh, type of a lesion, sometimes we can consider uh, not stenting or doing a PCI to the, the vessel also. 
So these are the typical OCT features of uh, plaque uh, rupture or the vulnerability for plaque rupture. We have a thin cap uh, fibrous ethroma or a lipid rich plaque which shows uh, uh, the low signal with ill-defined borders. We have neovascularization and macro channels, which is uh, more often associated with plaque rupture. And uh, the, then we have macrophages. We have uh, calci calcif calcification, spotty calcium, and cholesterol crystals. All these are the OCT features associated with vulnerable, vulnerable uh, plaque and plaque rupture. So this is how a thin cap fibroethroma looks like, where uh, the, the thin cap fibroethroma is defined as a plaque with a fibrous cap less than 65 microns. And the high resolution OCT has the ability to identify the thin cap. So this is the difference between a thin cap and a thick cap where we can actually measure the uh, cap thickness and uh, decide whether the um, lesion is uh, you know, uh, vulnerable or not. The plaque rupture, the features on OCT uh, where uh, we have a discontinuity of the fibrous cap. This has a huge uh, lipid um, uh, core with formation of a cavity in the plaque and usually associated with uh, thin cap fibroma, fibro, fibrous, uh, thin cap fibrous uh, uh, plaque at the uh, cap at the site of rupture. The intracoronary thrombus is defined as a protruding mass in the lumen and uh, macrophages are identified on OCT as a uh, shimmering line of uh, you know intensity as you can see as a, uh, here, the shimmering line like thing it, uh, usually denotes uh, macrophage deposition at the site of rupture. So we have from the OCT, we can identify a red thrombus versus uh, a white thrombus. Red thrombus is signal rich with high backscattering and high attenuation, whereas white thrombus is a high backscattering with uh, low attenuation. We all know this. So we can have uh, a recanalized thrombus, which produces a honeycomb-like uh, structure. So this is how OCT helps us. Uh, and uh, now I illustrate this with one case. So this is a 55-year-old gentleman uh, presented with ACS uh, with elevated troponin. And uh, this is the angiographic uh, picture. A left coronary shoot was normal. Right coronary showed uh, on the angiography what I felt is like an intermediate lesion across the right coronary artery. And um, uh, I decided to do, because of uh, the uh, ACS presentation, high troponin, decided to do an OCT run. And uh, this is the OCT run of the right coronary artery. As you can see, uh, in the OCT, we have a ruptured plaque with the thrombus sitting in the, uh, the, in the lumen. And uh, then uh, this is the... Uh, OCT findings, we have a red thrombus, we have uh, a plaque rupture, we have uh, the, as you can, uh, the, the macrophages are seen very clearly. You can see the uh, dense uh, shimmering line there, which is uh, suggestive of macrophage infiltration. And uh, we have a recanalized thrombus giving this um, uh, honeycomb appearance. So the, the OCT also showed the true lumen versus the false lumen, and I decided to um, uh, go ahead with the PCA of this vessel, put a um, 3.5 and 48, 3.5 into 48 millimeter stent and uh, post stent, uh, this was the, the stent was uh, post dilated uh, the usual fashion for a good opposition and the post stenting OCT run showed a well deployed uh, stent with um, uh, good opposition and then there are no edge dissections. And uh, this, uh, this is how OCT helped me in one case where, uh, you know, with a normal left system and elevated troponin with uh, ACS presentation, uh, I, I could do uh, the, with the help of an OCT, I managed this patient and this is the OCT run showing uh, clearly well-defined, uh, well, uh, well-opposed stent with uh, no residual uh, uh, stenosis. So, to conclude uh, my talk, OCT helps us identify the uh, nature of uh, lesion. And in some cases, like in this case, where uh, the pre-procedure, uh, the, the, pre -procedure, the angio short uh, kind of a borderline lesion, uh, it helped me in uh, taking a decision to go ahead with uh, angioplasty. 
and PCA of the uh, culprit vessel, and it helps us in, in the identification of the morphological features of the plaque, the uh, thin uh, fibrous cap, the lipid core, and macrophage infiltration, which all helps us in uh, guiding the intervention. Thank you. I think it was an excellent demonstration of uh, understanding the physiology of uh, acute coronary syndrome in your cases, and especially in ACS patients. Uh, just one quick observation. Uh, when we have this kind of borderline lesion and we have a plaque rupture we have seen, uh, do you really think that a stenting is the right approach because uh, the lesion, uh, the amount of atherosclerosis is there and all this thing is not much? And uh, we all know that uh, many of the trials they have been tried to put a stent to stabilize the plaque, they have not been found to be successful. So, because you, you can initiate a instant restenosis and you can uh, putting a foreign body can again further aggravate the thrombus formation. So, this again brings us to the debate that the use of stenting and stabilizing the plaque and all this thing. What is your opinion? Dr. Yeah, I, I felt, uh, you know, with uh, the kind of uh, rupture there, uh, the, that's noticed there, with the kind of, uh, you know, uh, the luminal compromise that I've seen, I thought uh, stabilizing the plaque with uh, stent uh, would be the best approach. I'm open to discussion. I invite the comments and, uh, you know, opinions of other, uh, uh, the, uh, other faculty in the... Dr. Deepak, your uh, opinion? Yes, yes, yes. I would also agree with uh, uh, Sir regarding stenting that particular segment because is clear, very clearly made out a lot of thrombus there. There is definite plaque rupture, macrophages, microchannels, all those things pointing towards aggressive, aggressive inflammation over there. And he also has made out that there was a plaque rupture. Now, whether had this been a plaque erosion, then we know that data says that when you have a plaque erosion, you do not see significant plaque, uh, plaque burden over there. You have a reasonably good lumen there. You you have a continuity of the intima. So in those situations, do not do not do anything. For them do not uh, stand that particular segment so now since he's made out that it was a plaque rupture and it was a long lesion probably five days down the line if he had done a ffr probably that would have turned out turned out to be uh, ischemic also so based on all these long lesion 48 millimeter long lesion multiple areas of lesion uh, plaque rupture you saw a lot of inflammation inside the vessel so you couldn't call it as a plaque erosion so in that situation probably i would also think that he should have done the i would have done the same thing like dr Sini had that. Dr. Shahu, you have been doing so many OCTs in uh, many of the ACS patients. What is your experience with regards uh, to this kind of a scenario? See, uh, first of all, doing an OCT in an acute ACS situation is a little bit tricky. But it is not that in every ACS situation you pass in a catheter and try to see what's going on. Most of the young patients, what we concentrate on are on the young patients who try to see whether we can avoid a stent. That is the first thing. Now, if there is, uh, just as uh, Deepak had said, if there is just a plaque erosion, then definitely we have to go ahead and do something. And next question thing is that to do an FFR in an AC situation is sometimes, again, very tricky also. Because there's a lot of spasm. There are so many things. There might be erroneous reading. And I don't have much of experience on FFRs in an AC situation. But in OCS, yes, I predominantly do an uh, OCT in ACS just to... Uh, this thing that is see that my stent is well expanded and we give a good result. Or the next thing that I do is the first day I just leave the patient like this. I just keep the sheets in, give them the pharmacotherapy. Next day I bring them again and see how the RT is cleared. And if it is really required, then go ahead and do a stenting. This is this has been my approach. Uh, Dr. Sridhar, you have been doing so many OCTs. Can yes. we extrapolate? Because if you remember when we put a stent, there also happens some edge dissection. And we don't put a stent in all the edge dissection because as per the ACT, if it is a small edge dissection, you may leave it also. Can we apply that kind of data in these kind of plaque ruptures and see how much of the plaque rupture has happened and what is the extent, what is the depth, and then take a call whether we should be putting a stent. Any such thing you, you do in your practice? The Narsaraju case has shown very clearly even a recanalized thrombus. As per the Lotus registry, where they have studied very clearly, uh, the lesions were 30% to 90%. Even in intermediate lesions, uh, they did FFR. Surprisingly, even 30 to 50% lesions were positive for FFR. So why they did means uh, 
because they why they uh, they explained also the reason for FFR positive. Many times these channels are separated; they are not in straight line, the oblique. So that might have contributed. Uh, the if you see the actual area, if they calculate it, much smaller. The angiographically, because the uh, radiographically haziness is there in oblique septa. It's a not a like a straight course uh, lesion. So, th but uh, they found out that FFR. Not that everyone should undergo the FFR, but that study is a reference where they proved that even in intermediate lesions, particularly if you see the recurrent thrombus, definitely they are physiologically significant. These patients should be subjected for stenting because lock rupture most of the time they will have an underlying lipid core, and uh, Narsaraj explained in detail like explain large lipid core. These blocks only rupture thin cap fibroderma. Proneness for rupture is very high. But erosion, different picture. Most of the time, intact block. So the fibrous cap is intact. Small erosion. So erosion you can treat conservatively. Rock rupture because the large block, uh, lengthy lesion, more lipid block. Better to cover it with uh, this. Very good morning, Dr. Shiris Hirama sir. Thank you for joining, sir. You can comment, sir. After that, we'll go to the next topic. Unmute, sir. Dr. Hiram, sir, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we are all picking up experience of OCT in ACS. Uh, uh, basically, um, uh, to see beyond thrombus sometimes gets very difficult. But I would definitely agree that if there is a uh, information that there is a plaque rupture, I would like to stand rather than wait and another event to happen and things like that. I think uh, we had a, almost most of the experts have believed that if, if you got a, such a youth black chapter with a thrombus underlying, it is always preferable that you put a stent and seal that plaque so that you don't end up in a future ACS in this kind of scenario. Uh, so we, we, we move on to the next talk, Dr. Uh, Davinder Chedda. Uh, sir uh, will be speaking on uh, use of uh, uh, OCT and uh, imaging in uh, uh, deciding what to do with uh, calcium and calcium nodules. Uh, sir, you can go ahead with your uh, presentation. All right. Am I audible? Sir, we can see your uh, screen, sir. Okay. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, thank you organizers yes, for giving sir. me a chance and um, special thanks to Deepak for remembering me to be present in the panel because I think I was almost forgotten, uh, been waiting for more than an hour for my turn. So here it goes. Um, I've been told to speak on eccentric calcium and calcium nodule. Um, I, I think the flavor of the session is calcium and as we know that we are getting to see a lot of calcified uh, coronaries, um, this, which is a marker of not only the uh, chronicity of the atherosclerosis, but also the severity of atherosclerosis. We get to see calcified nodules in about 2 to 7% of uh, patients presenting. This is essentially an autopsy data, uh, having met fatal uh, coronary thrombosis. Uh, nodules predominantly are seen in heavily calcified vessels because it is there, they promote turbulence, which activates the procoagulant factors leading to uh, thrombus formation over the surface, and they are predominantly seen in NLD and RCA. RCA stands out specifically because they say that it is one area where the uh, the torsion is maximum. So uh, nodules are predominant in the RCA, and next comes the LED and very infrequently seen in uh, circumflex. Let's look into the evolution of calcific plaque. You know, it, it all starts with spotty calcium, which coalesces to form what is called a superficial calcific sheet. And um, this superficial calcific sheet is seen in about 67% of the calcific plaques. It could be thick or thin. And uh, this could be segmental or circumferential. We've all seen this, you know, we've been treating this. Now, if you have these uh, superficial calcific sheets coming together circumferentially, at times they fracture and they start protruding into the lumen. And when they protrude into the lumen, they 
it's kind of eruption into the lumen and that is what leads to formation of an eruptive calcific nodule. Now I'm classifying nodule into a particular type. This is called an eruptive calcific uh, nodule. Whereas on occasions, these calcific sheets stay within the media and they kind of start growing and then they protrude. So this becomes a nodule which is called calcific protrusion. This essentially has a very smooth overlying surface and they are considered to be benign. As we progress into the talk, I'll be talking more about it. So let's look at a couple of cases. This is case number one, superficial calcific uh, sheet. Um, LED stenosis, undilatable. The balloon did not give way. So we went ahead and analyzed this plaque. It showed uh, uh, napkin ring calcium all around. We had to rotablate and we did the, uh, we did the same. <clears throat> And post road ablation, as is seen in most of the cases, you get to see white thrombus, dissections, broken calcium ring. So this is a sign that you've done your job well. After road ablation, you've done high pressure dilatation and you are assured of a uh, good, good result. And that is what was seen. Now, superficial calcium sheet is uh, the toughest of all the calcific lesions. Let's come to the case two, which is eruptive calcific uh, nodule. Now, again, a case example, a young fe uh, female, 65 year old, diabetic hypertensive presented with uh, calcified uh, nodule in the proximal, severe calcific lesion in the proximal part, I shouldn't call it nodule, uh, unwilling for surgery. We had difficulties even in wiring this lesion and we had to kind of switch over to uh, uh, fielder XT wire and then dilate with a one millimeter balloon, create a passage for the microcatheter, exchange it with the uh, rota <clears throat> wire and it took five minutes of burying time to get through to this uh, calcified lesion. And of course we did OCT in order to save time. I'll just, without playing the run, I'll show you the images. She had the complete spectrum of calcium in that uh, segment. There was thick plate calcium, there was circumferential calcium, there was dissections post rota with white thrombus. You had eruptive calcific nodules and the left main segment appeared pretty okay, except for a small calcific protrusion of the left main part. We did progressive dilatation and we used IVL in this case. And the images, post uh, IVL OCT images, revealed a lot of additional uh, findings. So uh, as we are moving from distal to the proximal, you can see heavily calcified vessels. There are calcium nodules and circumferential and thick and thin plate calcium all around. So what did IVL do to these uh, lesions? You can see this, they were unfractured calcific nodules. I mean, these nodules didn't absolutely didn't give way with uh, the IVL balloon, but there were some of them we were lucky had got fractured. There were fractures in the circumferential uh, plate. In addition, we also picked up some fragments of the calcium because what happens when you use IVL, it fractures and the balloon, uh, when it dilates, it displaces the fragments along the circumference rather than pushing them towards the adventitia. So, uh, and the ostium appeared, cir circumflex ostium appeared pretty okay. We stented this vessel with very good uh, uh, result. And post tenting, however, when we repeated our run, we had a lot of things to, uh, which came to our notice. There was a distal dissection. This wasn't significant. We thought we'd leave it alone. We had kind of malapposition. This has been talked about, and this is a reality. Calcium-related malapposition is pretty common because thick plates will not let your stent oppose because the lumen is not circular. So <clears throat> there is no point chasing this. And as you can see here, one of the these are the calcium plates and there is a small nodule which has kind of lifted the stent away from the vessel wall. It becomes very difficult in these situations. Proximally where the calcium was a little less on the, the expansion was pretty okay. The stent appeared to be well opposed. Now look at the, um, the proximal end. At the proximal end, as I told you, the stent was well opposed, but when you come near the ostium of the circumflex, there was some amount of malopposition which was noticed. It was even more proximally but we didn't chase this. And we also noticed a small uh, kind of dissection in the left main, but we didn't chase this again because left main is also severely calcified. We thought we are going to produce a lot of damage. So what is the message? The message is when you're dealing with uh, a heavily calcified vessel with nodules, with thick plate calcium, you have to accept these as part and parcel. You can't keep chasing them with high pressure balloons. You will cause strut fractures. You will cause damage to the uh, drug which is there or to the polymer. So one must accept the results. And this is what was shown in this study where 
eruptive calcific nodules were associated with very high incidence of uh, stent edge dissections and incomplete apposition. This is a paper which came in cath cardiovascular intervention uh, last year, late last year. Well, let's come to the protrusive uh, nodule. Uh, RCA lesion, in the mid-RCA, we saw uh, a tight stenosis. Initially, we thought whether it's a thrombus or a calcific nodule, we needed to differentiate, and but we required Guidezilla to get in, and we put a two millimeter balloon, post two millimeter balloon. There wasn't much uh, change in the lesion morphology, which was noticed. We did an OCT, and this is the OCT run, and look at the extent of calcium in this vessel. It was extremely calcified, and this was a large nodule which was there, which had both the characteristic of an eruptive and a protrusive uh, nodule. So this had an irregular surface as well as it had a smooth surface. So there were some eruptions which are happening. Now these eruptions are primarily the plates coming together and forming smaller nodules on the surface and they lead to formation of red thrombus over the surface and the smooth surface, which kind of is benign and need not be chased, provided it is not compromising the lumen considerably. But if you have to treat this calcific protrusion, you need orbital hysterectomy. No other tool can work. There's been a varied experience of people having treated nodules successfully, but I personally feel these are the eruptive nodules which have been treated. Calcific protrusion is very, very difficult to treat, and you need to have an orbital hysterectomy for treatment of uh, these uh, nodules. Well, uh, this has been talked about. I think um, the first speaker spoke about stent failure in the presence of calcific uh, nodule. We recently had a patient who was a 65-year-old male, again a diabetic who was stented in 2011, came with an ACS. He had a reversible myocardial ischemia in the inferior and intralateral wall. This was done in the month of December. Toward the end of December, we noticed some ISR in the LAD uh, stent, and this appeared pretty tight. So. Uh, there was some amount of disease in the diagonal also. We went ahead and did OCT for this uh, vessel. And these are the OCT findings. There is ISR. We were all prepared with uh, all the arms and ammunition to deal with this. And what we noticed was that this patient had calcific neoatherosclerosis. This was talked about um, by my previous speakers. So I'll just show you what we noticed. We had ISR at the distal end. We had two layers of stents overlapping. We had lipid neoantimas shown with the yellow arrow. But what we importantly picked up was calcific neoatherosclerosis. These were the calcified uh, neo neoatherosclerotic plaques, and the blue arrows show you the calcium deposits which were there behind the stent. So the stent was put in a calcified milieu. So that means this individual had predisposition uh, to develop calcific uh, neoatherosclerosis. Generally speaking, new calcific neoatherosclerosis is there, and the report and the incidence reported in literature is about five to ten percent. These are slightly difficult to treat, and we were wondering as to what one has to use in this situation. The proximal part of the stent was endothelized. We used another tool, and which came to our help, which was the coronary physiology. We did the RFR and the FFR, and the lesion was found to be insignificant. Now, had the lesion been significant in such situations, I personally feel you can dilate and put an IVL balloon. Now, there was a lot of discussion about IVL generating 50 atmospheres and uh, it being um, whether IVL is as good as uh, opian NC. Yes, um, opian NC is a poor man's calcium modifying uh, tool, but you must remember IVL is the only tool available to you which will work on the deep calcium. If you have deep calcium, none of your balloons, whether cutting, scoring, or opian, are going to work. It is only IVL which is going to work because the major um, circumferential uh, uh, force which is generated by the balloons is delivered only at the surface. So if you have superficial uh, calcific plates, any kind of balloon is going to work, high pressure balloon, opium NC balloon, or cutting or scoring. But if you have deep calcium, like in this case, you have an ISR with deep calcium, you need to have an IVL on board to produce optimal results. So what are essentially differences between the different calcific plaques? So I told you superficial calcific sheet is what which leads to formation of eruptive calcific nodule or a calcific protrusion. The luminal narrowing is essentially maximum with the superficial calcific sheet. And this 
is what causes its association with ACS. And majority of the patients presenting with ACS will have superficial calcific sheet. They kind of erode onto the vessel wall and lead to formation of white thrombus. Whereas if you have an eruptive calcific nodule, these plates coming together lead to formation of red thrombus on the surface, which is what produces the irregularity over the surface, whereas protrusive nodule is not going to produce any of this. The calcification index is maximum with eruptive nodules. It is because there are multiple sheets of calcium which are coming together. So the calcification index is the arc of the calcium and the length uh, of its distribution and the length over which it is distributed, which is maximum with the eruptive nodule. You definitely need the atherectomy tools for both of these. Uh, protrusive nodules are put plus one because may or may not be treated. If you need to treat, you need to have an orbital atherectomy for that. And if you see the fragmentation is pretty common in superficial calcific nodules and is more frequently seen with the eruptive nodules. Eruptive nodules are what are amenable. So if uh, people are stating that they've treated a calcific nodule, it has to be an eruptive calcific nodule, which is essentially composed of sheets of calcium along with red thrombus. Stent failure rates are pretty common and one must be prepared. So one must target to achieve larger luminal uh, areas. Conventionally, uh, we've seen that from the autopsy-based studies that if you have ACS, which uh, is because of either plaque rupture, calcific nodules, or plaque erosions. Autopsy-based uh, series, which had about 412 patients when they studied, they found this was the incidence. When OCT-based studies have also found that the calcific nodules to have a similar incidence. So calcific nodules are one of the least frequent causes of coronary thrombosis. So let's not forget about this. To summarize, what I would say is that calcific nodules are associated with poor outcome and poor acute and long-term results and the successful angioplasty of these nodules uh, essentially revolves around discerning the morphology using imaging. And I would specifically mention about OCT, which enjoys a lot of advantages over IBIS and in selecting appropriate lesions. This is very important. You have to se absolutely select appropriate le lesions and use combination of plaque modification tools to produce good results. So uh, we get to see a lot of calcific nodules. We need to have imaging on board to characterize them uh, because, and one must remember if you're taking up a sub, uh, uh, calcific nodule for angioplasty, suboptimal results are a norm. So one must not chase these nodules to produce a perfect uh, result. You can see this uh, from multiple uh, studies, case reports, as well as uh, clinical series, that the eruptive nodules are associated with malopposition and edge dissection. Superficial calcium sheets are associated with under expansion, as well as very high incidence of periprocedural MIs. And protrusive nodules are generally benign, but and are not amenable to most of the atherectomy tools which are available at present in our country because we don't have orbital atherectomy. With this, I conclude my talk and I'll be happy to answer any questions if they're there. I hope I kept the time. An excellent uh, talk, Dr. Devinder. Uh, we have learned a lot. Uh, uh, thank you for giving so much of information in a short time. Uh, I want to ask you a question because of the difficult cases you have shown in the nodules. Is there a time during the PCI, say, this is not my job, knowing the limitations of PCI, let's leave it here, not don't go further, leave it to the surgeon, finding the a nodule, which I think with my experience, I cannot fix it, whatever the tools, the present tools we have. Uh, it, uh, can we think of that uh, after imaging at some point of time during the PCI, this is not my job, let it leave it to the surgeon, whatever the patient says. Absolutely, sir. Absolutely, sir. I, I, I think in one of the meetings where Deepak was present, I mentioned this uh, categorically and uh, um, shouting from the rooftop that um, it, doing interventions is a procedure where, where you are going to assist the patient to achieve good results, which are not only seen on the table, but you would like these results to be present at the end of one or two years. It is not a platform for skill demonstration. So all the decisions have to be based uh, on the long-term results. And if at any stage you find uh, that you are not in a position to uh, kind of treat a given lesion, it is always best to back off because you're 
especially if it's calcium, because the complication rate is pretty high and you can cause more damage than good. And mind you, uh, you can cause perforation of the vessels and these perforations are not easily treatable because tracking hardware is a nightmare. So I, I mean, one must operate within limits. One must operate uh, keeping the uh, uh, results in mind. And it is, I would say again, that it is not a platform for skill demonstration. You have to use your own um, skill set, keeping your own skill set in mind, as well as the uh, optimal results which you are uh, targeting. Yeah, and uh, you were saying about to calcific nodules, you were talking about a malaposition and digisection. So under expansion is also going to be a problem in this uh, particular subject, which you have either willfully omitted it or is not, it's not a problem. I, I think you did not pay attention, sir. I very categorically mentioned that under expansion is seen with superficial calcific sheets. It's a very common uh, phenomenon. It is not seen with the eruptive uh, calcific nodules, which are more amenable to fractures. So when you have these, uh, the first case which I showed was superficial calcific sheets. Uh, this, these contain circumferential thick calcium, which will not kind of expand. So under expansion is a norm with superficial calcific uh, sheets. So that is beyond any doubt of a reality with uh, this subset. So but more query procedural MIs and under expansion, this is what I mentioned in my conclusion slide also, is a norm with superficial calcific uh, sheet. Thank you. Unmute Bharat. Puroi, unmute, unmute. It was an excellent presentation by Professor Chadda. Uh, demonstrating the, uh, the limitation which we have when we deal with uh, calcific nodules and calcific protrusions. Uh, uh, many a times we, uh, as he has also rightly presented, that uh, when you have this kind of uh, protrusions, you end up with uh, malapposition because it's not always possible to expand the stent and oppose it. Uh, in your experience, do you think these uh, are really a challenge and the patient lands up in stent thrombosis and, and complication and ACS in future. So how do we prepare ourselves for the future of these patients? How do we follow these patients? See, there's a there's a nice paper which has come again uh, sometime in 2020, which looked only at the ISR of calcific uh, uh, lesions, and they found the incidence to be hovering around 10% uh, or so, which is uh, much higher than that the other uh, lesion subsets, it's primarily linked to these factors because you don't have a circular lumen, so your apposition is not going to be perfect. And what you're achieving is much better than what the individual came with. And uh, you are kind of, in majority of the cases, you are doing what is called a spot stenting. You know, you've chosen a particular spot and you put a stent, but the entire vessel has got uh, such diffuse calcific disease that the outcomes are going to be uh, poor. You know, I, I did pre-COVID one um, etherectomy using root ablation and during COVID period, he had stent thrombosis. And when he came back, he had the other the lesions in the RCA which progressed. Mm -hmm. LAD stent had uh, kind of uh, had thrombosis, which was probably linked to under expansion as well as some malaposition. We had not done the OCT in that case. So we used IVL for the RC and we also delivered pulses onto the LED stent and expanded it further. So I mean, it's a continuous process. You have to be prepared and stent failure rates are going to be phenomenal if you're dealing with calcium. So that is a reality and we must keep that in mind while following up these patients. Dr. Deepak, what is your take on this? Yes, sir. Chadha sir, as usual, wonderful and uh, masterly presentation. I uh, said so two important points. Uh, it's a take-home message from your presentation. Number one, when you have a protruding calcification, uh, do not ultimately chase the lesion. You are you likely end up with some amount of malaposition. You have an eccentric final lumen, but in spite of that, yeah. if you have a reasonable lumen size, if you have achieved more than 5.5 or so, then probably at that point of time, do not, do not go ahead go ahead with high pressure dilatation, you might end up with perforations. The second most important point is the, these new concepts like uh, calcific, uh, superficial calcific plates or superficial calcific sheets. These are the ones ultimately that produces more of troponin leaks 
uh, we always tend to feel that these protrusions pro, uh, ere, ere, protrusions and the calcific protrusions are the ones which are difficult to treat and ultimately we end up with bad results but then we know from this particular article that you have mentioned in 2009 jack we come to know that the superficial plates the superficial sheets of calcium are the one ones that leads on to more of maze during the procedure thank you so much doctor so, you want to say something yeah actually if you see the harijan ami acuity trial as the severity increase the maze rate is more as dr chedda sir told very clearly these patients are with the late like initially they come with a lipid fibrinoid block and then calcific blocks so these are the advanced atherosclerotic disease process so majority of these patients will have extensive atheroma with long standing nature so many times they will have a diffuse atherosclerotic calcific block so though we are uh, addressing them many of them are usually diabetics or advanced age renal failure the if you see the uh, risk factors for calcification coronary calcification one is advanced days one is crf one is diabetic so these are the patients who are going to all these patients comes under very high risk recurrence rate is high in these groups so but but anyhow with existing modalities try to achieve the bigger area the mean luminal area mean stent area are you achieving adequately or not adequate block modification are you doing or not but in these patients if you leave them with under expansion definitely uh, uh, the stent thrombus isr is very very high uh, once you achieve the mean stent area even if you have a, some malocclusion you can leave them because malocclusion uh, is a not a strong predictor for though coincidentally like a pesto or prestige or invest trials have shown the malocclusion also was with stent thrombus but uh, no other uh, randomized trial has shown very clearly the malocclusion the one of the single most predictor of the stent thrombus is under expansion as long as you get the very good area then you can leave it don't go on chasing because this symmetrical because the one calcific nodule protruding inside you can't get the circular so leave them if you achieve adequate uh, stent area uh, already sir highlighted all the aspects including the Uh, latest uh, review of the literature i think uh, it's a very wonderful presentation very nice to hear you sir unmute puri unmute unmute it was an excellent presentation we learned a lot about uh, uh, how to deal with uh, these kind of calcium and most important is to learn that many a times you will not be able to achieve everything and you need to decide where you going need to stop your procedure and leave the patient sending that yes we have done enough i think with this we will uh, move on to our uh, uh, last uh, speaker and uh, dr gopal krishna is going to tell us how do we modify our calcific plaque with the use of ivl and rota and all this thing professor gopal krishna sir can you see my screen yeah 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 i am uh, yes, compared to the dr chadar's presentation my presentation is very simple i will rush which is a simple case which he, um and uh, dr caesar wanted me to share a some ivl case that i am doing it very simple straightforward case so that i'll rush through it in the interest of the time so pardon me if i am pushing through the images faster so this is uh, a case of uh, oct guided ivl intervention in a calcified coronary this is one of the you know, posters you can have when you are using in the cath lab stent optimization you can see you can use this cath posters in the cath lab for ivers as well as oct which we keep in our cath lab to guide us to the uh, thing when initial what you run and treat then you do a run and post pca what to expect to see we can have this kind of posters in our cath lab to guide younger people this is mostly to guide younger people who are uh um, looking at i have a 75 year old with usual risk factors here post cavg presented with prolonged chest discomfort with troponin rise his creatinine is normally has an uncontrolled diabetes and uh, that's the lesion we are looking at the lady lesion we intended to treat the lady lesion now that's the rca and he has a patent uh, only the graft patent is lima 2 diagonal so this is the lesion 
planning to treat and uh, I did uh, 1.5 bar rota because the balloon is not crossable through the lesion. Is a balloon uncrossable lesion? Then we did the pre-PCIOCT run and uh, by <coughs> I will go through the OCT findings. You have uh, significant calcium on around circular, the deep calcium as well as superficial calcium. The length of the calcium is more and uh, 16 millimeters and the thickness is more than 5 mm and uh, 0.5 mm and it is more than 50% vessel work. We all know by OCT GA guide, uh, the calcium volume index score, CBA score, when it is four, we need uh, to fix it. So we chose because the IVL the balloon is now crossable. We took the, yeah, because the distal difference diameter is three millimeters. So we took a three by 12 IVL balloon and we delivered the IVL balloon. The, the OCT helps us where the calcium is. Probably if you have a um, co-registration also, you, you can mark where the calcium is and you can deliver your IVL pulses where the calcium is. That helps also in the delivering the right area, the like, uh, this clock, uh, uh, this thing. And so this is the angio after the IVL pulses and post IVL, I did a OCT run and we have demonstrated as you what we are hearing. Our, uh, the, the, the cracks and crevices uh, following the IVL run. And then we looked at the, the MLD, the length of the lesion, 23 millimeter, distal reference is three millimeters, proximal reference is um, 3.5, distal reference is 2.5. So we took a 2.5 stand um, and uh, 23, and we did the mid uh, portion with a three millimeter balloon dilatation. We have an uh, malo position in the center and uh, proximally two. And uh, that is, uh, uh, these are the small positions and uh, we have identified a small area of a section which is not significant and we not to treat it is we all know the HD section. And we did the part with 3.5 in the approximately 16 atmosphere. We did uh, and dedilated the mid portion of the stand and we did the OCT there. We tried to correct it uh, with, uh, this is the OCT with a full good position and uh, even uh, the central we tried with the three millimeter balloon, corrected it and uh, this is the end result. And uh, PCI, post PCI. The OCT clearly identifies calcium and helps in deciding PCI strategy. And we all know that uh, MLD max criteria. Uh, and uh, this is uh, one of the algorithms which is uh, famous. I put it in a form for the younger people to go through this, uh, how to deal with it in an algorithmic pattern fashion. The OCT are amazing. This is calcium. See whether it is superficial. And we have heard a lot about the, the OCT. If you have less than or equal to two of the following criteria, the thickness, uh, the length, and the arc, and I was one or less than wall follow criteria, the circumferential, and uh, you need to do an IVL, LK, and, uh, and specialty. If the calcium is more, if the all four, three criteria are met, or in IVS, if they have more, equal to two or more than two of the criteria which is shown, then you have to do uh, orbital laserectomy or rotational laserectomy. And people can use this depending on their experience, either of these things in both the things. If the calcium is deep, you need to use one of these, particularly the IVL as Dr. Chada was showing, the deep calcium is helped the IVL. With the nodular calcium, they need an uh, orbital, orbital laserectomy mostly. With the uncrossable lesion also, you need to start with orbital laserectomy or rotational laserectomy. Then you have to demonstrate calcium fracture or nodular debulking on OCT IVS. There is still no, you have to go back and work on it and uh, go back to IVL or orbital rotation, demonstrate the calcium practice again. If the factors are seen and uh, if they are seen, then you have to go to a high pressure balloon and deploy a DES and do an 80, at least 18 millimeter NC diameter and if needed a OPN. And that's why we end your uh, um, final uh, result. Thank you for patient hearing. 
I just rushed through to the uh, interest of the time. Thank you. I think, uh, Professor Gopal Krishna, I think it was one of the most uh, simplistic, simplistic uh, demonstration of uh, how to deal a calcium. Uh, and especially all those who have been using IVL and uh, OCT and uh, there's a confusion when to use a rota, when to use a OCT, and when to use just a balloon. I think that was the initial discussion which we had and it has very nicely and very lucid way you have told us uh, depending on the uh, extent of calcium and where you need to do and you know, how we are going to go ahead with it. Uh, Dr. Deepak? Yes, yes, yes sir. So, so it is an excellent presentation. Uh, two important points that I understood was uh, the usage of imaging would definitely help you in identifying the area where you are going to uh, keep the IVL balloon and you would also get an idea regarding the size of the IVL balloon. So that is a key important point. Probably the angio registration would have helped you in a better way, but then this was this was fair enough. You have a diffuse lesion in diffusely calcified vessel and uh, Deepak, can you be close to the mic so that we can hear you better? Yeah. <laughs> so, so can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, yes, sir. So, so two important points. One, based on OCT, you made out that the area where you were supposed to position the IVL balloon because you made out clearly the area where you have significant amount of calcification in the diffusely calcified vessel. Secondly, you were able to identify precisely the size of the balloon that you had to go for. So that was the advantage of using an imaging in this part particular diffusely calcified region. Uh, Dr. Sahu, any quick comment from you? Ike Sahu, sir, are you still there? Yes, I am there. Yes, yes sir. It was very, as you said, it was a very simplistic approach uh, which was uh, demonstrated. And as usual, Dr. Gopal Krishna always tries, to, as a teacher, he tries to show whatever is uh, good and easy to learn. So, definitely a good presentation, nothing more to add. And uh, I was trying to click the pictures of his last approach, actually. <laughs> that is why I switched off the camera. <laughs> anyway, thank you, sir. I think we have Dr. Selvamani with us also. So, Dr. Selvamani, anything you want to add to this? Mute. Sir, uh, excellent, uh, uh, easy approach, especially for uh, juniors who really want to uh, learn about calcium. And uh, it was very good and uh, nothing very uh, more thing to add for that. Chanda sir also delivered an excellent talk. We have learned, and Gopalakrishnan sir, he demonstrated the easy algorithm. And as he showed that, I think probably when we have a lot of fellows working with us, these charts in the cat lab definitely help so that you can make uh, uh, sure that you have achieved whatever the target is there. Very nice of you to present such a very simple uh, approach and for, very useful for juniors, sir. Thank you. Uh, before we close it off, I'll ask uh, Dr. Sridhar to make a final quick comment. Yeah, actually, uh, it's a very uh, nice discussion about the calcium management during PCA. Uh, Dr. Chedda, sir, has showed one case like where the deep calcium behind the stent starts. That is also very, very important. This is a new term called paleoatherosclerosis. The paleoatherosclerosis, if you have a more calcium burden behind the stent starts, if you are leaving, if Definitely that can lead to progression of the uh, inside the stent that may contribute to the neoatherosclerosis also. That's the reason if you, if, like in big weather, if you are, though ESC recommended 4.5 square mm, uh, main lumen area, proximal distal landing zone, stent area. But if they're like a very big vessel, like a uh, 9 mm square mm bezel, but that is not sufficient if you have large calcium leaving behind in such cases, that only that IVL can address the deep calcium and the debulk that one, then most of the time, the progression of the atherosclerosis is very less. I think this is one. And then we can move on to the uh, next session. But uh, thank uh, you. Sri Dhar, Sri Dhar, one question. Yes, sir. Uh, any of the, uh, Dr. Chadha, can you answer me if you are online? One question. What is the effect of the IVL in a patient, the calcium behind the stent? Do you have do you some information on if the patient is already stented under expanded stent, there's still calcium behind the stent. The IVL is it going to work? Any of the panel members? Yeah. IVL yeah. definitely works. It has shown very clearly behind the stent set. That is the only one modality where it can address the deep calcium behind because it's a creates the micro bubbles 
and it rapidly expands and collapses. And the, through the beyond stress also, it can spread and it can break the micro fractures. It, that the reason compliance it alters and definitely after that expansion will be much better. Do we do it differently or the same as routine? Yes, same, same, exactly same. Okay, thank you. So I think it was an excellent uh, session we had uh, regarding the role of OCT in different uh, scenarios, starting from uh, how we see new atherosclerosis and uh, in, uh, instant restenosis and uh, uh, its role, and which clearly told us that patient in instant restenosis, how the calcium and others, they come in and which can change our uh, way we deal with them. And then we had an excellent talk with Dr. Narsaraju, which told us about uh, the role in acute coronary syndrome and and uh, and two wonderful talk by Dr. Chadha and Dr. Uh, Gopal Krishna regarding uh, uh, calcium protrusion, calcium sheets, and uh, and we have excellent demonstration of uh, role of imaging in uh, CTO. So overall, it was a great learning uh, to be a part of this session. And uh, I think uh, we close this session and we move on to the next session. Uh, Dr. Sridhar, you can uh, take over from here. Thank you, Dr. Purohit, for moderating this session. Excellently, you coordinated, you, even you gave your expert comments. Then we will move on to the next uh, this debate. Uh, expert panel members, sir, we have a uh, very highly reputed uh, uh, panelist who can uh, be the expert panel members, Dr. M.S. Hiramet, Dr. Chedda, sir, is there. And, uh, Dr. Shailendra Singh and Dr. Ajit uh, Meenan, uh, morning he gave lecture, but uh, due to some emergency, he left. And this session will be moderated by Dr. Shashir Kant, uh, who is also a very reputed senior uh, consultant from Ishwada Hospital. Shailendra is uh, presently is in uh, uh, Sunshine Hospital, very well-known uh, senior reputed panelist. Uh, you are all familiar with uh, Dr. Hiramat from Pune, Ruby Hall, and Dr. Chedda sir from Bangalore. So they, all these doctors, they don't need any introduction, but uh, with this one, I will request Dr. Sheshikant to moderate session. Uh, Sheshi, Sheshi, have you joined? So we have Sheshikant sir with us, <clears throat> yeah. but looks like there's some technical uh, thing. Uh, so then, meanwhile, uh, you can start the first talk, sir. Then we will go to the first topic. Uh, that is uh, Dr. P.K. Sahu is going to, uh, Dr. Sahu, are you ready? Yes. Uh, yes, I'm ready. I'm uh, ready. Calcium plaque assessment during debulking method uh, by OCT. The, he can cover both OC, OCT and us. Dr. Uh, Nahu, uh, over to you, sir. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, but I have actually prepared mainly on OCT. So, no, anyway, sure. uh, is my, are my slides visible? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sridhar, for uh, inviting me once again to talk something on calcium because almost there will be repetition and my previous speakers have already uh, discussed uh, about calcium in depth. And uh, I have little to add, but I'll just give my in views about uh, how to do an assessment during debulking uh, through uh, debulking uh, lesion with the help of an OCD. I always say calcium is something which is like the hidden uh, part of an iceberg, which we don't see on an angio. And uh, in fact, these things are something which you miss. And then we hit it, we hit it really bad. So uh, why are we so phobic about calcific lesions? First of all, we are worried about balloon rupture. We can worry about vessel perforation and rupture, dissections. And most of these lesions are non-dilatable. So we have an unsuccessful PCI. And many of the stents, because of the calcium, are underdeployed or unopposed, malopposed. And most importantly, we see with uh, more and more cases as we do with imaging that they're asymmetric expansion. Increased major cardiac events, increased restenosis, TLR, higher stent thrombosis, higher very procedural MI. And most importantly, when you put a drug listing stent, what you see is that there's a reduced drug concentration and uptake into the arterial wall because there is calcium. So somehow you have to break this calcium is to debulk it and then finally put a stent so that at least the long-term results are good. Now, I'd like to discuss this in four points. That is, I'd like to discuss about the morphology, the importance of this imaging, the strategy of management in various subsets, and one or two case studies that I'd like to put. Coming to morphology, you will see that uh, as we proceed with the uh, atherosclerosis, calcific lesions are the most complicated plaques. That is, once a lesion becomes calcific, we're very sure that we are dealing with a very complicated plaque. 
Now, what is the importance of OCT in these cases? If you compare, try to compare all modalities of imaging, you'll see the most uh, important one is OCT because there's a sharp delineation of the calcium area. Detection is best, localization is best, and quantification is best. So this is the only modality which scores over all, the, all other methods where we have to evaluate calcium. Now, as I say always that uh, OCT evaluation calcium has to follow three steps. First, you find the step site of calcium, see the extent of calcium, quantify the calcium. If you just follow the simple algorithm, then definitely you will not miss anything. Site, there are three types. It might be superficial that you might see on an OCT, it might be deep, or it might be nodule. So it's very easy that once you see the site, first then try to see what is the exact location of the calcium. The step two is you try to see what is the extent. Is it an eccentric calcium or a concentric calcium? Because your management may depend or your management will vary depend on whether it is just an eccentric part or whether it's the full concentric part of the calcium. Last and most important step is to quantify. Now, when you quantify, you have to see the length, the area, and the this thing that is a thickness. So it's very easy to say that you see the length first if it is more than five millimeter, you see the arc as has already been discussed, it should be more than 180 degrees, and you see the thickness, it is more than 0.5 millimeter. So these are the three things that you do have to qualify. So three steps and every thing you have to do three thrice that you have to know what has is going on. Lastly, we have to be very sure what is a deep calcium. A deep calcium is something which you'll see has got uh, calcium, but the presence of, th of thick fibrotic cap is there, and this is usually non-luminal. So there may be type one type of deep calcium or type two type of deep calcium, depending on what, where the calcium is. Coming to the strategy of management, I again go to this, uh, this thing that is uh, algorithm, which must have been discussed many times. If it is a mild calcium, there's nothing much to do, just to go with a balloon dilatation and then try to do an IVUS and try to see what is the uh, this thing uh, strategy to plan. But if you're doing an IVUS or OCT in a moderate to severe calcium, as I told, you can do a point system. And of course, this has, as has been, this is something very arbitrary. And especially in our country, we did not uh, necessarily follow this, but definitely one thing for sure, as Dr. Gopal Krishna has told, and everyone has stressed that once it's an uncrossable lesion, Rotablation is the first thing that is to be done. Now, there's one to two points uh, you can go for uh, this thing that is NC balloon or a high pressure balloon, or even this opium balloons with very high pressure do work in even in patients with uh, cal heavy calcium. But first two point system, the calcium are giving two points, the calcium are more than 273 points, the calcium length like more than five, one or two points, the thickness one point. Now one or two case studies to show how the strategy changes First is you can also escape only with using balloons. So you don't have to do much. And we have a various set of balloons. We have the NC balloons. We have the scoring balloons. We have the this thing, cutting balloons. And of course, we knew the OPN balloons. So these are certain things which we have in our armamentarium, which can be used just with balloons. You can escape. Now, this patient had definitely a chunk of calcium over here. As you see, this is a TNT positive. He was a reformed smoker, hypertension, diabetic. The first thing that we did was just I'll, for brevity of time, I will just try to show you what we saw. We saw that first there was a, quite a good amount of calcium, almost covering quite a significant portion. You can see the calcium over here, which is superficial, almost extending also to some deep portion also. And the arc is almost more than almost nearing 180 degrees, you can see. From this part, the calcium starts and continues till this. So this is a big chunk of calcium that we have. And the thing was that what to do, but the lumen was quite big, excepting for this area. So I decided to first to just do a scoring. The scoring came to almost uh, 20 millimeter. The thickness was more than five and almost three. And in this case, anyone would have first thought of using a lithotripsy or doing some other modality, but I first wanted to do it with balloons. This is where my patient comes in between around three points. And here, what we did with just first a cutting balloon was used. After the cutting balloon, what we did was a NC balloon dilatation and the results looks very good on an angio. So we thought that possibly we've done the job well, but here comes the question that 
uh, post uh, this thing OCP is important because what we see is a good job and anyone who would have not have done an imaging would have left it as such without doing anything further. But when an imaging was done, if you try to see what we see in the imaging, two things we see that this part of the calcific part has not expanded well. This is something you see, although it is well opposed, but the expansion is not good. And most importantly, if you see a part of the initial part of the stent is unopposed, almost one fourth of the quadrant is not opposed at all. So this gives us the insight or the learning that we are not doing a proper job over here and a lot remains to be done. And this was what was done, the pot was done and opium was taken and this part was dilated. And now we can see after the opium being given at a very high pressure at this point of 20, you can see this is fully opened up. So these are certain situations where you have to use this high pressure balloons. And finally, you see that even the part which has not opposed has now got fully opposed. So this is the beauty of these balloons. And in fact, with these balloons, we can escape in calcific lesion. And we don't have to use this costly gadgets because many of our patients don't afford them. So now we come to the second subset of an uncrossable lesion. Whenever there's an uncrossable lesion, as we know, we have to use an atherectomy device. And among them, the most commonly used atherectomy device is the rotational atherectomy that we use. And it's an age-old device. And we have to get a little, this learning curve is a little bit but once you get used to it, I think it's one of the best forms of doing uh, this thing that is debulking. Now, this is a case where you can see there's a very tight calcific lesion over here. And here, in fact, the balloon wouldn't cross. And because the balloon wouldn't cross, the next thing to be done was to go for an, if you try to score it, possibly uncrossable lesions, you first have to think of a rotablation. That is the whole thing. And this is what we did. In fact, we took a 1.5 bar and started rotablating it. And uh, this is the result that we got after the rotablation, we could make some lumen. And in fact, we, I wanted to upsize the burr, but I think this lumen was enough to pass a balloon. And this was the post rota images. So you can see that is the various images you can see, but of course not a great result over here, but definitely some amount of lumen has been created. And this could take a balloon, uh, NC balloon was used and then with the NC balloon, you can see how the dissection or the plaque has already been modified. And with a very high pressure, the lesion has opened up. So first to debulk with a rota, very uncrossable lesion, then you use a NC balloon, and then you can debulk it. Then this is a post NC balloon, you analyze it, what has happened, you can see the dissections that you have caused at various parts. And if you see the lumen, the longitudinal section, you can see definitely that the uh, artery has well uh, opened up and you have prepared a good bed. So sometimes you have to take recourse to all these modalities. And this is what has happened as we post uh, this thing, a stent that has been put, and then the proximal optimization has been done and the result has been good. And so this is just the OCT analysis post stenting. You can see the stent is very well opposed, well expanded. And at various stages, you can see there's no edge dissection. The stent at the point where it was maximally, uh, this thing that is constricted has well opened up. And you can see the opposition indicator showing that it is well, well opposed. So these are strategies which has to follow the uncrossable lesions. So first you do a rota, then you stake it ahead. And now beyond balloons and atherectomy, already Gopal Krishna sir has showed about the IVL. And I have very little experience about the IVL. And this is a reserved for patients who have a very high score of around three to five points. And possibly most of our patients don't afford it. And here, as Sridhar sir had said, that we can go with an opium balloon. And in my practice, I've also seen that opium balloons, if you go to very high pressures up to four, this thing, 45 or 40, they do break. And in fact, you save a lot of money in this. So the IVL is the last resort that we have, and these are cases of IVL which has been done where you can see that deep calcium and all this calcium can also be uh, broken up by using this uh, uh, IVL. So these are the three types of subsets and how to de debulk it just by using balloons, just by an uncrossable uh, lesion, by using uh, this thing that is uh, rotavulation followed by balloons, or in some cases, just go ahead with an IVL. So to conclude, an OCT-based calculated approach in debulking calcific coronary lesions gives the best long-term results. So you have to first do a pre-OCT, no score it, do a stepwise approach, and finally score it, and then finally choose what is the strategy to be followed. Thank you very much for the patient hearing. 
thank you uh, for a wonderful talk. Uh, now I request Dr. Hiramath sir and Dr. Chedda and Dr. Shailendra Singh to comment about this presentation. Sir, a few words from Dr. Yeah, Dr. Prashant, uh, very, very well done again. Uh, I think calcium is, uh, if you see the talks across uh, in last few months, calcium is uh, the one area which we are trying to conquer and everybody is talking of their experiences. So uh, rotablator is uh, very much there. Then uh, IVL is, of course, getting a lot of importance. But uh, I would many times feel that we have used rota with an OPN balloon, and this combination uh, it generally uh, uh, very works very well for most of the calcified lesion. There would be, of course, a subset where you need rota plus IVL combination, um, especially if you are not using IVL. I think the uh, vessel rupture is something which we worry about. Uh, uh, so I think uh, you have to be very judicious in making a choice. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chedda. Sir, Dr. Chedda, sir, is available? Sir, we have got lost Dr. Yes. Chedda, sir. Uh, then Dr. Shailendar Singh. Uh, we have Shashikan, sir, who has joined us, sir. Yeah. yeah. I think it was an excellent lecture and uh, various approaches to calcification, and how important is OCT in trying to classify which calcification requires what type of intervention? I think it was an excellent lecture. Thank you. Sheshkan, sir, please unmute yourself. Sheshkan, please comment. Sheshkan, unmute. No, I, I, I just joined, so I, 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 will, I will see the next uh, topics and then I'll. Yeah. I, I had a primary, so I could not join. I was logged in, but I could not join. Thank you. I'm and sorry for the delay. No issue. Uh, I think, uh, as Dr. Shirish Haramat sir said, uh, he mentioned very clearly common if rota and IVL, uh, that uh, OPN and C. So actually, a few cases where we did rota, uh, because even after rota also, when we did the OCT, we didn't find any fractures. Even uh, the calcium thickness was almost 1 million, uh, despite using 1.5 bar. Then uh, what to do next? So we were uh, trying to upsize the bar, but the bar was not there in the shelf, like 1.752, not available. So then we thought, uh, OK, let us go ahead. And uh, uh, because open NC was there, uh, we thought we'll do the open NC balloon dilatation. Then uh, 1.5 bar, even we did with 1,80,000, 2 lakhs, and uh, almost 8 to 10 uh, uh, cycles were given. So then subsequently, then what we did the, with the open NC, post dilatation, we got adequate expansion. Then the repeat OCT showed even for calcium fractures. So that's the reason if the, once you do the plug modification, if the thickness more than 0.5 mm, if you don't find the calcium fractures, definitely you have to, uh, you have to use another modality in the form of IVL or open NC. Otherwise, under expansion rate, dark bone effect is very high and that lead to stent thrombosis and ISR. So ultimately we should achieve adequate expansion. Sridhar, I would also feel that uh, if you have done a rota and then you are trying to use an OPN, maybe you should undersize that OPN a bit uh, and then go very high on pressure. I think that works much better than uh, taking an equal diameter uh, balloon, OPN balloon and going to 45 and 50. So undersize a bit. We want to crack only a focal area of calcification, which is highly resistant. So this uh, technique works very well. I use the same for NC balloons also. That uh, whenever the lesion is not yielding, I undersize and go away on very high pressure. Similarly, for OPN also, similar strategy might work. Unfortunately. Uh, we don't have OPN coming in quarter sizes as yet, you know. Mm -hmm. I have a comment, Dr. Sridhar, actually. I'm, yeah. like, I'm joining late, sorry for this. Mm -hmm. uh, two, two, two important points. One is that when we have an elective case with a dense calcium, we have studied the lesion, it's important that we arrange the right size being available on the table. 
like i had two patients where we had a situation where we needed a 2 mm burr and we had to wait for a week i think one we need to plan for large vessels it's not just enough to do a 1.25 1.5 burr we need to plan with the the burr right burr size being available on the table this is number one number two point when we do a, a an ivl for the patient we have already stented but we have realized that we have not got a real good expansion of the stent would it disrupt the stent struts would ivl disrupt the stent struts and fracture the stent stent lead to a future uh, uh, scope for a isr this is my question So in, fact, uh, uh, in fact in fact shashikan uh, i would uh, probably feel that under these settings like uh, you fear your calcium outside and the stent is not expanded you are landed into that situation that the stent is not expanded uh, i think uh, ivl is the only modality that is uh, possibly can be used uh, uh-huh. uh, try and uh, make sure that the stent is well opposed though not fully expanded that is one way we used to do it earlier but uh, going further uh, ivl will probably allow you to expand it too so any, any experience of the house any experience of the house with uh, a post ivl oct after stenting uh, yeah, as well we did would it, would it would it would it fracture the stent struts no, would it uh, yeah. start the anatomy of the stent mm-hmm. there are no uh, the studies uh, uh, the disrupt study or other studies also uh, there is no evidence the ivl will not produce the fractures why because it creates a micro bubbles the micro bubble rapidly expands and collapses that will not affect the it will go through the calcium plate it will not it's a micro bubbles only micro bubbles uh, that will expand it generates uh, almost 50 to 60 atmospheres so because of the high pressure it creates a uh, micro fractures in the calcium plate it will not produce the fractures and uh, we did one uh, i did one case of uh, uh, isr uh, uh, after rota nine months later patient developed uh, isr that led to uh, then we reassessed with the oct there is a large chunk of calcium behind the stent sets then we used ivl to get the adequate expansion the stent is absolutely very well intact so uh, even uh, the mechanism also it will not produce the fractures because the micro bubble formation so that is very very important so behind the stent struts this is one of the best modality even in isr with uh, behind the stent struts uh, uh, if the paleoarthroscopy this is one of the best modality to best or the only modality i thought yeah that is the only one modality use it the only modality today the stone and uh, nowadays uh, even a uh, company also not uh, keeping up uh, 1.752 because the usage is very less uh, we have been yes. asking them so that is one of the disadvantage and uh, uh, even ivl also as i said uh, it is producing even a severely concentric uh, uh, calcific blocks napkin rings even thickness 1 mm it is providing the it's producing the fractures it is a very effective tool they rota with combination also works very well as i said just slightly undersized before going for high uh, inflation pressures uh, and uh, sometimes when you are doing acs like advanced days temi patients calcified there is emergency there you cannot like calcify nodule where two three opn and c also ruptures in such cases upsizing bar many times you cannot keep so but I always try to keep uh, in the shelf but uh, because of the shortage because companies also not keeping all the time because the usage is much lower even studies also have shown 95% of that only block modification no need of go with bigger don't ablate more that is as with more mess rate so i always the majority of the cases you can do you can perform with 1.5 bar with this note we can move on to the uh, next topic uh, speaker dr Sh- Shantan Desh Pandey. The topic is debulking strategy for severely calcified coronary arteries. Uh, Rota. Sir, over to you, sir. Uh, Dr. Shantan, sir, can you unmute yourself, please? Fine. Can you see my presentation? Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Kasturi, for inviting me. Uh, I sort of prepared it like a debate, actually, rather. <laughs> so. Uh, debulking strategy for severely calcified arteries we all know we have, dis- we have been discussing whole morning 
the spectrum of plaque plaque calcification which can be concentric eccentric it can be intimal deep calcium it can be long or focal napkin ring type of calcification what is also important is the vessel size what is the residual lumen and patient risk estimation patient with ckd diabetes all all other uh, uh, risk factor estimation this is all important and we all know we since morning we have been discussing this is the data from the horizon cmi and acute trials as the severity of calcium goes on increasing the event rates you see across all event rates go on increasing with the severity of calcium so calcium is a problem in the intervention and uh, you can see this is a, like a borrowed site what, what happens if you treat inadequately uh, calcium this is a completely under expanded stain and this is a result of uh, not debulking the lesion prior to uh, aneuplasty putting the stain so this is what happens completely under expanded stains so we had all kinds of therapies from uh, balloons like a simple non compliant balloon to a cutting balloon to the scoring balloon to the new opnc balloons the rotational atherectomy which has been the gold standard since years then orbital atherectomy which is not available in india still and lithoplasty is a new kid on the block so why we are debating even today why rota versus uh, why rota because rotablation is a established therapy for more than 30 years it has survived test of time and when you need rotablation you need it there is no other option and you 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 are seeing cases since morning uh, like patients even though needed ivl we treated many times previous uh, prior to that with the rotablation what has happened is the introduction of ivl last year has a post challenge to rotablation as an alternate therapy which is much user friendly with supposedly less complication hence this debate so this debate is because of this ivl is uh, a true competitor to the rotablation at present so questions are today is it any as with any new technology we have to be always ask question is it as effective or is it superior second question is uh, is it helpful in all clinical scenarios in real world practice <clears throat> and third is a uh, is it really complication free so we all agree this rep 3 showed a very good result procedural success was around 92% in the control environment of clinical trial if you can see in real world in all comers remains to be seen so i will discuss some common clinical scenarios next which we always see day to day practice the first is a severe visible calcium on cg and we most of the time plan a such a case with all debulking strategies on table like even ivl we can call and keep it in such situations but there are some lesions which are uncrossable lesions some lesions are deceptive we, we tend to take these patients where where thinking will not need any of the debulking strategies and uh, we land in trouble and stand failures so first is a uh, severe calcium and uh, this is a very good study prepare cas study which was published in uh, 2018 where they they had used a modified balloon like a, a scoring balloon or a cutting balloon and what what was the strategy success I, I, and it was compared with the elective rotational atherectomy you can see the strategy success was 98% in rotational atherectomy whereas it was just 81% with the balloon techniques so 20% of the patient crossed over and this is going to be a big problem in further designing trials even if you design a trial of ivl with versus rotational atherectomy this cross over problem is going to be there and you don't know how to interpret data then because 20% patients will need some some kind of rotational atherectomy prior to this uh, devices can be put even though there is no comparison we can extrapolate the same with for ivl at present uncrossable lesion now like this, this is a patient uh, which we had taken uh, some years back this was a very high grade dystonosis with severe calcium now this is a patient uh, which was done electively so we had planned for uh, all all kinds of uh, things there and uh, this wire got passed but after that crossing of wire nothing is going crossing the lesion no, not a 1.2 mm balloon not a fine cross nothing was crossing even a fine cross was not cross, crossing now this is a real world problem and this such a kind of patients are never included in trials so with a uh, fine cross jammed in i had to pass a rotablation uh, rota wire and this is the one, one one of the methods to just jam the uh, fine cross and pass the rota wire and uh, I, i had to do, do a 1.25 bar and after that the same thing i had to do then post dilatation with a high high pressure non compliant balloons and uh, this was a result which was achieved uh, post procedure uh, 
so this uncrossable lesions remains a problem the ibl balloon being a high profile it's very difficult to cross even even little high grade lesion also you won't be able to pass and you will need some kind of a preparation prior to passing this ibl balloon now deceptive lesions now this is a patient which which i presented in one of the meetings and asked the questions how will you treat this and uh, most of them i agreed just wire stain wire balloon and stain stain it so it look like a very simple case a routine case Now this becomes a deceptive case. Here nothing was crossing. I had to use an anchor balloon. Pass uh, with a lot of difficulty. After passing 1.25, you know, I could pass a little 2.5 millimeter balloon with lot of difficulty and which was not expanding. Now, now such 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 a problem always occurs in cath labs where uh, there is no angiographic visible calcium. You are not done imaging. You don't know, and suddenly you uh, you are in trouble and you don't have devices. Most of the labs won't have a ad hoc LBI. Uh, most of the time, I will you have to call for, and uh, in such even if it's available, I don't think this will cross uh, this type of lesion. Rota is available in most of the lab uh, labs, and rota can be just we can pass a wire and do a rota ablation, and most of the time we'll be successful more than ninety nine percent of the times. I I have to just pass a wire and uh, rota ablate it, and then uh, complete the procedure. It was a uh, uh, easy job after that. Now strain failure remains a problem. This is again a uh, uh, courtesy doctor Nicholas. This is you can see a severely underexpanded stain here, and there is a restenosis. Initially, NC balloon dilatations were given. There was no no. Uh, you can see the MLA of just 3.38 in spite of high pressure dilatations. Then IVL was used here. The four into 12 millimeter around eight therapies were given, and this is a, a post IVL. So there is no expansion of the stain even in spite of IVL. So it's not like that. The IVL will always work for underexpanded stain, especially if there are multiple layers or calcium nodules underlying. So it's not like a foolproof therapy even. It's a still new therapy, not much tested in real world. And uh, now, now this is a, uh, this is one more case. Uh, this patient was treated uh, in periphery. This he was done. Uh, endoplasty was done. This was the result. The stain was severely underexpanded. And they couldn't uh, expand even at 24 uh, atmospheres. Uh, they dilated this uh, lesion, and they couldn't expand. So this patient came to me after a month with severe uh, restenosis and angina. So I had to rota blit uh, this uh, stain. It required a lot of time, around five minutes of bur time was required. But patients were required here, and 1.5 millimeter bur I could do it, and uh, this was a result uh, after. So stains. Can be ablated with rota ablation, and we can achieve a result. It's not necessarily only I will work will work in such situations. I will disrupt uh, CAD three was a study which was published. What they show you this is a inclusion and exclusion criteria. This is a slide most of us see, but what we don't see is this exclusion criteria, and this is a source from clinical trial. Uh, 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 site website. What was the exclusion criteria? Unprotected left means were excluded. Tortuous vessels were excluded. Osteal locations of LED sir RCA were excluded. Unprotected left means was excluded. Bifurcations were excluded. Previous stain within tar target vessel implant within uh, last year. So the previous uh, discussion was uh, is IVL tested in a uh, like you you put a stain and stain remains under expanded. Is it tested? It's not tested yet. It's it tested after a year basically for restenosis. It's not tested for acutely implanted stains yet. So majority real world patients are out in IVL trials. So we don't know. And even though they say there is no perforation dissections, now these case reports are popping in. You can see these case reports: coronary dissection because of IVL, coronary perforation because of IVL. Finally, it's a balloon which gives pulses at 50 atmospheres, so it can cause uh, perfor. It will cause perforations, and we will see patients with dissections and perforations in future. So my final comments: complications and part are part and parcel of any procedure. Zero complication is a myth. I will has definite role in treatment of calcified lesions, but it cannot replace rota. It's an adjunct tool which can be used to treat certain type of calcified lesions like large arteries, concentric calcium, residual uh, calcium rim, in spite of rota. Rota remains most reliable tool in treatment of calcified lesions. Rota works in almost all cases except a very small percent of patients where you get under expansion or non-cat calcium arc where uh, where other additional therapies like OPN and C balloon or uh, cutting balloon or IVL may be additional help. Wire bias on side of calcium is a predictor of success for rota. Reluctance of rota is mainly due to steep learning curve and fear of complications, which can be overcome by incorporating practice of elective rota with image with imaging rather than rota regrets. And as you uh, increase your number of rota ablations, so then uh, definitely complications will go down, and your phobia of rota ablation will go down. So, in conclusion, know your tool bags, what is available in your lab, what is 
how to use high pressure balloons pouring balloons when to use rotational athletomy use of ivl you should know and ultimately rota tips is a term where you do both rotablation rotablation and lithotipsy uh, together imaging imaging to guide appropriate resources and strategy remains uh, the main thing uh, in treating uh, calcified lesions yeah thank you Yeah, yeah, Shashi, you can unmute. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, one wonderful uh, presentation and uh, very to the point uh, presentation of uh, role of IVL and uh, role of rota. Definitely, I would agree. Rota definitely is a major advantage when compared to IVL. Uh, it's I we probably use it ten times more common than IVL. Uh, one because of its uh, maybe it's been there for a long time. Two, it's uh, for long lesions. Uh, definitely, this would be a better. Uh, better better choice there are situations wherein your your burr may sometimes may not cross so sometimes we do a half rotablation you know you just ablate the initial part of the vessel the initial part of the calcium there and then probably take a balloon again and dilate it a bit and then uh, try to see if you can cross it but even half rotablation just entering the lesion the proximal part of the lesion with the rotablation also is a decent choice and then probably you can add on your opian balloons or high pressure balloons or a cutting balloon or a scoring balloon to get a proper result there so uh, i think it's a, it's very nice you have put the uh, in perspective uh, the place of rotablation is of paramount importance and probably second i would say ivl for uh, a, as a uh, uh, model as a, as a way of uh, dealing with calcific lesions Yeah, very nice presentation. Yeah, yeah, half rota is basically uh, is Jap Japanese concept where for angulated arteries where we we always fear perforations, angulated and bend. Uh, there you can do till till the bend you can do a rota ablation and then do a dilatation. The second part is IVL is a very costly therapy. Very few can afford. Frankly speaking, it becomes a very costly therapy, and especially in multi vessel diseases, and you you have to treat multiple uh, arteries in a single sitting. like you can you cannot use two or three balloons in a single patient you will have to use a single balloon and you have a limitation of pulses so like you have long lesion yeah. 80 pulses it's not expanding then you have to add on that adds on cost cost becomes a major hindrance to this therapy actually frankly speaking true true very important also that when you have a long lesion well about 25 uh, 28 38 uh, mm long lesion and you are using an ivl balloon the distal vessel is small and the proximal vessel is quite big again you need to get a 1 is to 1 size of an ivl balloon which would be very difficult you know you the number of balloons would go up because the proximal vessel is 33.5 and the distal vessel is just 2.5 uh, using the same balloon in both the locations would be uh, uh, would be uh, conflicting yeah may, may not achieve the desired result that's absolutely that's absolutely so again so, again the number of pulses are just limited to 80 uh, so and, it definitely and, is a, a, a negative point for ivl probably rota would be a bet, much better yeah, job yeah, in this situation most, most most of us have done a triple vessel angioplasty with 1.5 bar with the same bar used in all three arteries so most of us have done yeah yes I I agree oh, with Dr. Hirmachi if there is a, there is a long lesion and uh, you have done a rota the vessel proximally say 3 5 and the distal end where you finish your rota burring is 2.5 in that case taking two IVL balloons is not possible and most of the time we take NC balloons distally which is 2.5 and proximally it is 3.5 so if you are if you are to take an ivl balloon uh, i guess you need to image and and see which is the critical area where you are going to need an ivl balloon and use the diameter of that uh, vessel to choose your balloon size and your maximum pulses should be given at that particular size so this balloon is obviously not going to be useful on the back side where it will probably be a smaller diameter balloon for the vessel size but even then uh, uh, imaging would help you to choose which is the area which is going to require ivl as a must in addition to rota yeah so a focal focal uh, plaque modification with an ivl would be strategy in diffuse long lesions where the cr most critical points yeah. probably you can do an ivl yeah. the rest of it can be rotablated and then you can do a plaque modification Very nice comment, sir. Thank you, sir. Doctor Shalin Singh, sir, would you like to make any comments, sir? Doctor Shalin, you have to unmute, sir. Yeah, I think uh, very good points have been raised uh, about the use of IVL, but I think I agree with the speaker. The cost is a big issue. 
there is uh, 3.3 lakhs 3.5 lakhs for an ivl balloon and rotablator and all those things i think uh, cost becomes a major limitation of uh, utilizing or doing rota tripsy the cost becomes a very important issue but uh, we can move on to the next session but uh, i think uh, rota is definitely gold standard for calcium yeah it's almost synonymous yeah. only thing is if the rota is not working more cost effective and it's very effective too uh, traditionally we have been using only uh, ivl only thing is uh, those doctors who are not exposed to rota uh, there is a definite learning curve there at least uh, they should not leave the under expand strength that time at least they can use these gadgets which are like a balloon based devices and when there is very touch west is there that time you can try with half rot as shashi suggested or you can go with ivl where the you can cross with the guideline support but a balloon uncrossable only device no rota. choice no yes. choice no other choice rota would be the only choice only when uh, losing the side branch bifurcation is there very critical that time ivl uh, have advantage and even hemodynamically unstable also sometimes you can try with ivl very critical left main led lcx hemodynamically unstable but there you give the mechanical support and do it because where you have a chance of slow flow no flow uh, more in uh, rota compared to ivl ivl doesn't have any slow flow no flow that is the advantage dissection also very less control. the the only problem with the uh, ivl is that when you inflate the balloon for a little longer time the patient can become really unstable with the multiple pulses in one play, one location you especially left main or an ivl uh, uh, australian lady location but rota the most of, most of them tolerate it shock topics also i have been described <laughs> what they call as ectopics or ventricular arrhythmia shock topics i have been described during ivl that is very less often that uh, quite very right quite rare very very yeah. rare case then we'll move on to quite the session yes and uh, i think uh, we have a uh, four speakers and uh, this is mld max incorporation of new algorithm during routine pci expert panel members are dr deepak davidson myself dr selva mani moderator dr narsaraju narsaraju are you available and speakers the first topic is assessment of block by dr deepak davidson over to you dr deepak Yes, Dr. Sridhar. Uh, uh, can you can you share uh, see my screen? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, it's indeed my pleasant privilege to present this particular topic. It's just going to be a revision of whatever we be hearing right from the morning. Uh, this is a very simple slide that we we've been seeing very often over the last two to three years. We know that in a patient with acute coronary syndrome. Almost seventy percent of people, when you do an optical coherence tomography inside the coronary artery, you would see a plaque rupture. You have a disruption of the fibrous cap, and you have a cavity over there. In around five uh, percent of people, you tend to see a calcific nodule as the cause of acute coronary syndrome. And in around twenty-five percent of situations, you tend to see an intact fibrous cap and some amount of clot sitting on the vessel. which means that you would call it as a plaque erosion and very rarely you tend to see something like a, a spontaneous coronary artery dissection now how would one identify a vulnerable plaque while doing an optical coherence tomography the most important criteria is one needs to have have a thin cap which should be less than 65 microns you tend to have more than 180 degree arc of lipid pool over there you could see micro calcificate micro channels which is around uh, Uh, 50 to 200 microns in size, and then you could see macrophages, the inflammatory cells inside the inside the intima or the media. You could see here that you have a bright bright spicule over here, which is actually followed by a gross attenuation of the vessel. And you could also see spotty calcifications and cholesterol crystals like this. Now, when you see these sort of picture, you tend to understand that this is an inflamed vessel. That's the reason why this particular patient has developed an acute coronary syndrome. Now, this is a patient who presented with an acute infusal myocardial infarction. You could see that the PDA is totally occluded. You could also see that there is a Caseness in the proximal right coronary artery. We did an angioplasty for the PDA. The that vessel was stented and opened up. We could achieve a good result. Then we wanted to see what exactly is happening in the proximal right coronary artery, which looked like intermediate stenosis. So we did an OCT of the proximal right coronary artery. 
now you could see that this is the this is the OCT run. Uh, now I shall I shall show you the important things. You could see here that this is the thin cap over there. You could see that there is a huge amount of liquid pool over there. It's occupying the space between six o'clock to twelve o'clock position. So it's a huge liquid pool. You could also see that there is a plaque rupture with the cavity inside the subintimal space over there. Then you could also see that there is white thrombus lying over there. So data again says that when at the site of plaque rupture, the thrombus is often platelet rich, which is a white thrombus, while at the proximal and distal ends of the thrombus, it's composed of layers of fibrin and red blood cells. Now you could also see that this patient had significant amount of sheets of macrophages sitting over here with significant amount of attenuation in behind that. You could also see cholesterol crystals at two o'clock position, and you could also see micro channels at five o'clock position. All these things makes us understand that this is a very friable lesion. This is a very inflamed vessel. So that was primarily the culprit for developing myocardial infarction in this particular patient. So we went ahead and stented the proximal segment also and got a reasonably good result. Now, now can OCT predict slow flow? It said that there are articles which says that when you have a lipid pool length more than nine, nine millimeters, it correlates with slow flow during acute angioplasty and lipid derived, uh, OCT derived lipid index more than 3,500 also, as well when you have significant amount of uh, cholesterol crystals inside the inside the plaque, it correlates with a slow flow during the primary PCA. Now, this was a chap who presented with an anterior wall non-Q infarction. He developed this infarction during exertion. He was doing some heavy, heavy labor when he developed chest pain and he presented to us. You could see that the circumflex osteum has got a critical stenosis. You could also see something interesting. A lady, mid LED has got around 50 to 60 percent intermediate stenosis and the flow in the LED is very slow. So we decided on stenting the left main to circumflex and then to evaluate the lesion in the mid portion of the left anterior descending artery with FFR. And he came back after four weeks for further evaluation. And that point of time, you could see, you could compare the first and second images. In the first image, you could see that the lesion was looking almost 50, 60% in the LAD with slow flow. In the second image, you could see that the lesion is much softer. It's hardly uh, luminal irregularities of the LAD. So we wanted to evaluate that particular lesion in the LAD with OCT. And it was something very interesting when we did the OCT. You could see, uh, see here in this particular longitudinal image that there is there is a plaque rupture in this particular vessel, which I hope you can identify that clearly. You could also see in the cross-sectional image that there is a hematoma over here, and you could also see that there is a, a ruptured plaque at the shoulder of the, you could see that this is the intimal thickening, this is the intimal thickening, and you could see here that the rupture has almost happened in the shoulder of the Fibroatheroma. Now, this is what usually happens when you have a thick cap fibroatheroma that ruptures. This can be better appreciated this in this particular movie. You can see here that the there is there is a plaque rupture at the shoulder over here, and this is going inside. And here at this particular area, you could also see that there is a hematoma over there. So you have a pathological intimal thickening, you have a plaque rupture with a thick cap, and you have an intramural hematoma. Just to keep in mind that the rupture happens at the shoulders when it when it occurs in a in a thick cap when a thick cap fibroatheroma when it ruptures, it usually happens in the shoulders, primarily because of maximal shear stress opening occurring at that particular area. Now coming to plaque erosion, it's primarily the denudation of the endothelium and not the disruption of the fibrous cap. So when you have the denudation of endothelium, blood comes into contact with the collagen in the intima and this, lead, this leads on to thrombus formation. And young man who present with an anti-wall myocardial infarction, you could see that in the proximal left hand descending artery, there is a cloth containing lesion. He was kept on enoxaparin for the next five days and then we took him up again for the procedure. You could see here that the clot has disappeared. So we wanted to see what exactly had happened happened there in that particular vessel. So we did an OCT evaluation. You could see here in this OCT run that there is some amount of fibrous, fibrous plaque. You could see that it's more of bright looking. So it's a fibrous plaque. You do not see any disruption in the fibrous plaque. You can see that there is some white clot. And if you look at the lesion, you could see that the vessel lumen is good. So you have less of lesion severity. You have a white clot. You have no plaque rupture. 
and you have pathological intimal thickening. All this goes in favor of a plaque erosion and the data says that when you have patients with plaque erosion, if you, uh, and if the lesion is less than 70%, you can just keep them on dual antiplatelet therapy and at one month, majority of them, they have good resolution with antithrombotics. This data comes from the erosion trial. Now, this is another patient and young lady who had recurrent angina with no no conventional risk factors. You could see in the proximal left-handed descending artery, there is a there is a plaque. Uh, it's it's almost an intermediate stenosis, which can be better identified in this frozen image in the spider view as well as cranial view. You can identify that when an optical coherence tomographic imaging was done. You could see that there is a significant amount of hematoma inside the inside the. Uh, medial layer, you could see that um, uh, clearly in this particular frozen image. And so this was primarily a case of spontaneous coronary artery dissection, which was uh, stented from the left main into the left anterior descending artery and patient did well following that. Now coming to calcification, we know that when you have deep calcification, we had a good amount of discussion balloon uh, in uh, super high pressure balloons or IVL would be the ideal choice. In the second image, you could see that there, there is an eruptive calcification seen over there. In those situations, you might need an uh, rotablation if you have a favorable wire bias, or you could go for an uh, orbit electrectomy in future when it's going to be available for us. Now, when you have a superficial calcification, again, debulking with rotablation would be the ideal option. Now, with OCT, when you have, when you, when you have calcification, we have heard in the previous talks that you could score the calcification looking at the angle of calcification, you could look at the thickness of calcification and even the length of calcification. When you have higher scores, you know that you are going to have an underexpanded stent, you're going to have an malopause stent, so probably you need to go ahead and debulk those situations when you have a higher score. Now, this is an elderly gentleman who had undergone angioplasty to the proximal left anterior descending artery almost 15 years prior and now came with effort and then you could see that mid left anterior descending artery has got a very critical calcific stenosis we tried to do imaging to see what exactly was the sort of calcium over there you could see in the first image that the uh, imaging catheter wouldn't go into the lesion so we uh, we did rotablation at 180000 rpm with a 1 1.5 millimeter burr and following that we did an OCT run over there. You could see here in the first image that you uh, it's a napkin ring calcification. It's occupying almost 360 degree arc. And in the second image, you could see that the thickness of calcium is almost one millimeter. And you could also see that the length is more than five millimeters. So we know that this particular patient has got a very high calcium score and you need aggressive debulking. Probably you need to go up with 1.7 fiber and then probably an IVL. We, we resorted for a poor man's, uh, poor man's IVL. So we started with a non we started with a uh, uh, opn balloon and that almost 45 atmospheres we were able to open the lesion you could see at lower pressures it was not giving way and later on we were able to open it up at 45 atmospheres we have also had an oct run following that you could see that there was some amount of distal dissection you could see significant amount of calcium cracks over there multiple fractures were seen and you could also see that this opian balloon had produced an intimal hematoma over there so we had to deploy a long stent over there and finally we were able to achieve a good result in this particular patient also that was a long stent deployed and the final result was gratifying in this particular situation now this was the article that dr chadda also had been talking about today morning the one that was published in jack in 2019 you could see three types of calcium inside the coronaries that can lead on to that can lead on to acute coronary syndrome. The first one, you could see that it's an eruptive calcific nodule. The second one, you have superficial sheet of calcification. And third, third one, it's a protruding nodule. This particular, particular protruding nodule rarely produces acute coronary syndrome. However, the superficial sheet of cal calcium as well as the eruptive cal calcium, the, those are the ones that ultimately leads on to acute coronary syndrome in most of our patients. I just stopped with uh, this particular case alone. This was a uh, patient, elderly gentleman who present with an infuval myocardial infarction, non-balloon dilatable. See that there is significant amount of calcification there. We started with rotablation with an 1.5 five millimeter bar and following that we could achieve a reasonable flow inside the right coronary artery and we decided on imaging for this in imaging this is what we found you could see that this is a superficial sheet of calcification occupying almost 180 degree arc you could also see that it's a thicker and the, the calcification was thin it was thick and you could also see that this is this is a nodular protrusion you call it as a nodular calcification and finally you could also see here that there is eruptive calcification over there which can lead on to acute 
with coronary syndromes. Now, that's that's the that's the sheet of superficial calcium. Now, if you follow this particular video, you would understand that. Uh, you could see here that that particular that particular sheet of calcification it has become a protrusive, protrusive eruptive eruptive calcific nodule that ultimately produced the acute coronary syndrome probably that was the reason for the acute coronary syndrome here again that's the frozen frame of the eruptive nodule over there and the second image shows you that it's a protrusive nodule which is an innocent bystander so these are the new concept that we talk about uh, in um, in calcification and acute coronary syndrome in the recent past so finally we resolved we decided that nothing was done with on point fiber properly so we decided to go ahead with a two millimeter bar two millimeter bar rotablation was done and finally we were able to achieve a good result the flow was um, now and following following the rotablation an oct run was done you could see here that the area where you had the wire bias you have some shaving off of the calcification over there you could again see here that there is a burrow burrow formed with the help of rotablation where you had the wire bias and this was some small dissection following the rotablation and finally with a 4.4 millimeter stent and a 4.5 millimeter post dilatation we were able to achieve a good result so just to highlight the fact that um, imaging would give us would give us a lot of information yeah, right from patients with acute myocardial infarction wherein you might encounter a plaque rupture in almost 70% of situations you would get away with without putting in a stent in almost 25% of situations wherein you have a plaque erosion which can be identified with the help of oct and in around 5% of patients you would encounter some amount of calcification or inside the vessel and in those situations you might have to go ahead with the algorithm based approach probably you might go ahead with the super super high pressure balloons or an idea or there are, there might be situations wherein you might have to go ahead with rotablation thank you so much yeah thank you very much for excellent talk uh, very nice illustration and uh, dr selomani you want to add anything uh deepak uh, as usual uh, excellent uh, uh, talk and then uh, you have highlighted the features of acute coronary syndrome park uh, block morphology predominantly in uh, uh, acs and you have highlighted the inflammatory signs there and uh, probably the intimal thickening that is the thickness that is thin cap atheroma is also one of the important point where if the uh, thickness is less than 60 microns probably is one of uh, uh, a finding usually we see in acute coronary syndrome and if it is somewhere near the plaque where uh, you are going to stent it probably it's better to include that uh, uh, thin cap uh, fibroatheroma that is one uh, uh, important positive finding but otherwise if it is far away i think high dose statins uh, that is what we are going to do now and as usual excellent uh, demonstration and very clear uh, description of oct sir very nice thank you so much uh, let me invite dr akasaka who is a very well known uh, uh, senior interventional cardiologist and he is uh, very well known to all indians particularly those who are familiar with uh, imaging and he has been very instrumental in training many cardiologists in india about the acquisition of the oct image and interpretation and thing he has a very vast experience he published many papers and he is also principal investigator in elimini one reset and he has done many, he has published many papers mainly on calcium modification and various aspects of the Uh, blogs and everything. So, with this brief introduction, I would like to request Dr. Akasaka to join this uh, symposium. Sir, yeah, thank you. Hearty welcome, sir. Very nice to thank see you. Thank you very much. Yeah, very nice to see you. Thank you very much for so your you kind invitation. Your smiling face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate your kind invitation every time, and thank you so much for kind introduction. Thank you. and congratulations the great success of the uh, wonderful uh, program and uh, the, yeah a great meeting as usual dr anand anand rao you want to add any dr anand rao unmute shelender saying dr shelender saying 
Dr. Sh- uh, sir, Shiri Saramata, you can go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Deepak, I was uh, uh, wanting to ask you, suppose uh, you have a young Indian, in fact, uh, now he has been lysed and you are doing an angio on day two and you find most of the lesion is clean uh, and uh, maybe a little bit of thrombus. So normally we would leave these patients alone and not uh, sort of stain them. But now we are also talking of a concept that if there is a plaque erosion and plaque rupture, you differentiate these two. So if you do an OCT on day two itself, I mean, day one is the MI lice, day two is the uh, angio. And if you do an OCT, uh, do you make a decision plaque rupture versus plaque erosion on that day itself? or you would like to keep them on low molecular weight heparin and bring them back uh, uh, five days later and uh, then do an OCT? Yes, many times when the lumen, lumen is fair enough, you wouldn't have to go ahead with a, you wouldn't have to go ahead with a stent implantation. There are many situations where in, initially wherein you label them as having just plaque erosion. When they did OCT later on, they found out that there were plaque under, underneath with, which was obscured by the by the white clot that was sitting over there. So primarily you decide just not based on whether looking looking at whether there is a rupture or not. Probably you need to look at the other characteristics also because primarily this is most commonly seen in young adults who are smokers or in young females, the plaque erosions. So most of them, they tend to have uh, more of a fibrous plaque rather than lipid plaque. That's number one. Number two, they tend to have a much bigger lumen. It's more of a white clot rather than a red clot. So you're looking at all these parameters. You could decide whether you could leave this particular patient alone and bring them back for a restudy. In case if they are doing well, just keep them on medical management because ultimately, ultimately the lesion, it, the vessel, it's just having an intermediate stenosis. You are at that particular point of time, not in a situation to do an FFR also because it's very early during the course of acute coronary syndrome. So FFR may not help us out. So those situations probably looking at all these parameters, we need to take a call on them. Thank you. Yeah, over to you, Salomani. Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready, sir. Yeah, Salamani is well known to everyone. He is from Madurai. So yesterday he showed a very nice, uh, excellent case, uh, wonderful, actually, the importance of FFR and uh, optimization, boom technique, everything. Over to you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, sir, and uh, great meeting. Uh, I hope we have been enjoying for the last three days. And uh, today, uh, I'll be talking on optimization, whether TCA optimization using imaging. I will be concentrating predominantly on max, like what is uh, max is medial dissection, opposition and stent expansion, and of course, uh, geographical miss. These points I'll just try to cover here. Coming to uh, 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 optimization, very, very important uh, thing in a PCI is uh, uh, you should, once you stent a patient, uh, what you should do is you just look at the uh, stent edges first. Like, is there any problem there in the stent edge? Look at the proximal part of the stent. And then you make out whether there is any dissection. Sorry, you can look at the both the cross-section as well as the longitudinal view. And uh, it is very, very helpful to have an angio registration also. And uh, to see that, this is how uh, generally the dissections look. Uh, this is a very superficial, intimal uh, dissection. Most of the time, uh, such type of very small dissections need not be treated. This is just limited to the intima. And what we are more worried is this. This is what we have we called as a medial uh, dissection where the intima is extending into the media. And uh, this is also a scenario where there is a medial dissection and there is an hematoma. So the common practice for this is when there is a significant dissection, especially medial dissection, we go and put a one more stent there. That is a more uh, common practice. Sometimes you can finish it with just balloon dilatation, but usual common practice you have to put a stent there. And uh, this is how uh, the intimal flap looks like on IVAS. And in uh, OCT, it is very clear, but it, OCT picks up a lot of dissections and it clearly describes the type of uh, uh, dissection. And you see a, a clear hematoma here and the intimal flap there in OCT. I was, you need some amount of uh, expertise. You'll have to concentrate there and learn to pick up the uh, uh, dissection seen on IVERSES. 
And what dissections should be treated is if the arc is more than 60, for example, then you will have to look at the cross section. If it is beyond like this, it is going uh, uh, by each there where it is more than 60 degrees, then it is very important. You length, you look at the longitudinal view here. In this, you look at the length of the dissection and you will have to see in this longitudinal view. And if the length is more than three millimeter, if there is significant intramural hematoma compressing the tumor, and if there is an inadequate lumen, that is area less than five, and if the timid flow is lesser, and distal dissection is more important compared to proximal dissection, sometimes we will see dissection intrastent also. Most of the time, intrastent dissection, you need not worry, because the only treatment what we do for dissection is stenting, which already are stented there, and still you see a dissection inside the stent. For those, we can be left like that. And medial dissections are what is very, very important where you should treat. A lot of intimal dissections which you see on OCT need not be treated at all. And uh, this is an example here. This patient has undergone uh, uh, angioplasty stenting. You look at this. It's a very clear uh, uh, dissection in the proximal part of the stent here. Uh, left main and circumflex has been stented. A very clear uh, dissection not extending much into the media. So this type of dissections, it is, if needed, you can be treated because it's there in the left main. And proximal, sometimes if it is covering, see here, uh, when you see this, the dissection is partially covered by the stent. In such a case, probably you can just leave this dissection for observation, but it is really scary. If it is on the left main, you can go ahead and stent it. And this is another stent edge dissection at the distal part of the stent here. You can pick it up even in the longitudinal view there. If there is a small uh, break in the intima, it's a small intimal tear intimal dissection, which generally we need not treat it at all. Look at this case here. This patient has been stented. Post stenting, this is what you're seeing. It's a major dissection. It is almost forming uh, two lumens there, almost like a scad here, uh, false lumen and true lumen and significant uh, uh, dissection. This, this, this dissection need to be stented there. And coming to the next is opposition. Look at this very simple case where uh, we have undergone, we have just done an angioplasty stenting there. And post stenting, there is some doubt here. It looks like a spasm. And uh, we did a OCT here. OCT clearly shows it's a simple lesion, but even in simple lesion, you can pick up so many things there. There is a significant malapposition in the proximal part of the stent there. And uh, it is very, very important. Although studies have shown that uh, malapposition may not be so important as, a, as under expansion, but we have experienced malapposition can give rise to stent uh, thrombosis, uh, especially like uh, subacute and acute stent thrombosis is very common in malapposition where it is a significant malapposition, especially sometimes both under expansion and malapposition will occur together. Uh, the stent might be undersized stent so that there is an under expansion where it is not touching the wall at all. So such type of cases we have seen many in uh, when you do imaging. So in common practices, you will have to address this small opposition. The machine itself automatically shows where there is small opposition. That is the beauty of OCT here. It comes with a red marker. And uh, if the opposition is more than four millimeters, sometimes even more than three millimeter. And when you look at the angio co registration at this spot, it comes as a red mark there. So you measure that uh, uh, small opposition and you take the uh, diameter of the balloon according to the EL there, or probably just less than EL, or at least uh, to the size of the lumen, and then dilate that spot, you automatically oppose this. And commonly, we use semi-compliant balloons in uh, treating malaposition if it is available. But if it is not there, I think adequate size NC also will do. But semi-compliant balloons are better for treating malaposition. And this patient was again uh, dilated there, and then we got an excellent uh, opposition there, and final result is like that. And coming to expansion, this is a very, very important that everybody should give importance. We know that when there is a large vessel, when the vessel branches, the diameter of the vessel comes down. This principle you should remember when you are using a long stent, especially uh, LED, which is uh, very important. So now we have a software. The machine itself shows that uh, uh, there is an under expansion and then it gives what is the percentage of uh, stent expansion is present at that age. But our goal for that is generally today EAC recommends at least 80% compared to the reference diameter.
tent expansion of 80% compared to the reference diameter is acceptable, but ideal will be more than 90% expansion when you compare to the reference diameter. Generally, when there is a, such a long stent, it is a very good practice since I show the diagram. After every branch, the vessel diameter comes down. It becomes smaller. So you divide a long stent into two halves, that is proximal and distal half, and you measure the amount of stent expansion compared to the distal. And the new software in the OCT automatically tells, it divides this uh, stent into two and says, what is the minimal stented area and what is the stent expansion in that area? So this is a, a very new uh, software. In many missions, it may not be available. And uh, once you identify where is this under expansion, what you should do is you measure the EL at that site if possible, or you go to the reference area where uh, you have that and take a NC balloon of that size. For example, in this case, the EL is around uh, 3.5 or something like 3.27. And uh, we should take an NC balloon, which is not more than the EL. Generally, if you do that, you will not have any perforations. You need not be worried at all. Go, don't exceed the EL diameter. Take a balloon there. And angiographically, this is what we do. When this software is not there, this is how we generally see here. And uh, you see here in this tent, the minimal stented area is here. In angio co-registration, this yellow point shows that where is your minimal stented area. When you come to the proximal part here, you see here it automatically shows where is the minimal stented area. So you localize it, you measure the yield there. So you keep a balloon there and you dilate it. So once you do that, it is so simple. You have an excellent stent expansion there and then you get an excellent optimization of your stenting. So this is how we see here and then what we expect is at least more than 90% compared to the reference uh, diameter without any complication. There should not be any dissection, no perforations. And this is very, very important in stent expansion. And as we already discussed about the calcium is one part where you should not be in a hurry at all. So this is a consequence of uh, uh, not pre-treating the calcium properly under expansion. And uh, of course, we have a lot of uh, technique today, but even IVL, I have seen it may not work in a uh, patient where once you stent it, you may not expand even after doing IVL, probably laser. We don't have much experience. If there is some laser, it might be helpful in such cases where uh, we still need to learn. So to avoid this, only solution is prepare it properly. So what you should do is generally, everybody has highlighted what to do in a calcified lesion. And this patient underwent uh, rota, uh, then OPN, and then uh, we have dilated with so many NC balloons. And uh, what you should make sure is, before you take a stent in a calcified lesion, make sure there are some significant fractures and you have attained some good lumen. So at least a lumen of five or above in a big vessel like this in this LAD uh, should be achieved before you take a stent. Otherwise, it is very difficult once you put a stent to, and if you have an under expansion, very difficult to expand it. Very little options are there, and most options may not be working. And it is a good practice. Like once you do uh, all this, uh, when you see the fractures, before taking a stent, try to measure the EL at the reference diameter, even at the middle of the vessel and even in the proximal, so that it helps you uh, to give an idea what is the uh, NC balloon which you are going to take. That is very, very important. So this patient you see here, I have stented this long lesion and the distal part we have dilated and we have 100% stent expansion in the distal segment. And when you come to the proximal segment, although the area is 5.25 and uh, the expansion is only around 50% there, it is area stenosis almost around 43% compared to the proximal segment. So what I have done is I know this, the EL at this in this vessel is around 4.5, but I have dilated with a 4 NC. And uh, in spite of 4 NC, again, our expansion is very less. So taken a 4.5 NC in this LED and achieved this uh, uh, stent expansion, an area of 7. And uh, it is still around, we have not reached the 90% stent expansion, but I generally don't exceed the diameter of the lower EL. Uh, in this vessel, I think this is the maximum what you can get in this case. Severely calcified vessel with an area of 7.9 in the proximal LED should be good. But of course, compared to the reference diameter, it is still lesser.
And in the same case, you look at this uh, uh, distal part here. Is this uh, stenting okay or have we missed a lesion? So when do you say it is a geographical miss? So what happens is if you are planning to stent there, if you use an angio core registration, it gives a very clear localization and placement of your stent. And in this case, what has happened when you have a doubt on the angiogram like this, where we are not sure what is happening at the distal of the stent, we always go there and look at that area, area stenosis there. How generally you do an area stenosis calculation is like this, go to the point there and you like to mark uh, uh, point to point there. And then you get this uh, total uh, area where you go ahead and then uh, uh, we see that once you do this, you get an area stenosis. Uh, what is the percentage of area stenosis here? So when you do this, go select area stenosis and accept it. Automatically, the machine gives you what is the stenosis there. So if you are landing a stent in an area where there is a plug burden less than 50, it is acceptable. If you have an area stenosis at that area, if it is more than 50, probably you will have to put a stent there. Unless it is a diffuse disease where you cannot put a stent there, then in such cases it is acceptable. But otherwise, in most of the cases, if the plug burden is more than 50 at the distal part of the stent, I think you need to put one more stent there so that you get an excellent optimization of this. So look at this uh, angiogram, an example here. And angiographically looks very clear. This patient was uh, stented elsewhere outside and he had a stent thrombosis. They did thrombosection and uh, they did not know what was the reason for the stent thrombosis. So angiograph is very, very clear. But in this here, although you see your angio is very clear here, you cannot make out. There is a significant uh, dissection there. And at the same time, there is an area of mal opposition, significant mal opposition here and the proximal segment. And areas of under expansion, almost only 50% stent expansion here compared to the reference diameter. Probably these are all the reasons why this man had a stent thrombosis, which you could not pick up on an angiogram. It looks normal. So what we did is I had to put a one more stent there and then stented the entire uh, lesion and then balloon dilated uh, the under expanded and mal opposed area and got a good result. So to stent optimization, just remember this image, it is very, very important. Try to land your stent in a plug, which has less than 50% plug. There should not be any lipid. There should not be any dissections, major dissections. That is uh, more, more than 60 degrees. Remedial dissection should be avoided. And there should not be any mal opposition, which is more than 40 millimeters. And there should not be under expansion. Try to achieve an expansion of at least 80 or ideal will be more than 90% of uh, reference diameter. So if you do this, you get an excellent optimization using imaging. And uh, you always remember before optimization, when you do that, angio core registration is very, very good. First, you look at the angiogram. If there is any doubt in the angiogram itself, then you dilate it uh, with a NC balloon, keeping the OEL what you have in that area based on angiogram. And once you are satisfied based on angiogram, then you do post PCI OCT and you try to achieve the minimal stented area there. If it is achieved, then fine. If it is not there, you take a NC balloon of the EL size and expand it at that level. And then in spite of that, uh, probably if, the, you, if you have very diffuse disease and tapering vessels, in such cases, what you can do is accept at least when the MLA is more than 4.5. This, you don't keep this in there. You don't apply it in all cases. You should uh, go to the reference diameter, try to achieve 90%. If that is not possible, at least an MLA of 4.5 is the essential. And then you do a final imaging and then conclude your case. And of course, we have optimization ISR bifurcation. I think it is time there, the time up. It's the just basic optimization of your imaging. And probably this ISR uh, bifurcation calcium we can discuss in some other center. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Salomani. Excellent talk. And uh, in the interest of time, let us move on to the next topic. Uh, Dr. Sampath, welcome. Uh, you can go ahead with your presentation. Thank, thank you, sir. Uh, so in 10 minutes, uh, we can go to cath lab after this talk. Sir. 
Yeah, I'll finish in fa finish fast. And I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. It's going to be more of a theory rather than uh, case presentations. It's about outcomes of OCT guided angioplasty. And uh, we all know that uh, we had a very good case presentation by Dr. Selvamani, who showed a simple case where OCT was very useful. Where, where, where OCT was very useful in optimizing the PCI, and we had many lectures which showed uh, the usage of uh, uh, OCT in uh, optimizing the PCI in very complex situations also. That's why uh, in the ACCHA guideline in 2011, there was no mention about OCT, but it has come up to 2A level in the EA, latest EAC guideline, where uh, OCT is useful in uh, uh, most of the cases uh, at, and the level is 2A. But in the reality, uh, what happens is, uh, the penetrance that the usage of intravascular imaging is very low. And even in advanced countries like USA or uh, Europe, uh, the usage is less than 20%. And in very few centers like uh, countries like Japan and Korea, only the usage is very high up to the level of uh, 85%. Dr. Sambasar, we don't have your slides. Oh, sorry. Just a minute, just a minute. Can we see? I think it's- Yeah, now we have some. Yeah. So the usage of uh, OCT or the intravascular imaging is very low in most of the uh, countries and it's uh, less than 20%. Why is it so? Because people think that uh, it can, all angioplasties or most of the angioplasties can be done without uh, imaging itself. They can probably get away with it. But uh, the most important question in many many uh, cardiologists is that, uh, is there enough evidence that uh, OCT outcomes are better when compared to the angioplasty? So let's see about uh, outcomes. The outcomes can be procedural outcomes and clinical outcomes. Uh, in the Illumian 1 trial, there was a change in the strategy following pre-PCA OCT in 55% of the patients. And uh, in another 25% of the patients, there was uh, another, uh, I mean, change in the strategy after post-PCA. So overall, there was a change of strategy in around two thirds of the patients. And this change in the strategy was mostly related to the stent, uh, choosing the stent. And the stent length became sh longer in around 43% of the patient and shorter in around 25% of the patients. And uh, there was a change in the diameter of the stent in around 40% of the patients. So based on OCT findings, almost 66% of the patients, there was a change in this uh, decision itself. There was a change in the planning of the procedure itself. So, but, oh, over the last few years, what I have been noticing is uh, after getting more and more experience in the OCT, uh, we tend to achieve more MSA and uh, tend to uh, get uh, a better result, more optimized PCA. And then length of the, the stents, stent lengths have become longer in uh, most of the cases nowadays. That's what my observation is. And uh, we tend to choose uh, larger diameter stent also in the most of the cases. And uh, the post dilatation balloons also, the number of balloons and the size of the balloons also have become uh, much larger and uh, longer in most of the cases. That's what I feel nowadays. And uh, also we are developing what's called something like uh, OCT-like uh, naked eye. So even in patients where, where, the, where we are not using imaging in the uh, procedure, PCA procedure, we tend to think like a OCT eye and uh, tend to take uh, uh, larger stents and longer stents. Whether this practice is a better one or it's, it can be dangerous in producing more complications, it's more of a debatable uh, question. And uh, in the Illumian 1 uh, trial, there were 14% uh, malopposition and uh, stent under expansion was seen in uh, around 7 to 8%. And in 27% of the patients, there was additional balloon post dilatation and additional stents were used 
following post PCA. So there was a significant change in the uh, planning, change in the procedure strategy following OCT. And uh, definitely, an naked eye cannot uh, give us full uh, information. And uh, OCT is very useful. In the Illumion 2 trial, also, which compared uh, OCT and IVAS, there was uh, significant incidence of malopposition, tissue prolapse, and stent dis dissection in the OCT arm compared to the IVAS guidance. And that could be corrected uh, by following the OCT procedure. And uh, in that same trial, the stent expansion was almost equal. So the OCT and IVAS were comparable in the aspect of stent expansion. So the, in the doctor's trial, which compared OCT and angio, they compared OCT and angio and they found that following optimal PCA usage of using OCT, there was a significantly improved FFR. So OCT guidance, Guided, uh, guided PTCA, there is definitely a better functional uh, result also. So the FFR was better in OCT arm rather than, uh, I mean, compared to the angio arm. In the Illumion 3 trial, uh, the MSA, which is the most important uh, uh, target uh, following a PCI, MSA was similar between OCT arm and IVAS arm. But when they compared the OCT arm and the angiography guided arm, arm there was definitely a significant improvement in the MSA in the OCT arm compared to the angiography arm. So all these things can lead to uh, better clinical outcomes. Those are summary of imaging out. The OCT guided PCA had equal or larger MSA, better stent expansion, and uh, lower or similar major dissections and major malapposition following the OCT guided PCA. Whether they translated to clinical outcomes. We all know that uh, based on various studies and the meta-analysis of IVAS guided PCI, there is a def definite reduction in the maze, cardiovascular mortality was reduced, incidence of stent thrombosis and incidence of repeat revascularization was reduced when in the IVAS arm compared to the angiography guided PCI. Whether this can be translated, whether this can be extrapolated to the OCT, in the opinion study, this compared the OCT versus IVAS and then tried to see the target vessel failure at around 12 months for, and uh, in around 800 patients. And they found that the in MACE results were comparable, equal. Cardiac death was equal. The target lesion revascularization was equal and stent thrombosis also was equal in OCT as well as the IVAS arm. So it, the OCT and IVAS gave a similar result and uh, based on the meta-analysis of IVAS guided PCI, this can be uh, set to OCT also, and OCT can give the similar benefits which IVAS enjoyed. They, they try to see in various trials comparing OCT versus mm -hmm. angio directly. So in the, in the CLEO PCA trial, they compared OCT and IVAS, I mean OCT and angio, and they found that OCT, there was a definite mortality benefit at around one year follow, and uh, there was definitely a decreased incidence of myocardial infarction also. So there was a definite clinical benefit in the OCT guided PCA compared to the angiography guided PCA. And in another registry, Pan London registry, where there was quite a number of patients, large number of patients analyzed, the incidence of MI was much less in OCT guided PCA compared to the angiography guided PCA. And there was a mortality benefit also, significant mortality benefit also. So these two trials clearly showed that OCT guided PCA produces better clinical outcome also when compared to angio guided PCA. So to conclude, randomized studies like Illumion 2 opinion and Illumion 3 proved that OCT and IVAS are comparable. And so whatever the meta-analysis benefit showing IVAS as a better uh, uh, modality compared to angio-guided PCA, same thing can be extrapolated to OCT also. And OCT also can produce better clinical outcomes, which, which was shown in non-randomized data like Clio PCA project and the Pan London PCA registry. So, there are future studies going on like Occupy study, which show which is comparing OCT and angio. 
on the OCT IVAS study, which compares OCT and IVAS on target with cell revascularization, and the much awaited Willumian 4 trial, which is comparing OCT and angio. Once these trials are results are announced, definitely I think there will be a positive uh, result and the, and the benefit of the OCT guided PCA over angio guided PCA will be very clearly shown, and the usage of uh, OCT will increase and get uh, better outcomes in the co common clinical practice. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sampat. Uh, yeah. Thank you for excellent talk. In the interest of in the interest of time, we'll move on to the last speaker, Dr. Ravi Khan. The topic is image guided complex PCA. How my strategy changed. Uh, Ravi, are you there, Ravi Khan? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, hope I am seen and uh, I am audible as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, good morning, sir, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for this opportunity. And uh, this is a case actually I wanted to especially present because. If there was no OCT, we would have not understood what has happened. So this particular patient is an obese patient who has been uh, having hypo hypothyroidism and hypertension. And uh, he was stented in uh, 2013. Uh, and uh, he was not clear about uh, how many stents are there. Uh, but he is uh, sure that he was uh, uh, stented in one vessel. So with this, uh, uh, he has come to the hospital for uh, exertional dyspnea actually and uh, effort dyspnea and especially post-COVID. So the patient actually thought uh, it is all due to post-COVID and uh, pulmonologist has uh, referred to me because it is disproportionate to the uh, uh, COVID scenario because there is no fibrosis, no residual fibrosis. He's, he recovered fully well. Of course, there is obesity. So with this, we went on to uh, angiography and we could find uh, the there is an instant uh, diffuse uh, Restenosis. So you can see here. So there is a diffuse instant restenosis, and the tightest one being uh, at the uh, mid to distal part, there is a, a tight stenosis. You can see there. So this is what is seen in uh, angiography, and it was uh, appearing quite simple for me. Uh, actually, it, it appears simple and then uh, we thought of uh, uh, going straight uh, with the imaging so that I would understand what is happening. And of course, before this, we had a uh, uh, discussion about whether this is responsible for his uh, effort dyspnea. And most likely we thought because the effort dyspnea was there post-tenting uh, uh, six months it started. So this is what uh, OCT has shown us. And if you look at this point, uh, you can see two layers of stents in, in its uh, maximal stenosis area. If you look at it, there are two layers of stents. One in, so whether it was a overlapping stents or whether it is uh, anything else, that, that was our doubt. Uh, you, you can see here, can, can you freeze there, go back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep it there. So a bit back, a bit back, a bit back. Yeah, you can see two layers of stents there. So we we were in a, a situation where we thought uh, it would be, it would have been an overlap, and and you can clearly see here there is a very uh, fibrotic uh, critical lesion in the same area. And it is concentric and uh, diffuse, actually. It's concentric and, of course, the calcium is minimal. There's no uh, big calcium chunk. But mainly the problem is the neo-intima proliferation with, uh, uh, with a lot of fibrosis. So uh, uh, can you go ahead? So then uh, I had a review of uh, patient details. And uh, they were, they were uh, actually, they got the CD and then I could realize it is only a single stent which was there in the, uh, in the index procedure. So in index procedure, exactly at that point where we find uh, two layers of uh, like an overlap, uh, at that particular point, there was a uh, stenosis post-stenting and they tried with the 
NC balloon and uh, dilated it to uh, full full extent, and they thought uh, angiographically that was the best result. So next slide, please. So this is what uh, fibrosis looks like, of course, and you look at this. This is what the uh, it is seen in OCT. There are two layers of uh, stent struts. So. So with the with, uh, large uh, uh, fibrotic stenosis, critical stenosis. So these two layers, I thought it was an overlap of uh, stents because he said two stents. And then when I checked uh, the previous uh, angiographic CD and angioplasty CD, I could find it is a single stent, which is 3.5 into 36 actual stent size, with, which is Excel, some company Excel. So that was uh, deployed in uh, 2013. So then I realized that this is actually a stent fracture at that point of time, which uh, wherein there was a, a sliding of the segments. So that was actually stent fracture. So pathology, uh, this particular thing would, wouldn't uh, like, uh, it, it cannot be recognized without the OCT. 2013, they didn't do anything. So they thought the, uh, uh, the, they thought the result was good. So we went with uh, pre-dilatation with NC balloon. So I had a, a, a trouble in uh, actually dilating the vessel and especially in the critical part. Next slide. So this is uh, OCT after pre-dilatation. So there is some plaque modification, but still uh, I had actually a problem in the distal part. You can see there, there is still a Residual stenosis. So you can see the area of uh, expansion as well as the diameter stenosis there. Next, next slide, please. So uh, because there is a residual stenosis and actually we were, uh, it was difficult for us to negotiate with the uh, even 3.5 NC uh, balloon, which was actually used. And then uh, I tried with the low profile balloons as well, and we couldn't cross the uh, lesion despite a post dilatation with uh, 3.5 NC. So then I took uh, the back, back please. So I took uh, 3.5 uh, uh, OPNC balloon and uh, dilated this up to 25 atmosphere. So 25 atmosphere slowly, and then uh, we touched 30 atmosphere when in, uh, wherein uh, there was a yielding of the lesion. So at that particular point, so 3.5 uh, OPN NC balloon worked. And there was a hourglass constriction which uh, yielded with this uh, OPNC balloon. Next slide. So after this uh, uh, debulking, uh, sorry, after, after this plot modi modification, we went with uh, the stent, which is 3.5 into 48, the size as suggested by OCT, and uh, deployed at uh, 14 atmosphere. And uh, initially, we had uh, uh, a good uh, result just because of uh, the OPNC balloon, which was there in the shelf, as well the OCT being uh, suggesting this particular uh, modality. And then now you can see. After this uh, deployment, angiographically, it looks good. But then OCT, next slide, please. You can see the OCT. So here, you can see, as uh, Dr. Selvamani was discussing very clearly, the expansion is 68% at the proximal area. Uh, as it was discussed, it is true that uh, the expansion, though APS good here, in the proximal part of the stent, especially in these log stents, this happened. And, uh, the hourglass constriction area is actually well expanded and uh, the minimum stent area is also good, acceptable. But when it comes to the proximal area, here there is a mal apposition and uh, under expansion, both of them. So with EL, uh, EL measurement, uh, I've took a 4O NC balloon. Next slide, please. So with the 4O, uh, we have gone to 10 atmosphere in the proximal part. And then uh, after this, we have uh, repeated the OCT. Next slide. 
and you, you can see now uh, the mall opposition not being there and well opposed as well as well expanded the expansion is uh, 85% so here clearly the whole city has shown us uh, 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 very uh, from beginning to the end one is that we could understand there was a previous tent which was fractured and uh, in fact that is one of the pathologies for contribution of uh, restenosis of course there is a neo intima proliferation as well uh, with fibrotic heart fibrotic lesion and uh, above that 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 is one which was identified and then choice of the balloon uh, which was because of that uh, fibrotic uh, lesion we went for opn uh, nc balloon and uh, which made us uh, uh, confident that we could uh, negotiate the stent easily and then after that uh, though the angiographic uh, picture appears uh, fine there is a mala position and uh, under expansion at the proximal edge of the stent and which was also tackled and the final result you can see next slide please so this is um, uh, what i learned from this case imaging guided angioplasty would always make the operator comfortable and confident and patient perspective of course there the short term and long term outcomes would be optimal and in this particular case imaging would have uh, actually picked up the pathology at the index procedure which was not done which is of course at that time it would be a learning curve and then uh, now uh, the clock modification uh, and the precise uh, stent implantation was possible because of imaging thank you thank you ravikant uh, you have nicely demonstrated uh, stent fracture and how the oct helped in optimizing so in the interest of time we are running behind the schedule so let us move on to the live case transmission from apollo the operator dr pc rath pc rath is a very senior uh, consultant cardiologist and uh, we are all familiar with him and uh, uh, i would like to request uh, dr akasaka dr hirama sir and uh, balbir to chair this session and uh, dr anandrav is there i think uh, he is yes. moderate is a senior cardiologist uh, from mumbai uh, dr anandrav you can take over and you can yeah. moderate this session And yes. sir, we have a two uh, live trans one live transmission, one live in box. Rajshekar, yeah. uh, he's from uh, uh, Yashoda, so um, uh, Sikharabad. Actually, his case is uh, uh, they told that slightly unstable. They finished the case, uh, they recorded it. That case we are going to show it as a live in box. The first case is a live case transmission. We'll go to the Apollo. Uh, in between. in between we can uh, add these lectures also dr akasha ka lecture just yes, during live transmission we'll give a break and we'll go to the dr akasha ka lecture and uh, balbir and uh, at the end we can show again uh, the remaining um, uh, remaining portion of the live transmission hello uh, good afternoon uh, this is dr anand rao dr uh, yeah, good, good afternoon dr anand rao uh, rat uh, good afternoon uh, very good to see you uh, yeah, join i'm joined by dr akashaka dr uh, balbir singh and uh, dr hiramat so please go ahead sir introduce your case and uh, let's see what you're showing uh, i have kept a very interesting case for you with me dr manoj agrawal my colleague and dr um, kiran and dr kiran will present the case dr kiran can you just uh, slide some Can you put the slides on? Tell them. Uh, okay, you just. Uh, Is a PowerPoint on on your screen? Can you yes, see the presentation? Okay, fine. Yes, we can see the presentation. Please go ahead. Introduce the case, please. <sighs> So this is a 22-year-old gentleman. He was evaluated for persistently elevated blood pressure. He was in fact on five anti-hypertensive drugs. Found to have a left renal artery stenosis on a CT ultrasound and referred for further management. So this was done around 10 10 days ago. Uh
basically there are two polar arteries upper and lower polar arteries as you have seen in the previous slide the left upper polar artery had a very critical stenosis at the osteoproximal segment almost 90 95% the right renal angiogram was essentially normal so we went ahead and did a renal angioplasty uh, we first ballooned it with a coronary balloon 3 5 into 12 and then we positioned the 6 into 18 uh, renal stent and uh, that was the index procedure around 10 years, 10 days ago which was essentially fine after which we put some down on to two anti hypertensive drugs with a bp of around 140 by 80 at that time we also done a coronary angiogram this is a left selective coronary angiogram in the iliocaudal view as you see there is a small ectatic segment in the proximal lcx with an eccentric uh, disease and uh, the next one is and the led is a relatively small caliber vessel with a long segment stenosis from the proximal to the mid segment with multiple tandem lesions and this is the right coronary artery which is most interesting there is a proximal to mid long segment uh, disease with significant uh, and what is making it more interest complicated is the multiple bends that rc is taking in its course so essentially the diabetic and got an intermediate syntax score of around 27 the ma major challenge is being the calcific long lesion in RCA with multiple bends and a long LED lesion with small size body. So we had initially planned an FFR guided intervention to the serve, a PCI to LED and debulking and PCI to the RCA. So. Uh, yeah. 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 Fine. Uh, go ahead. Uh, See the angio and the LCX, there is in the brain, there is a borderline lesion of 60 to 70 percent. So, first, we wanted to evaluate that lesion whether it needs any interventions or not. We did a FFR, FFR was one, and uh, even no drop. And then we gave uh, adenosine also, there is no drop. But look at this uh, lesion, it looks significant in this view. And we did the OCT, area stenosis were around 30 percent. and. Uh, just uh, show the OCT. Can you show the OCT, please? So, so this is around 40%, isn't it? 47%. So, we decided not to do anything for this. LED, of course, we'll do it later, but the tightest lesion, the rice, right? RC, can you show the RC? Uh, RCA first we took a Jodkins, but it was difficult, it's not giving su 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 support. So we changed to extra backup, and uh, then we crossed uh, the wear, and, but the balloon was not going. Uh, 1.5 was not going. The bend that was the main, in that bend it was not going. So we took a guide liner. Look at the guide liner. With the guide liner also, balloon was not going down. And here we inflated the guide liner and pushed the guide liner, we inflated the balloon and pushed the guide liner, just see. And yeah, after that we could put the, dilated the proximal and mid part of the RCA with one, two millimeter, 1.5 and then two millimeter. Then this is the end result. After that we are trying to um, dilated with the NC balloon, two millimeter, but the balloon was not going. We are stuck there. So it was a very long calcified lesion with a bend and uh, uh, with a long proximal part was straight also. It was very difficult to cross the balloon. With, with the support of guide liner, we could cross the lesion and dilated with two millimeter NC balloon. And uh, we are going to proceed further. We are stuck with this. And uh, you can give your opinion about this. Uh, Dr. Hiramat, uh, Dr. Sorry, Dr. Rath. Yeah. Uh, this is Amplat's uh, guiding catheter, seven French, if I'm not wrong. The six French. Six French, okay, six okay. French extra, right extra backup. If you see there's a severe tortuosity in the proximal segment, there's an yes. acute bend over there, which probably yes. is hampering uh, the situation. So uh, any ideas about uh, going uh, up front uh, rota on this uh, patient, you know. We are concerned because of the uh, bend. Look at the bend. We are really concerned about using a rota because of this bend. 
So and other point, uh, other point is uh, if you can uh, put in a, a guideliner and uh, through the guideliner, if you can rotablate at least the mid segment we, with we the 1.25 bar, you can. Uh, yeah, we have put a guideliner with a uh, guideliner. We are able to put the balloon and prepare the bed with a. Uh, Non-compliant uh, balloon. We are trying to take it now and see how we can prepare this. Because I am really concerned about uh, uh, this using a rota with the bend, and uh, I think we'll try to first prepare the bed and see if we can avoid the rota, or else in the end I have to go for the rota. Did you dilate the proximal segment uh, right after the origin where you see before the bend? Did you dilate that area? That area we dilated, but there is no disease there, so. In the mm -hmm. bend, we just dilated with a low pressure with balloon, and uh, but that is, that is not the main problem. Is because of the uh, uh, bend, the balloon yeah. is not going. Even uh, it's difficult to put the guide liner with the help of inflated balloon. We are able to take it forward, and we'll try again. Yeah. In the Can same try with the like a grand slam wire, like a buddy wire grand slam. Maybe that will. Straighten up the vessel a bit uh, so that your equipment can go in and out. Maybe okay. you can use a grand slam and. Uh, we will try that next. We'll try that. This is the where we are using is a uh, no no sign. This whisper. This is the whisper we are using. We can uh, use a more strong where we'll see. So you go on. I mean, uh, because we are not able to dilate, I don't think any OCT catheter will go inside it Correct. now. Correct. So first we have to prepare the balloon. Prepare the bed, and uh, then um, we'll see if we can put stains. And after that, we'll do the OCT. That's the plan. Right, and as I told you, L6, we are not going to do anything. We have done FFR and OCT. It looks like uh, uh, not very critical lesion, not significant. LED angiographically is a small vessel. There's a critical lesion in the uh, mid LED, which is more than 90%. That we will address in the end. Dr. Akasaka, what, is, uh, what would your approach be in this uh, case, sir? We want to hear from you. Uh, right. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's a very difficult case, tough case, right? So there are some bends. So uh, as he said, uh, there are some risk of uh, yes, uh, complication if you use a low tablator, right? Yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, it is important to dilate the distal portion, right? So. Uh, how about the uh, small size scoring balloon or, uh, yeah, uh, I'm not sure uh, do you have the cutting balloon, right? Yeah, we the have it, but, uh, you know, the uh, regular balloon is not going. It's very difficult for us to put the cutting balloon and scoring balloon. So if I, I can but what the, size, the bed a little more, I can consider using one of those uh, cutting devices, balloon. Okay, okay, right. So mm -hmm. it is tough to pre put the balloon also. That two millimeter balloon we could dilate, put it once, but NC balloon is not going. We'll try to prepare the bed a little more and then we'll see what we can do. So the, the size of balloon is two millimeter, right? Yes, yes. 1.5 yeah, we so, started first and then two. I see. So 1.5, uh, that, that passed, right? No. Yeah. 1.5 we so, did it first and then the Increase to two with the two and uh, non compliant uh, no compliant balloon. We tried first. So the, the another way is uh, as uh, the doctor Raos said, uh, the the body wire system might be uh, some yes, helpful. Yes, body right? wear, so, Yes, we'll yeah. try that. We'll, yeah. we'll try now that body wear, and maybe we'll change the wear. We'll see. I personally feel uh, you should use a stronger wire because whisper will not give. In this bend, whisper will not give that kind of support. Maybe you can, if you're scared to put it, probably you can put a micro catheter down, exchange it to Grand Slam. We'll, and we'll, we'll, do, we'll do that now. Yes, sir. Let me yes, try sir. to put the balloon little. If it doesn't go, then I'll try exchange the wear. And yes, then we have this, what is this wear? Grand Slam will, uh, with the micro catheter will change it. Dr. PC Russell. Yeah. Shall we go to live in box case? Yeah. Meanwhile? Yeah, you can go and in the meantime, I'll try to finish it. Dr. Anandrao, Dr. Yes. Rashekar, welcome. I think Dr. Rashekar is ready. We'll go with yes. the live inbox. Then yes. after that, we'll go okay. back to Dr. Doctor. Good afternoon, Dr. Rashekar. Uh, can you uh, introduce your case? Uh, I'm joined by Dr. Akasaka, and Dr. Uh, Balbir Singh, and Dr. Hiramat, and Dr. Kasturi. 
Go ahead and introduce uh, your case, please. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Sridhar, for this opportunity. Actually, this is supposed to be a live case, but we had some scheduling issues, and so I had to do this case a couple of days earlier, and I recorded it for the benefit of this particular thing. And uh, uh, I'll straight away start on with the video. Uh, sir, we are not getting the voice from the video, sir. Sir, you need to share audio from the video, sir. While sharing, there will be an option to share audio. Uh, I beg your pardon? While sharing the screen, you will see an option on the bottom of the window on the share screen, share audio. Then the audio on the video will be uh, audible, sir. Oh, one second, let me just... See. Can you unshare and share once again, sir? Yeah, I will do that. Yeah, I'm sharing screen. Yes, sir. Now on the bottom of the uh, sharing screen, you will uh, see an option called share audio, sir. No, I don't have that. I'm not getting that. On the bottom of the window, sir, is a small uh, option, share audio checkbox. No, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not getting that. I don't have that here on my, la on my laptop. No, sir. On the, uh, like when you click on the share screen, it opens a dialog box, sir. On the dialog box, on the bottom of the window, on the status bar of that particular box, you will find an option called share video, share audio. It's just saying share, share computer side. Okay, okay, okay. Right, right. Yeah. I got yes, it. Right. Sorry for that. I'm a little technical glitch. Yeah. No, this is, I'm doing it the first time. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Dr. Sridhar, for this opportunity of uh, doing a live case uh, in your beautiful conference. Uh, I'm Dr. Rajshekar from uh, Yashoda Hospital uh, at the Sikandrabad Unit Cat Lab. Along with me is uh, Dr. Kiran Teja, my colleague, cardiologist, international cardiologist. Sister Anuji uh, is the scrub nurse, and Sister Jyoti is the circulating nurse, and Chiranjeevi. He's a chief cat lab technician. And I also have Anjan Elu, a uh, cat lab technician with me. Uh, Dr. Kiran will tell you briefly about the patient uh, characteristics. Hello everyone, uh, we have a 58 year old male uh, who has come to us with uh, class 3 angina. There was no RWMA on the echo. The LV function was uh, quite normal. The symptoms were so significant that we had to go ahead with an angio. So as soon as we did the angio through the uh, right radial, uh, we found that uh, the left main was normal. There was a total occlusion CTO which is filling through homo uh, at, uh, at the OM. And then, uh, and then we have a long segment disease in the mid uh, LED with a 99% occlusion in the diagonal 2. And then there is a discrete lesion in the RCA uh, of about 80% in the mid RCA. So how do we go about The syntax score, I forgot to tell the syntax score comes to around uh, 16 in this patient and syntax 2 says that both CABG and PCA have a mortality rate of only 3%. So how do we go about sir? So we discussed uh, both options with the patient because the syntax score is not very high and uh, uh, the lesions are not very complex uh, and we were uh, reasonably confident of giving him a good result with the multi-vessel PCCA. Uh, so we did, uh, we did give both the options to the patient and the patient was very keen not to have a surgery and because of the other parameters and the uh, syntax score being 16, uh, we thought that uh, PTCA was a reasonable option. Uh, the one challenge uh, that I foresee in this case is, uh, of course, there's a CTO in the obtuse marginal. I think it's a doable CTO. I do uh, detect a faint anti-grade track. Uh, there's a near total occlusion of a major diagonal. Uh, that too should not be a problem. The only challenge that I foresee in this case is that the LED has a long segment diffuse disease starting from the origin of the diagonal. 
So in a situation such as this, there are two or three uh, questions that I need to answer. One is which is the landing zone, especially the distal landing zone for this tent in the LED for this patient. And number two, what is the optimal tent size for this patient? So there's a significant disparity in the size of the proximal healthy segment of the LED and the distal healthy segment of the LED. So how do we circumvent this problem? I think it is in this kind of a situation uh, is a coronary imaging of paramount importance. Either a intravascular ultrasound imaging or even better is an OCT imaging would give us very critical information on deciding both these questions. One is where to land the stent distally. Second is what is the size of the stent that we could opt for. So, so the plan is to do a PCI. Uh, I engaged uh, the left uh, uh, coronary with uh, EBU uh, 3.5 EBU launcher 3.5 7 French guiding catheter. Uh, I have taken 7 French guiding catheter because uh, I have one total occlusion and one near total occlusion and I do and I thought that it will give me better support. And I did through a radial axis. I have a expandable 6x7 thermo sheep, a long sheep that easily went through the right uh, radial artery through which I could pass a 7 French guiding without any difficulty or any discomfort to the patient. So I wired uh, both the LED and diagonal to start with. Can you see the... Okay. So, so, so I wired both the LED and diagonal and, and I did a dilatation to the near total occlusion in the diagonal with a 1.5 millimeter balloon. It was a very tight lesion. A 2 millimeter balloon wasn't negotiating the lesion, so I dilated with a 1.5 millimeter balloon. I followed this up with a 2 millimeter dilatation. So then there is a reasonable result in the diagonal, and uh, and then at this point of time, I decided before I go any further with the intervention in the LAD, let me fix the CTO in the OM. The reason is because there's a large collateral from the LED which is filling the OM. So it is a tip injection from uh, a microcatheter uh, uh, which is almost close to the uh, total occlusion in the OM. And I can see a faint anti-grade track. So I chose a uh, wire C plus. So I chose a fielder XTR as uh, my guide wire because I see a nice integrated um, micro channel. I thought Field XTR would be the best wire. So the lesion is uh, crossed fairly easily. However, the micro catheter was not going beyond the total occlusion, so I dilated the total occlusion with a 1 millimeter balloon. And uh, after dilatation, I could pass the micro catheter down and I exchanged the Field XTR with uh, a run-through floppy wire. And after that I completed, I went ahead and uh, completed the intervention in the OM. And you know the final result in the OM. Yeah, this is a long stent, there's a 32 millimeter, there's a 2 into 32 millimeter long stent. And I post dilated with a 2.5 millimeter and uh, so can you see the final line? Okay, the final shoot, uh, the OM looks like an excellent result. And uh, because it's a small vessel and it's too distal, I didn't opt to one OCT imaging in this particular vessel. So now coming to the to the LED. So I tried passing an OCT catheter uh, in the LED. So but I couldn't. I tried passing an OCT catheter into the LED, but I couldn't. Uh, so obviously it's a very critical lesion, very tight lesion, plus some tortuosity in the proximal part of the lesion, so I pre-dilated the 2 millimeter balloon. Still I couldn't pass the OCD catheter. So I pre-dilated with the 2.5 into 12 non-compliant balloon uh, for the major portion of the lesion, and especially in the proximal segment, after which I could pass the OCD. Can you show the OCD run? So can everybody see the OCT images on their screen? Is it clear? Can you have a big picture, please? 
for the OCD. Yeah. They have a big picture for the OCD. So the distal reference diameter is barely two millimeters. If, if you it may be a two two point two five max. Yeah. So from the EL to EL, it looks like it's a two millimeter uh, bezel. So go ahead. So these are the OCD pictures. Has everybody seen the OCD images? Uh, the difference uh, reference uh, the distal reference diameter appears to be small. I think if you take from EL to EL, I'm getting a maximum of two millimeters, not more than that. And then uh, as we go through, we see that there are multiple dissections because of our pre dilatation. And also there are, uh, we can see calcium at several spots. So not concentric, uh, not more than 270 degrees, but there's significant calcium all through the vessel. And uh, and the, yeah, there's all the multiple dissections that we created. And you can also see the islands of calcium. It's not a continuous ring of calcium, but there are uh, blotches of calcium all around. At some places they are present in, on both sides uh, of the medium, uh, but it's not a continuous ring of calcium. So, and there are some disruptions that we have caused because of our balloon dilatation. And the proximal reference vessel uh, uh, looks healthy. There is some disease in the proximal most part of the LED, but it is not significant. So the proximal reference is about uh, 2.6, 2.75. So this still is barely two millimeters. So at this point of time, I would like the opinion of the experts on the panel, uh, Dr. Kasaka, anybody who can just tell us what they feel about the OCT images and what they think would be the right strategy in this patient, uh, in this patient, henceforth. Yeah, I will stop here and then I will uh, invite the discussion on uh, what should be the further course of action in this patient. Yeah. Uh, was there a, a healthy segment where the plaque burden was was lower, where you could land a stent? Did you find any area over there when you said it was two millimeter distal vessel? Yeah, distally, yes, I did find a healthy segment. Uh, the vessel dia was small. It's about between two and two point one millimeter, uh, uh, but uh, yes, it was reasonably relatively healthy, and proximally yes, proximal to the diagonal also, there was a healthy segment. There's a lot of uh, calcium uh, in the in the area as you described it very well. Mm -hmm. It was blotches of calcium, but at one point it was more than one eighty degree arc calcium also. If you, if you I thought it was not a continuous arc, yes, but it was there over a 180 degree yes. uh, extent, but it was not a continuous arc. And, and there were some disruptions with the balloon, that uh, that high pressure balloon dilatation that I did. Are you planning to use a rotablator, but the point is, what is the, what is the burr size you'll use? Because exactly. I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure what, uh, uh, because one, your two millimeters is a landing zone over there. So maybe you can do half rotablator, half of the vessel with the calcium appears to be more towards the diagonal, not more in the distal segment. Dr. Akasaka, what is your uh, input uh, on this case? Yeah, uh, I'm not uh, clearly remember, but uh, there are lots of calcium uh, also on full oil. We can identify the calcium, but uh, OCT demonstrate uh, there are uh, yeah, lots of calcium, but uh, uh, not uh, most of them are less than uh, 150 degree, right? Only distal to diagonal, I can identify the, the very yeah, uh, significant calcification more than uh, 270 degree, nearly circular, right? At that uh, site, uh, it might be better to aberrate. Uh, otherwise, we cannot get an, any uh, good uh, yes, expansion of the stent. And also, uh, proximal site reference is uh, nearly 2.23 and distal is uh, uh, EEL is uh, 2.25, right? So uh, and the length is 42. Therefore, if I treat uh, the, the patient after ablation, uh, succeed to ablation, I try to dilate uh, the, the severe calcified region again with a little bit bigger balloon. Uh, 
2.5 or a scoring balloon or a cutting balloon at the site of the severe calcified region and then uh, select a 2.5 long stand gently put to avoid the distal dissection and then uh, dilate the proximal. That is the, 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 uh, yes, uh, the, the, the way to treat at the moment. Uh, I'm not sure that, that it, uh, the, the true condition in the, uh, the distal portion of the calcium. So my, my, my explanation is correct. Uh, the distal to the diagonal, I could find a, a nearly a circular calcium deposition. Yes. That's what I was telling, you know, maybe we can uh, ablate that particular area, uh, proximal and uh, uh, after the after the diagonal, distal part, I think balloon dilatation, uh, I think combination of an MC balloon in the distal and a rota in the proximal segment at the level of diagonal, I think that, that's what I thought it would be my strategy. Yeah, I agree. I think, uh, I think Dr. Raksaka's observations are, are, I think, very pertinent. And uh, these are the same thoughts that did, did actually go through our mind as well. But I got a luminaria of more than three in the proximal area, proximal part near the diagonal. So because I got a reasonable luminaria uh, in a reasonably, in a relatively small vessel, I decided that I would uh, uh, I would uh, just go ahead with a non-compliant balloon. I took a non-compliant balloon. Uh, and went at high pressures, uh, went to took a 2.5 and went up to pressures of up to 20. And then... Dr. Rashid, one more point is, if you look at the calcium location also, it was not very superficial, you know, many areas it was, it was not that superficial, so probably could get away with a scoring balloon or cutting balloon or NC balloon also. Yes, yes. So we'll finish the case and then we'll have further discussion. So because of the huge disparity, because of the huge disparity in the size of the vessel, uh, distally and proximally, I decided that instead of going with a 2.5 40 x stent, I would go with a, instead of going with a single long stent, I would go with two stents, using a 2.25 into 23 millimeter stent distally, followed by a 2.5. Uh, or 2.75 into 23 approximately. So I tried to pass this tent, but uh, but I couldn't pass this tent because there was considerable resistance at that at that point. So I decided to use a guide liner, and with the guide liner I could push down a 23 millimeter uh, uh, 23 into 2.25 uh, Zions expedition and. Uh, so it looks like we need another two point another twenty three millimeters stent proximally. So this is another twenty three mm two point five. Two point five. The two point five uh, into twenty three millimeter Zines expedition overlapping with the distal stent, which is deployed at fourteen atmospheres. Angiography it it looks okay. Uh, but of course, uh, we need to optimize the result. I had to get to get up get the wire from the diagonal out because I had to use a guide liner. There is no other option. Uh, then I've done the pot, the proximal pot, with a 2.75 into 8 millimeter balloon. And after doing pot, I recrossed the diagonal and parked the wire distally. At this point of time, I did a OCT imaging. So and this is how the OCT pictures look like. The distal edge looks clear uh, with no distal dissection. And the stents is, uh, show appears to be reasonably well expanded at most places. There are small areas of malaposition throughout the length of the stent, but it looks more or less well expanded uh, for distally, as well as proximally. Uh, but of course, there's some more work uh, that needs to be done on, on the stent. The diagonal mouth looks reasonably well open, and there's proximally, there's, uh, there's clean, there's no edge dissection. Next, I decided to do a tap technique uh, to stand the uh, diagonal. And uh, stand boost te technique is very useful, and uh, especially when you do a tap technique to know precisely uh, where we are deploying the stand. So this is uh, how the, uh, the diagonal has been stented, and the balloon has been pulled back, and a tap has been done. 
and, and, and balloon has been pulled the balloon has been pulled back and uh, kissing balloon dilatation has been done and subsequently i had to work uh, on the the distal stented segment i dilated the entire stent and that distal segment with a 2.5 mm trial balloon uh, at pressures of uh, 16 to 18 and again i did a proximal tap with uh, proximal then i again i did a proximal part with a 2.75 into 8 balloon then i repeated the oct imaging so this is the final oct picture shows a very well expanded distal segment and uh, as well as uh, the overlap zone and, and the diagonal uh, ostium is also widely open so on the whole it looks like an excellent result and uh, so i open the case for discussion Balbir Singh has joined us. Yeah, we got a good expansion of the stent, and then there was a good opposition of the stent, and uh, there was uh, no significant dissection at the proximal or the distal edge. And uh, so, even at the proximal part uh, where there was calcium, I think the stent was quite well expanded. I got an MLA of nearly 5.6 uh, square millimeters. So, so, I can have some discussion on this. I think uh, it was a wonderful. and looks so, so and uh, even the city is also uh, dr balbir singh since you have joined us uh, uh, did you go through the case what are you, what is your uh, thought process uh, well i didn't see the case i just joined in so i am not be able to um, okay. Uh, okay. tell you but i think the proximal part uh, is bigger than uh, 2.5 uh, stent for sure you know the when you don't see a el very clearly that is the time for confusion. So in me, I last I saw the last pictures of the OCT, just proximal to the stent. Uh, I think the vessel is at least three, at least three. That is my opinion, but I have not seen the case fully, so I am not sure. But he did go with the 2.75 balloon. He went at higher pressures over there. So, so I am not happy with that. I yeah, want no. more expansion. Yeah, no. Okay. But I think OCT pictures uh, confirmed a good... Uh, uh, Dr. Rashekar, what is your comment on that? Uh, yeah, I thought it was 2.75. I went up to the high pressure of 218. I think I was happy with the result. 2.75 will come up to almost 2.95. 2.95, yes. yes, yes. Yeah. Dr. Akasaka, your comments? Yeah. I think... Uh, yeah, thank you very, yeah, thank you very much. It's a wonderful case. Yeah, right. And... Uh, uh, yes, uh, if you succeed to make a clock at the site of the uh, calcium, you can put a stent and a good, get an, a good uh, uh, expansion. Therefore, it is very important to confirm the, 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 the clock or the, the, yes, uh, the calcium site. J just uh, distal side, uh, you already have a lots of clock or, or uh, the dissection, small dissection at the site of uh, calcium uh, and uh, only I'm just concerned about the, the proximal site just distal to the uh, the diagonal but you clearly succeed to, to dilate there yes yes uh, we congratulations yeah, we will move on to the keynote congratulations, congratulations dr ashikar wonderful thank demonstration you. thank you thank you uh, if we can go to the other lab uh, dr rath uh, we are we have come back to you sir Dr. Rath, can you hear us? No, we can't hear you. Uh, okay, they are muted, so they need to unmute themselves. They have to unmute. Uh, like, you ask someone to unmute that one. Yeah. I have, I have told you, I have told you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So what we did, we uh, tried to put the stain, it didn't go. So what we did is we took a microcatheter and uh, exchange the wear with a grand slam with. And uh, totally that is giving more support. But then we, st uh, you can see the, the can you see the, uh, so the angio, there's a really big. Uh, uh, so can you ask them, can you ask them to put the angio on a big screen, yeah, sir? We are, we yes, are not sir. able to see. 
You can you see the angio now? Microcatheter going. But put it on a big screen, sir. It is coming as a side small screen. Yeah, can you put in the big yeah. screen? Yeah, yeah, now I got it. Yes, fine. Okay. So yeah. microcatheter is going. And we exchange it with Grand Slam where and we trapped that uh, with a balloon trapped it and uh, put out the microcatheter and see the vein now. See. It's become more pronounced maybe because of this uh, stiff wear. Yeah. So what we're trying to do is take a balloon inside, inflate it and trying to put the, um, uh, the support catheter deep in that we are uh, using a guide liner. Dr. Rath, this is an excellent uh, case where you could use a halfway rotablation. In fact, this is a situation where a halfway rotablation will really help you. And then they allow you to I'm pass really, As I told you very clearly, the bend, I'm concerned. Yeah, exactly. Why, Why we do a heart failure? Or else the end of the bend. It is not the uh, calcium which is obstructing, it's the bend which is obstructing the. Yeah. So the, this is the balloon, is it? I'll go beyond in the middle part of the RC, I'll keep it, inflate it, and try to put the guide layer inside, deep inside, and see. If you can, where is it? Uh, that's uh, inflate little, but then let me see. Yes, I'm able to put the guide line little deep in. Yes. Huh? Huh. Now, put the balloon. This is the balloon. Okay. Yeah. Deflate, deflate, yeah. Uh, just one minute. He's deflating, I'm pushing the guide line so that it'll, yeah. Yeah, deflate and mm, deflate, deflate. You can see it gone little in, I think, yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, take it out. You will go deep in again. Okay, I'll try to put it a little more inside, guide liner. I'll put the balloon. It's a little more uh, then okay deflate 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 no I don't think I can put it further down yeah, I think, keep a half balloon inside the guide liner half balloon outside yeah. inflate while deflating you push it yeah that that's we did it now it is uh, balloon half inside the guide liner balloon inside the guide yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Slightly pull. Yeah, inflate. Yeah. Then deflate and push it. Deflate, deflate. No, I don't think it's go yeah. further down. I think we can try yeah. in this position. I think we can go prepare the balloon a little more. Huh. Huh. Check it. I'm losing the support of the guy. Support you are losing, I think. Test. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Test little. Let's see. I just want to see if we have crossed that uh, bend. Yeah, I think we have crossed that bend. We can try now. So I dilate it. I put the balloon and dilate it further. See the pressure. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. No, no, no need to pull, sir. You just pull no, the no, no, no. Pull the guide. Push the guide catheter and pull the guide. Advance the guide the guide catheter. Uh, uh, no, no. This is yes. You saw the you know. Advance the guide line. A guide catheter. And pull the guide liner. Uh, yeah, pull the guide liner. Lightly pull out. Okay, fine. Pull out the wear. Pull pull out the balloon. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. 
Okay, fine. Give the uh, we can go directly with strength, or if we want to do by balloon. Uh, uh, what balloon, sir? That one. That was two, twelve. Uh, can you try and open and see uh, whether it will cross or not? If you are able to cross with the open and see. I think we'll take one more balloon and dilate. Just inject. Just inject. Yeah, I think uh, two point five balloon you can try, sir. Two point five followed by open and see. So, Another. I think we can try and. Uh, Otherwise, IVL is there. You can try IVL also. Hmm. That uh, uh, give a huh? stand. A lot, a lot more work needs to be done on the vessel. I think. Don't go with the separation. Get a balloon again. Balloon, balloon. 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 Get a balloon and then two point five. Yeah. Two point five better. Uh, yeah. Take a short two point five tour balloon yeah. in the mid segment and go higher. Two point five. That'll be very safe. And instead of NC, take Tajuna. That is sleek. Yeah. That will uh, that will go two point five. Instead of NC, go with two point five Tajuna. That can track it easily. Tajuna, we are taking. Let's see. We are giving the Tajuna two point five short. Twelve, eight or twelve. Twelve should be fine. Ten. I think it will be ten. Cross. Twelve comfortable. Yeah, ten, ten also fine. Ten also is fine. It should cross. Just keep your watch on the Okay, no, no, it. You dilate it here. Okay, okay. I dilate it here. Yeah. We're at 12. Deflate. Yeah, yeah. Dilate it here. Yeah, there you go. Okay, Stand ready. Good. Deflate. Dilate the tip also, dilate, sir. Dilate, dilate it here. Deflate. Yeah, dilate, dilate, dilate. It's sixteen. Deflate. Deflate. Okay, fine. <clears throat> take the yeah, take it out. Give the stent. What stent you have? Give it two point five. Uh, Twelve is there. Yeah. Uh, uh, or uh, is to uh, metronic you give it? Hmm? Hmm? Onyx. Rather, would you want to do an imaging at this point? Yeah. We are taking a 2.512. I think they have uh, in that uh, uh, Onyx only. Would you like to do an imaging study at this point? <laughs> Not maybe now. The, I want to just maybe, fix the uh, stent and maybe, then, maybe the maybe the patient is slightly unstable. So the, yeah. Okay. 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 I think it's okay holding. We can uh, fix the stent and then in the end I'll do imaging to see the optimization. The challenge is to put the stent down here because of the bend. And I don't think there's much calcium because I am able to dilate it well with the balloon, but it's just not going to crossing the bend. That bend only causing problem, I think. Give it quickly. What do you have now? No, 12 will take it and then I was. Uh... You won't have, want to take a longer stand, sir? 12? I mean, you want to use two stands? I, I, I think it will be difficult. Long stand will be difficult. Okay, okay. okay. I think, you're, you're, I think you're a better judge over there. Yeah, first I put the sure, 12, sir. I'll sure, see, sir. and then I'll be able to put, I think, one more bigger stand first. I'll give it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Fifteen. Eh? What is that? Give it. Fifteen. Hey. Eh? Look. Fifteen. Look. Take that fifteen. Let's see. But based upon the balloon behavior, I think stent can track well because it's uh, opening well distally. Oh, next. Uh, 12. Take that to 15. Give it. We don't have uh, 12. We have only 15. 
So we are taking 15 onyx, 2.5 to 15 onyx. Do it quickly. This. Uh, Hmm. Sir, uh, shall we go ahead with the lecture and uh, shall I come back again? No, you can go ahead and I'm just trying to put it, just see for a minute and then you go ahead. Yeah, after the sent, then we'll go. Yeah, good. Nicely moving. Oh, he oh, stopped yeah. there. I, I think we can put a stent here because that will give us yeah, the... That also gives better support. Yeah, that is also a better idea, sir. Through stent again. Uh, just uh, we'll see if we can go a little further or else we'll put deploy the stent here and then this is the... Uh, tougher or it may make it more simpler, I don't know. But uh, good the so, I think uh, Sridhar, you can go ahead with the lecture. I'll try to put yes. yeah, yes. And then so one, more, one last session is uh, 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 two point five or Syro is. Uh, 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 60 microns, uh, maybe that can track well, you know, in this. Uh, no, I think, uh, sir, that bend has to be dilated adequately. We have missed that bend. So that is causing problem. Otherwise, uh, save over that 2.5 balloon, track deeply. And uh, I think now it will track with 2.5 balloon. It's, it's moving a little bit. Sir, I think I'll it. dilate it here and I'll put the stent here and then I'll try. Yeah, that is also the true stent we can go. Yeah. That also good strategy. Okay. Sir, we'll go to the. I'll just do the. Yeah, I think that will straighten the things. 16. Okay. Deflate. Wait, wait, wait. Let me see if I can put the balloon down. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, balloon, I can put it down, dilate it further. Uh, wait, yeah, dilate it further. Okay, deflate. Here, 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 you dilate again. Yeah, Dr. Anandrao. Yes, sir. We'll go ahead with the lecture, Dr. Akasaka. Sure. See the, see the, uh, just yeah. do it yeah, and yeah. then you go ahead. Let's see one shoot. Let's see one shoot and then. Okay, now yeah, I look think so, look so, look so, look so, nice. there, yeah. uh, you can go ahead with the lecture. I'll try to fix the yes. other and take your seat. Yeah, you can put one more. Take it out. Sure, Dr. Rath, I think it was a fantastic demonstration. Will come and, uh, excellent case, a very complex case. Really. And, and, and most important thing is, uh, it's congratulations because you've taken such a uh, tough case to show it as a live demonstration. That takes a lot of courage and experience. I didn't know that it will turn out to be that tough. Mm -hmm. I thought it will just give the uh, next uh, stent, is just give injection. And again, we'll come back to you, sir. The, yeah. Meanwhile, we'll go. Give a... Uh, 18, uh, 15 or 18? 18. 18. We'll come back to you after 15-20 uh, minutes later. The, Dr. Anandra, you can moderate the session and uh, the uh, I would request Dr. Akasaka to present the topic is uh, Imaging Assessment of Calcium During PCA. Uh, choosing Plot Modification Strategies. Sir, you can go ahead with the presentation, Dr. Akasaka. Over to okay. you. Okay. Right. Can you see my slide? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, the, today's my topic is imaging assessment of calcium during PCI, uh, choosing plot modification strategies. Yeah, right. So thank you very much uh, for all your kind invitation. It is my really great honor and pleasure uh, to join uh, this meeting. Yes, this is my disclosure slide. As you know, there are lots of uh, modality to identify the calcium, right? Uh, Fluoro angio uh, uh, is, is, is a common, but uh, we can identify calcium by C CT 
and intravascular imaging, IBUS or OCT, we can identify the calcium. But uh, compared with IBUS, uh, OCT can evaluate the position of the distribution uh, of uh, the and the, uh, the thickness of the calcium uh, clearly as shown in the right hand panel, right? So it is very important to know the, the thickness of the calcium when you treat uh, the, uh, the patient with uh, aberration, right? So this is the, uh, the uh, data from uh, Dr. Maehara in CRF. She compared the OCT and the IBUS. Uh, uh, there are advantages and uh, disadvantages in uh, each modalities. But for the PCI, the, the severe calcification, uh, we can identify the clearly OCT more than the IBUS. So the OCT may have the advantage to identify the calcium, as I told you. But uh, in reality, IBUS is much more sensitive compared with OCT because uh, the uh, lower penetration of OCT and uh, the, the signal attenuation uh, by the, the lipid. Uh, so uh, if the calcium is just behind the lipid, OCT cannot identify, right? But there, that is the reason why the IBUS is much more sensitive, but angio, is very uh, uh, poor sensitive as I uh, uh, yeah, demonstrated here. So and in geography, a visible calcium seems to be a marker to predict the stent under expansion. And as you may know, uh, in uh, 13 of IBUS detected calcium, calcium was either not visible or underestimated by OCT, mostly due to superficial calcium attenuation by the lipid and the, the lower penetration of the image, as I told you. But uh, the, the, if you have uh, the severe calcium shown in red color, compared with no severe calcification, the, the, the clinical result is very poor, as I shown in this slide. So the, the target vessel MI or uh, uh, TVL is uh, very high in the severe calcified region uh, compared with no uh, calcified region. And this is another data showing the patient with severe calcification uh, had the significantly worse outcome compared to those without. So green color is severe calcification and black color is the, the non or mild calcification. So the, the calcium the position is actually the, the problem uh, in our clinical practice. Um, if you tr even uh, if you try to use the stent or pass the stent through the calcium, there are some uh, the, uh, damage of uh, the surface as shown in this slide. So the, the polymer damage may occur and that may cause uh, a poor prognosis as well, right? So let's move on the uh, case. Uh, this patient had a, a colon cancer and surgeon referred to this, uh, this patient to our uh, department to evaluate angina before uh, the colon cancer operation. Uh, you can identify the severe calcification by fluoro and also the angio, right? Here is the severe calcification and we cannot pass any uh, PCI device and imaging device Therefore, we did uh, the rotabrator with a 1.5 millimeter bar, as shown in the right hand side. Uh, yes. And then this is an OCT after, uh, yes, uh, 1.5 millimeter bar. You can identify some dissection in the distal portion, and uh, you can identify uh, the ablation in the, the circular calcium in the proximal side. Then we, uh, uh, yes. Uh, size up to uh, uh, two millimeter as shown in this slide. So uh, this is uh, the, the yeah, uh, OCT image just after one point bar. Uh, you can identify the ablation, uh, and, uh, but lumen area is not enough. Therefore, we uh, upsize uh, the bar up to a uh, 2.0 and lumen area improved a little bit compared with uh, the previous condition, but uh, there are uh, no calcium at this point. So much more uh, bar size up may have the disc to perforate in this portion and the patient have to have a colon cancer operation. Therefore, we did a drug coated balloon uh, here, the gentry uh, without 
uh, the, the distal dissection. And then uh, the uh, patient had the operation and the prognosis is very good after operation. There are no uh, attack uh, of the, uh, the uh, uh, angina. And this is another case, 70 years uh, male. Uh, the patient had uh, the operation previously and patient uh, now uh, have an hemodialysis. That is the reason why it, uh, there are some symptoms after, uh, long after operation, right? Uh, this is angio. You can identify the, uh, the severe calcium from the proximal to the, the distal part of the uh, light RCA. And in this view, uh, we cannot identify the severe uh, stenosis, but uh, this view, you can identify the calcium. And here is the very tight stenosis, the severe heavily calcified uh, region from proximal to the, the distal, right? And we did IBAS first. We can identify the calcium, but uh, the, because of the, the signal attenuation, we cannot identify any uh, thickness of the, uh, the, the calcium. Then we move to the, the OCT. You can identify the calcium, and here you can identify circular calcium, a lot of calcium deposition. Then we uh, did, uh, this is a yes, pre uh, TCI uh, OCT. Uh, here is a calcified nodule and circular calcium in the, the mid to proximal site. Then we did an uh, yes, 1.75 uh, bar uh, abrasion, right? And this is an uh, after abrasion OCT. You can identify some abrasion uh, here as well, and, uh, the somewhere uh, yes, in the proximal site here also. And uh, you can confirm the abrasion site by OCT, and then the thickness of calcium is less than 500 micron. Therefore, we did the high pressure ballooning to make a crack at the, the calcium site from distal to the proximal using uh, a, a, a three millimeter uh, non-compliant balloon, right? And then we confirm the, the calcium crack from distal to the proximal site. There are several cracks. Right then, uh, uh, yes, uh, the, the site of the uh, uh, crack of the calcium is less than 500 micron. Then we put a stand, but somewhere uh, we can identify it uh, uh, under expansion and also the, uh, the incomplete position in the proximal site. So, uh, longitudinal calcium deposition sometimes get an a uh, good opposition. Therefore, we try to use in the short balloon, uh, non-compliant balloon to get much more uh, good opposition. Then after then, we could get a good opposition and uh, the acceptable result in this uh, difficult case. So based on our data, the best cutoff to make a clock is nearly 500 micron. But uh, as shown in the left-hand side, mean uh, calcium thickness of the, uh, the clock is 450 and the distribution is 300 to 650. Therefore, sometimes uh, difficult to use in a uh, single cutoff value, but around 500 micron, uh, you can try a uh, uh, yes, high pressure ballooning using a non compliant balloon, cutting balloon, scoring balloon, anyway, to make a crack. And if you succeed to make an, a crack calcium fracture, you can obtain the much better minimum stent area and much better stent expansion. And then uh, the binary distenosis is significantly lower and uh, the TLR also is significantly lower compared with the case without any calcium fracture. So if you cannot identify the calcium fracture, you may have the risk of under expansion at the severely calcified region. At that time, you try to use another way to make a crack. So recently, you have a shock wave, so you try the shock wave at that time. We do not have enough experience of the shock wave because still under approval examination in Japan, so it is not clinically available. So uh, this is another data from our uh, colleague. Uh, they use a scoring balloon and also make a crack uh, clearly as shown in this slide. And uh, the best cutoff of the, as, uh, making a crack is around 500 microns, similar to our result. Uh, therefore, uh, 500 microns 
is uh, one of those uh, indicators to make a clock. And here is another uh, the, the report, right? If you even if you have a circular calcium, if it is very thin, you can make a clock and uh, the, get a good stem expansion. And if you have a very thick calcium, but it is uh, eccentric, you can obtain a good stem area because uh, stem expansion is the opposite side to the, the uh, thick calcium. But you have to pay attention to the, the opposite side of the thick calcium because if they are a very normal uh, vessel, uh, if you dilate a much bigger balloon or higher pressure, you may have the risk of the perforation because stent never expand to the, uh, the thick calcium. And if you have a thick, very uh, uh, more than 100 calcium, and if you dilate uh, using stent, that you can expect uh, as a stent expansion like this. And if you dilate more uh, using a bigger button, higher pressure, you may have the risk of the rupture in this portion, in this case. Therefore, it is very important to uh, make sure that the calcium uh, the position and uh, the distribution and the thickness and to make an ablation and get a good result. And actually, it, the eccentric calcium is the big problem uh, because this is an LAD and diagonal. And just after the, the branch, we can identify the very thick calcium more than uh, one millimeter, right? If you dilate here using uh, a, a stent, uh, Kalina shift may occur and uh, they, uh, you will have the trouble of the, the diagonal branch orifice. Therefore, uh, we have to treat it here. But if you use uh, the, the rotablator, uh, rotablator may yes, attach to the, the opposite side. And uh, how to treat this? Uh, it is very important to know the site of the, the uh, calcium. Here is a myocardial site, and this portion is epicardial site. So during a, uh, the pullback, uh, uh, the wire bias can be used uh, using uh, orbiter. Orbiter uh, rotate uh, the round shape, right? So uh, if the wire is here, you may have a chance to operate here during pullback. If you push in, the wire move to the, the outside, therefore there's some risk of the, uh, the, the perforation if you use uh, the orbiter atelectomy. Here, so we try to check uh, the using a low speed, right? And then uh, check the OCT and the possibility of the operation. After confirming the, the possibility, uh, you try to use a high pressure uh, orbit uh, rotation during pullback. It is very important. Uh, this is a result. This is fully a, a, a ab abrasion, right? Uh, after a uh, low speed, you can identify the abrasion here, right? Then we did a high speed abrasion during pullback. So you can uh, identify very wonderful abrasion at the deep calcium and the thickness calcium is less than 500 micron. Therefore, we did uh, the balloon dilatation and we can succeed to make a crack here and then put a stand. And this is a final angle, right? So we can get a uh, good result. So as you may know, as a Dr. Fujino CRF, they make a scoring system, the maximum calcium angle more than uh, uh, 180 degrees, they put up two point and the calcium thickness more than 500 or micron one point and length more than five millimeter one point and they divided uh, the calcium condition uh, zero to four. And if the score is more uh, four, compared with uh, the less than three, the result is very poor. Therefore, anyway, if uh, the score is uh, uh, four, uh, you think about the aberration uh, or how to make uh, the clock at the calcium site. Uh, there are some recommendations. I, I try to uh, demonstrate the two recommendations. This is uh, the one of the, the recommendation. Anyway, uh, you have to make a scoring system uh, right here. And if the balloon crossable, you can use uh, the shock wave if you want, but uh, balloon uncrossable, uh, you try to uh, ablate anyway, rotablator or orbital atelectomy. And anyway, uh, and uh, after then uh, you try to make a crack and confirming in the, the calcium fracture or crack, right? You can use a stent. 
and a good uh, uh, will get a good result. And deep calcium or uh, the, uh, the score is less than three, you can use a non-compliant balloon, scoring balloon, cutting balloon and get a, a calcium fracture, you can use uh, the stunt. Right, this is another expansion, very similar anyway. The balloon crossability is, is the first uh, or uh, image crossability, right? If uh, it is difficult to cross any kind of uh, treating device or imaging device, uh, try to use uh, the, the rotabrator or orbital atelectomy, and then uh, you try to get an optimal balloon expansion anyway, right? And uh, if uh, the score, uh, if you pass the imaging device, and you can check the score. And if uh, the, uh, there are deep calcium, you can use uh, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, yes shock wave. And anyway, uh, they expect uh, the, the optimal balloon expansion to make uh, uh, the clock of the calcium plate. And then, uh, yes, very thick concentric calcium, you can easily use in the rotabulator, but eccentric calcium, uh, you try to use an orbital atelectomy, but you try to check the, the wire bias uh, by using uh, uh, imaging. It is very important to avoid uh, the, the complication. And uh, as I told you, we do not have an enough experience of shockwave, but shockwave may have a chance to make a crack as shown in this slide, but I do not know uh, the, in detail about the eccentric plug uh, effectiveness, right? So. Uh, we have to uh, have uh, much more experience. And there are lots of uh, people that are uh, also at the ongoing trial and some of them are focused on the severe uh, calcified region. We have to wait the final result. There are some uh, initial uh, data using a shockwave in circulation or uh, some other uh, journal, but uh, we do have a uh, much more experience. So this is my take home message. Uh, there are a lot of message, right? A rotabulator with small bar size would be recommended if any imaging device or a PCI device could not pass, uh, could not be passed through the tight region. And OCT may allow us to demonstrate uh, clearly the position distribution and thickness of calcium. So the, uh, during, uh, the, the, uh, among the, uh, the uh, imaging device, OCT may have advantage at the moment, I think. Uh, region modification and uh, the site and degree of ablation can be clearly observed after uh, ablation using a telectomy by OCT clearly. And the step-by-step -step change in bar size or uh, rotation speed would be recommended uh, for operating calcium safely. A calcium plate fracture can be made by high pressure ballooning with non-compliant balloon scoring balloon or a cutting balloon if the thickness of it becomes uh, less than uh, 500 micron and enough stent expansion and less instant listenos, good uh, clinical prognosis could be expected if calcium plate fracture can be obtained after high pressure ballooning following step-by-step -step calcium ablation by a telectomy. Thank you very much for your uh, kind attention. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for a wonderful talk. So we have one more talk. After that, we'll have a discussion. Uh, Dr. Balbir Singh, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Sir, once you finish the, your talk, then we will have a discussion. You can go ahead with uh, your talk, sir. This is the last talk, but which is very, very important for uh, doctors who wants to do the uh, OCT, mainly how to acquire the ideal images. The optimal images, uh, tips and tricks by Dr. Balbir Singh. Over to you, sir. So, <clears throat> so how best to use OCT is uh, most important. You know, OCT is not just putting in a catheter. And uh, from Dr. Akasaka's talk, you can realize that OCT is needed at each step before the procedure, before even we enter with the balloon, once you have done the balloon, once you have made the bed, and then stent and after stent. So it's not something that can be done very easily or uh, 
or should not be done properly. It takes time. Don't do any guesswork. Go to the console. Satisfy yourself. Only then go to the next step. So it requires some patience for sure, but it improves the results. So first is let's discuss about OCT algorithm. Then I will show you one case and then we um, go on to the discussion. So pre-PCI images help you to look at the morphology, look at the length and the diameter. Now let me tell you, when the region is quite tight, uh, the distal part of the diameter may look small. And when you open it to the balloon, the diameter may be expand. So this uh, strategy of looking at the OCT again after a balloon dilatation is not bad because it also tells you how well is the bed prepared to handle the stent and gives you a better idea of the uh, diameter. So uh, you have a pre-OCT image, you have another OCT image during the procedure before you stent, and then a post-PCI OCT image that is the best way to strategize your case. I love to do it this way because it gets to add the most valuable information. So we realize morphology, length, and diameter. We look at uh, dissections, position, and expansion post stent. Let's look at how we look at the morphology. So Dr. Akasaka clearly pointed out the three important things about calcium, the degree, the thickness, and the length. He highlighted the use of non-compliant balloons, IVL, scoring balloons, etherectomy, which could be rotational or orbital. Selecting the landing zones also is important, as we saw in the live cases today, which uh, clearly help you to decide where you want to land. So I am always happy if I can get an EEL visualization. Because otherwise, you know, if you don't get EEL, the lumen diameter, which we resort to many times, may not be the right diameter for that vessel. Um, it has to be precise to the stent length. Diameter, choose EEL. Uh, di lumen diameter, if EEL is not visible. Diameter should be rounded up to the EEL diameter. There has been a lot of debate on this, whether it should be exactly like EEL or 0.25 less. More or less, many of us just put it 0.25 less than the EEL. And then go to the balloon size, which is up to the EEL, so that we don't get a distal dissection. Choosing the post dilatation balloon, you would be sure that it will be both distal and proximal, which will lead to different balloons in most of the times. And just in dissections are very important, must be seen very carefully. Pro proximal dissection are very important to be tackled. Apposition, gross malapposition, longer than three millimeter in length and more than 0.3 from the wall are significant areas. Uh, dilate with a semi-compliant balloon at low pressures to correct malapposition. Expansion, most optimal is more than 90%, but uh, getting more than 90% may not be possible in majority of patients. More than 80 is acceptable, but try to get it more than 90% optimally. With the newer software in the, the machine, you can get these figures quite easily written on the, on the top. So let's look at, we're talking about, um, the morphology. So let's look at calcium. In the right panel, this panel, you can see the calcium all around, telling you that you have to think of a different strategy in this patient. In this patient, you see a fibrotic plaque, uh, mainly lipid, lipid and fibrous rich. You hardly see any calcium. You can see the EEL on this part of the vessel up to this point, and then there's a plaque. Then you see the EEL up there. So if you have to estimate the vessel size on the basis of lumen, you can be so wrong, so very wrong. You have an eccentric vessel, EL to EL is very large. You can see from head to head. And if you start estimating the lumen diameter, you could be really wrong in this kind of a vessel. So you have a plaque here. So be careful when you determine the size of the vessel, when you have a plaque. You don't want to land a stent clearly in this. This is a lipid-rich plaque, even though the MLA hair may not be so bad. But it's clearly lipid-rich plaque. You cannot end your stent here. And this is a high calcium, and you need uh, something else. Now, this, you get two views, a transverse view and longitudinal view. This is the longitudinal view. This is the transverse view. 
Put your calipers all along this transverse view to realize where you see the EL best. For example, here is the normal vessel. You see a minor plaque here, but the EL, if you want to determine the vessel size, you put the cursor here to here on this view, and you see the EL here and probably here, and you curse, put the cursor here. And you would clearly know from this diagram itself that if you put the cursor from here to here, and you take the lumen diameter, lumen diameter will be far lower than the EL. Uh, rough guide is that you, if you take the lumen diameter, you add 0.25, but in this case, it could be anything between 0.5 and 0.6, uh, more than the lumen diameter. So this is the limitation of lumen diameter. Here you see in the proximal portion, there is calcium here. You don't see the EL so well, so you will have to rely on the lumen diameter to guide you to the therapy. In the same patient, you see measuring the EL uh, to EL on the distal measurement and lumen lumen in the proximal part. And rounding, rounding up to a quarter size higher for the lumen to lumen and maybe a quarter size down for the distal from EL to EL. So that's how we measure the stent. We uh, address dissections, we address gross malabsorptions. To have a co-registration lab is quite useful. Uh, this is a co-registered image. It outlines the stent. It gives you the markers from where you have tested and gives you where you place the cursor. It gives the marker on the angio film as well. Now, there's a distal dissection. Now, you can see in the transfer section, it starts here, ends up to this point. So this is the dissection. You look in the transverse uh, plane, you see it is extending into the media. So, and it is uh, almost one quadrant, three to six o'clock, it's extending. So this is a, a section which cannot be left. So you have to treat it. So you have to place another stent distally to this because distal dissections are even more important. And on angio registration, you get these arrows. It tells you this is the point where we are observing. So this cursor is pointing out to the cursor here. On co-registration, you can then go on to place your stent according to the landmark that you got on OCT. This is a stent which is grossly malopposed. You see, it, this is the lumen wall, and um, uh, this is the stent. Unfortunately, on angiography, it's impossible to tell whether it is malopposition or not because the contrast is, goes through the stent and to the sides of the stent. The problems of malopposition are long-term problems when this part of the stents get endothelized or a wire which, we are, which may be used later on or during the procedure may go through the side of the stents. So these are two major problems of malopposition. There is some controversy about thrombosis and malopposition. I'm not going to address that. But this kind of malopposition has to be corrected. Longer than 3 millimeter, more than 0.3 from the wall. Uh, expansion, as I said, is one of the very important points uh, in a procedure. You know, there's uh, hardly any patient where I think I just deployed the stent and uh, did not have to do a post malnutrition. There's hardly any patient I remember. Uh, getting to 90% is difficult, but you do achieve in some patients and trying hard is never a bad idea. So in some patients, we got expansion, say like 78%. We went with the same balloon, but a little prolonged high pressure inflation got the stent expansion to 85, 90. So, Try all tricks, but try to get to the expansion. You would only get good results if you use OCT to this kind of uh, perfection. Otherwise, uh, you may still end up uh, getting not so good results. So doing all this is very, very important. So selecting landing zone, looking at the morphology, measuring vessel diameter, as we already mentioned, uh, position, expansion are very important points. Let's look at this patient and see how well we used OCT. This is a patient who has a right coronary artery, a lot of calcium. You can see clearly a lot of calcium on angiographically, diabetic, previous stent in LCX and LED were patent, and normal creatinine and uh, EGFR. Uh, we took a, a 2.5 balloon, and you can see the stent is not, this balloon is not well expanded. The OCT cap that was then introduced after dilating this. And this is the morphology that we get. This is the running image. You can see you can see the degree of calcium all around the arc. You see the calcium, the thickness. It's a very thick calcium, 
and you see that some disruption by the 2.5 millimeter balloon, but sheets of calcium as you go progressively proximal, lot of calcium. But you get a lot of information from this uh, sketch. You get to know the length of the lesion. You get to see the normal vessel. So this normal vessel with EL tells me that this is the landing zone. It can clearly calculate for me what diameter of the stent I'm going to use. This is the calcium, a 360 degree arc. This is thick sheets of calcium all along, very thick calcium and the proximal zone, which is normal. So we know the proximal landing zone and the distal landing zone. We know the length of the stent, we know the length of the calcium, and uh, I will not allude to this. Uh, Dr. Akasaka has just discussed this. So all this done, we now look at the length. So this length clearly, I uh, was 54 millimeter, needing two stents for clear. We took an IVL balloon. We just heard the lecture and clearly showing us that this kind of calcium will not yield to a balloon or a non-compliant balloon. So we took an IVL, 3.5 millimeter balloon, as was decided by the OCT, put in two stents. You can see the expansion at two points is not so good after the stent deployment. We went ahead uh, as decided by the OCT, with a 3.5 and a 4 balloon, 4 proximally, 3.5 display, to get this angiographic result. And um, uh, this is the OCT-based uh, image. So the area display was 9.0, and we run this image. And uh, most of the areas were in that range. At one point, it was 5.86. And I tried expanding this with a four millimeter balloon. This is the best I could, uh, could achieve. So you can see, despite all the best that we could do, uh, we got uh, a little under expanded stent at this portion. You can see this portion is not where what we wanted. But this I did with a four millimeter balloon with the IVL, yet we achieve that. But we know angiographically, you see it looks perfect, but OCT wise, we know there was one point which was uh, kind of a, a problem. We tried to expand further, but couldn't go uh, beyond 5.86, what was left behind. So I thank all of you for being there, and I try to be as simple and as brief as possible. Thank you. Our wonderful talk, sir. Uh, as usual, you have shown very beautiful images and illustrated very nicely. And uh, we'll move on to the live case. They wanted to show the final uh, uh, images. And after that, we'll come back for a discussion. Uh, Ravi, are they ready, the Apollo group? Uh, we are in cat lab, sir. Cat lab need to unmute. I think yeah. they can hear this. You just, uh, one of you inform them to unmute. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing it. Yeah. Hello, Caesar. can you hear me? Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, yes, we sir. finished the case. I'll just show you first. I think we left from, uh, we del delivered the first tent, uh, Metronic, yes, and we left you there. If you see distally, there was a dissection also. So we took a 2.5, uh, 15, Ostero. Onyx. Onyx first, we put it. And then to cover the distal part, we took a 2.5, 18 uh, Oscido. This is the Onyx tent, I think. Onyx. Then next one. Next one, just, uh, just so the, yeah, this is the Oscido 2.5, 18. I didn't want to take bigger one because there's, uh, I was thinking I'm passing through a stent. There's a little difficulty, but then we could, uh, uh, deliver the stent in the distal part of the lesion and cover it totally. And middle part is left. So we decided to cover the middle part with 2.5 uh, 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 giants. So he had uh, stents of all the three companies, Metronic, Abbots, and uh, this uh, Biotronic. So see the result and so the angiography result. That is the end result. And uh, we did the OCT, just saw the OCT. It was difficult to pass the OCT catheter. We changed the guide wear because uh, we had a 
uh, uh, initial guide where was that uh, Grand Slam. So we changed it to BMW. And with that also there was difficulty. The uh, OCT catheter was coming out. So we pushed, ultimately pushed both wear and uh, uh, OCT catheter. You can see this OCT catheter flipping out. So in the end, we put the OCT and wear together. And then after that, we could put the OCT catheter down. And so the OCT is the result. Uh, you know, this is uh, OCT didn't so much calcium after the stain, only one specule calcium was there. And uh, so the OCT now, before. Uh, 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 OCT showed in the proximal part, it's a stain is expanded well in all the parts, except proximally. Uh, there was one area where it is not uh, expanded well. We can show it at the red uh, spot. You show it to Yeah, that is the point. It is not well opposed, it's not well expanded there. So in that, uh, we decided to take a three millimeter uh, balloon, three millimeter, three and uh, eight, and uh, dilated again there. And the end result was very nice, just so the end result. That is the angiographic result, end result, and the OCT result, can you just show the... That's the result you can see. The well stent is well opposed, and the angiography also result was very good. So we are going ahead and do the doing the LED later, but now for the uh, year right was uh, done very nicely. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, really, a very complex case. Uh, you showed and highlighted many things, uh, particularly how to cross the difficult to cross lesions. And it's a classic example of difficult to cross, like a, even amplage backup, guideliner backup, even wires one by one, inch bomb technique, everything you showed, you highlighted many things. And finally, you acquired the OCT imaging and the OCT for optimization, not only doing the procedure, optimization is very crucial. That's what also you highlighted. The pragmal stent was not expanded well, malo question was there, that was also correct, right? Thank you very much for showing a very interesting academic case, sir. Uh, thank you, Shridhar. Uh, thank really you, Shridhar. And uh, for giving us the chance to do this case from your life. Thank you. Thank you, Shridhar. Congratulations, congratulations to the entire team of Apollo. And thank you very much, sir. Hello. Sir, you want to say something, Dr. Akasaka and Balbir Singh? Unmute, sir, Dr. Akasaka. Uh, yes. Uh, How are you, sir? Yeah, hello, how are you? Yeah, congratulations, the good Thank results, you. right? Anyway, yeah, very tough case you did, right? Thank you. Thank so, you. Uh, yeah, uh, but anyway, you making a, a crack at the, the calcium side and uh, you put the stent, and the expansion is very good. There are, yeah, lots of discussion about the, the result, but uh, under expansion and malar position is, is the, the most important cause of the. the Poor prognosis. Therefore, uh, final uh, imaging uh, gives you a wonderful uh, optimization result, right? So, anyway, congratulations on the results. Thank you. Thank Dr. you. Balbir Singh, Dr. Balbir Singh, you can say a final few words. Yeah, so it, a very nice. Congratulations, Dr. Rath, for uh, producing such a beautiful result. But we come to the same conclusion that. Uh, we, uh, what Dr. Dr. Akasaka presented, that getting a crack in the calcium is really crucial. And uh, how you do it doesn't matter. It, you did it with an NC balloon. You could have done it with an IVL, rota. But creating that crack uh, is so important, not only for the stent delivery, but also for the stent expansion. Uh, thank you, Balbir. But we, in the end, we checked the calcium. Not much of calcium, only one specule calcium was there. So basically, it was not an undilatable lesion. It was difficult to cross because of the uh, tortuosity. Yeah. So uh, when you did the angioplasty stent, uh, after the, when you did it, we saw only in small area there is specula of calcium. Otherwise, it was free of calcium. Thank you very much, Dr. Balbi. Thanks. Bye. Ravi, Over to you, sir.
Yeah, yeah. We are off camera. Uh, now we will have a discussion about the Dr. Akasaka uh, presentation, mainly calcium. Uh, Dr. Balbir Singh, you can open the... Yeah, Dr. Akasaka, sometimes, you know, we look at this criteria, which is based out of a very small study of more than five millimeter uh, thickness uh, and um, the arc of calcium. But, you know, some, sometimes what happens is that we think that uh, three out of the three criteria have been met. And sometimes the non-compliant balloon is able to open it. Uh, not necessarily that rota would be required or IVL would be required for every patient. So how do we decide? So sometimes you put in a non-compliant balloon and it expands, it breaks the calcium. And you, you feel, oh, I could do it, even though the lesion had a lot of calcium. So what is the best guide to do that? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. So a very wonderful yes question and important question. As I told you in my presentation, actually the best cutoff to predict the making a crack is 500 micron. However, the distribution of the making crack is uh, nearly 400 micron to the 600 micron. So it might be very difficult to clearly predict uh, the, the, the making a crack. But anyway. Uh, yeah, because, uh, and also the, the calcium is not a very a, a simple condition, right? There are some uh, yes, necrotic core and so, sometimes uh, very complex is, uh, histology. Therefore, uh, we have to have an, another important index to speculate is, is making a crack. But anyway, at the moment, uh, 500 micron is one of the, uh, the, the, the uh, index to make a crack. So anyway, if the calcium is less than 500 micron, or anyway, if you try to use a high high pressure ballooning, and if you cannot make a crack uh, at the side of the thick uh, calcium portion, nearly circular condition, right? At that time, you try to use an ablation. Uh, yeah. Uh, again, uh, you can use any kind of uh, strategies, a non-compliant balloon, cutting balloon, squaring balloon. And if you succeed at uh, uh, making a crack, uh, you can put a stand anyway. So um, that is uh, the, the, my oh. experience at the moment, yes. So is there a comparative trial looking at uh, cutting or a scoring balloon versus rota versus IVL? and deciding on the thickness of the calcium, length of the calcium, because only then we can be get, getting the answer. What is the best strategy? Like one may choose an IVL and get the same result. Another may choose a rota ablator, get the same result. Another may choose a, a scoring balloon, get, get the same result on a, on a similar lesion. There are one report about the comparison between a rota ablator and the other uh, yeah, cutting balloon or a scoring balloon uh, or a non-compliant balloon, right? But the final result is there are no, no uh, difference between the, the rota uh, use uh, case and uh, the, the balloon use case, but uh, the, the, the final success case is a little bit different. Therefore, we do have a much more experience how to treat uh, the calcium. So uh, in India, you have uh, lots of uh, complex cases with calcium. So you can try uh, yeah, uh, with a big number, right? So uh, could you teach us, <laughs> right? <laughs> Finally. Dr. Rashikar, you can open the discussion. Dr. Rashikar, unmute. Dr. Rashikar? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, unmute. Yeah. I think it's an excellent point uh, uh, that uh, to ensure a fracture of the calcium before we contemplate uh, delivering a stent. And in this situation, uh, my own personal belief is, that, belief is that if the calcium is significant, if the score is high, I think the threshold to opt for rotablation for those of us who are actually well-versed with the technology, the threshold should be a little lesser. And I think we should uh, uh, we should try and uh, use a rotablator earlier than later uh, because uh, instead of creating dissections and then making it too more difficult to use a rotablator, I think the threshold should be a little lesser. So, Dr. Akasaka, what is your personal experience uh, about the IVL usage for uh, deep calcium, mainly in ISR, that uh, uh, major chunk of calcium behind stent cells? I wanted your opinion about that 
Yeah, we do not have an enough case of an IVL, right? So I, I'm not sure, but the, uh, yeah, yeah. Jonathan Hill, he has a lot of experience, I think. So uh, they will make uh, some data. But at the moment, uh, if the, 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 there are uh, very in circular calcium, uh, the, yes, uh, shockwave works very well, but in a deep eccentric thick calcium, we cannot expect any effect, I think. So, and uh, as I, I told you, I, I demonstrated one case, superficial thick calcium, eccentric calcium is also the uh, big issue in uh, the, our clinical experience, because if we put the stent simply, the stent dilated to the, the opposite side of the thick calcium, and the opposite side is completely normal. You may have the risk of uh, perforation if you use a bigger balloon, higher pressure. Uh, there are some uh, yes, case in aluminum four or uh, some uh, yes, perforation case based on the, 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 the strategies uh, because they have to get a 90% uh, expansion, right? So, uh, how to treat the eccentric plug is very important as well uh, to the, the diffuse uh, yeah, severe calcification. So uh, I always use uh, check as, as a wire bias. And uh, if the wire is very close to the thick calcium, you can use uh, the uh, abrasion, right? A low tablator or uh, orbital system. But the, uh, Recently, we tried to use an uh, yes, uh, orbital system to treat uh, the, the very eccentric thick calcium. But, uh, uh, so the, the, the position of the calcium uh, is very important, uh, the epicardial site or a myocardial site. Uh, so if, if the, uh, the calcium is myocardial site, you are in pullback. Uh, so if you try to uh, get an image, uh, at that time, you try to uh, pull back a wire a little bit and then uh, get an image and then check the, the wire bias. And uh, the, 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 yes, uh, the well, calcium is uh, lo uh, located in the myocardial site. Uh, you can use an orbiter during the uh, wire pullback condition and pullback way, right? At that time, you can get a good ablation. That is uh, uh, our experience at the moment. I think with this note, we can conclude the session. Now already it's uh, 2.36. Uh, thank you, Dr. Akasaka, from the bottom of the heart for your contribution, and Dr. Balbi Singh, Dr. Ashekar, and all other experts, the expert faculty members and speakers for contributing immensely to this academic program. I uh, thank you once, uh, once again to all, each and everyone from the bottom of the heart. See you all and uh, next year and a great meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shiva. Thank you, Dr. Shiva, for this excellent conference, as usual. Thank you. Yeah. Congratulations on the success of the meeting. Thank you. And bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.